Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Petitions, the clerk. Petitions have been lodged for presentation by honourable senators as follows by Senators Bell and Curnow from 20 and 68 petitioners respectively, requesting that the Senate oppose attempts by the government to raise the pension age for women from 60 to 65 years. By Senator Bell from 100 petitioners, requesting that the Senate introduce legislation requiring the National Registration Authority to provide all available information on registered chemicals. By Senator Lees from 201 petitioners, requesting that the Senate amend the Child Care Rebate Act and the Social Security Home Child Care and Partner Allowances Legislation Amendment Act to ensure that all parents with dependent children are treated equally with maximum freedom of choice. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Senator Jones. Mr President, I seek leave to present three petitions which are not in conformity with the standing orders as they are not in the correct form. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Jones. Thank you, Mr President. I present to the Senate three petitions from 2,846 petitioners requesting the Senate take action to protect high conservation values and old growth forests in the southwest of Western Australia. I also uh, present a petition from 610 petitioners requesting the Senate take action to cease the logging in DU Wilderness, I think it is, and other forest areas of high conservation value in New South Wales. And I also present a petition of 623. 623 petitioners. I don't have that Tasmanian. Uh, th yeah. 623 petitioners requesting the Senate take action to ensure that the procedure under which the Caranda Sky Rail has been approved be reviewed and its environmental Im impact assessed. I move the petitions be received. The question is: the motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, are there any notices of motion? Senator Faulkner. Mr President, on behalf of the Leader of the Government in the Senate, I give notice on the next day of sitting I will move that the order of the Senate agreed to on 28 June 1994 requiring the production of index lists of departmental files be revoked. And, uh, I seek leave uh, to make a short statement uh, regarding that notice. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the notice of motion I have given gives effect to the first recommendation of the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration in its report on the order of the Senate for the production of index lists of departmental files tabled on Tuesday the 20th of September 1994. I take this opportunity to indicate that the government is inclined to accept the thrust of the second and third recommendations made by the committee and that following further consultation the government expects to give notice uh, of a motion which will give effect to trial arrangements along the lines that have been recommended by the committee. Senator Zakharov. Thank you, Mr President. I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate notes that the first ever International Teachers Day will be observed on October 5, its purpose being to commemorate the anniversary of the adoption in 1966 of UNESCO's Intergovernmental Conference Status of Teachers recommendation. Further notes that the conference based that recommendation on the conviction that good education is required for individual happiness, national prosperity and international understanding, and that good education requires competent, devoted teachers, acknowledges the value of teachers and their vital role of ensuring that children receive a good education, and congratulates the Victorian Secondary Teachers Association, the Australian Education Union the Australian Teaching Council and their recognition of the day and their promotion of activities to celebrate the work of teachers throughout the world and to generate wider recognition of the value of that work. Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate notes the concerns of the wine producers in Western Australia in relation to the imposition of unfair taxes on that industry and in particular deplores the inconsistency between 
wholesale tax, which ranges between 11 and 21 per cent on the one hand, and the tax on wine on the other, which is currently 24 per cent but soon to be increased to 26 per cent, and further deplores the lower, lower rate of tax on mass-produced cask wine as opposed to a greater rate of tax for bottled wine. The Senate further notes that such taxation is an undue burden on a fledgling industry which has already produced 20 per cent of the country's fine wines. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate 1 notes with alarm that clear felling operations are about to begin in the Hensley Creek catchment in East Gippsland in deliberate violation of the national forest policy. 2 recognises that Hensley Creek catchment area is listed on the register of the national estate identified as old growth forest in a recent East Gippsland old growth study is part of the Hensley Quadra state site of significance for rainforest, has exceptional landscape and educational values, and has a very high level of integrity, viability, and naturalness. Three, expresses grave concern that the area has not been properly surveyed for endangered flora or fauna. Four, calls on the Minister for Environment to urgently request the Victorian Government to honour the Government's commitment under the NFPS and ensure that logging in the Hensley Creek catchment does not proceed. Senator Panitza. Well, thanks, Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate won. While acknowledging the Government's drought relief package to be a help for the states of New South Wales and Queensland, notes that there is serious omission in the package which fails to assist pockets of other states in severe drought also. Two calls on the government to spell out what it intends to do for farmers, for instance, in the Esperance region of Western Australia, the Air Peninsula in South Australia, and those in southern New South Wales and Canberra, which have been declared a drought area. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the Senate 1 notes that today is the National Day of Action against the expansion of the ALP's three mines uranium policy. Two, also notes that as part of the National Day of Action, Perth, Melbourne, Sydney and Darwin are holding rallies in support of a no mines policy. Three, further notes that people attending the protests against uranium mining are from all walks of life, from the peace, environment, social justice and union movements, together with church and Aboriginal groups. And four, recognises the wide community opposition to uranium mining and the nuclear industry and therefore calls for the ALP to abide by the wishes of the electorate. Hear, hear. Senator Loosley. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate one notes with concern that the impact of volcanic eruptions around the city of Rabaul has been major disruption and dislocation, requiring massive evacuation of citizens. Two expresses its sympathy for the families of the victims and hopes earnestly that there will be no additional deaths or casualties reported. Three, notes that Australian non-government organisations, appreciating the scale of the disaster, in particular the Australian Red Cross and World Vision, have launched public appeals to assist in relief efforts. And four, trust not only that the Australian government will be supportive of rebuilding and re rehabilitation, but that Australians generally will show their customary generosity and support for the victims of this major natural disaster. Senator Ian MacDonald. Mr uh, President, I give notice that on the uh, next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate A notes the move by the Queensland Government to ban amateur and other fishing in large sections of the Queensland coast, including the coastline uh, south and north of Townsville. B calls upon the Queensland Government to heed the groundswell of public opposition to the move and in the interests, uh, in the interests of recreational fishing, tourism and family activities and to repeal the relevant legislation. And C calls upon the state and federal members of parliament in the Townsville region to publicly support the courageous stand of the Labor member for Thurrand Gower in opposing uh, this government action. Senator Brownhill. Thank you, <coughs> Mr President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate welcomes the drought assistance package announced yesterday, notes that it is sadly too late for some, notes that the Prime Minister Keating in, in announcing the package promised that he would not leave farmers behind and forgotten and notes that it is the same man who, as Treasurer, introduced and supported the high interest rate, high taxing regime that was the genesis for many of the financial difficulties farmers face today, and calls on the Prime Minister to substantiate his genuine, albeit recent, enlightenment about the rural sector 
by removing for all farmers such iniquities as fuel, excise tax and the discriminatory assets test. Senator Shemaret. Thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate A notes one clear felling operations in the Hensley Creek catchment in East Gippsland, Victoria are imminent. Two, there is clear evidence that the Hensley catchment is of high conservation value. Amongst other things, it is listed on the register of the National Estate. It was identified as old growth forest in a recent study. It is part of the Hensley Quadra State Site of significance for rainforest and is one of the three largest stands of cool temperate rainforest still surviving in Victoria. And three, this is a breach of the National Forest Policy Statement. B further notes that the area has not been properly surveyed for endangered flora or fauna. Therefore, if logged, the exporters would be in breach of the endangered species conditions on its wood chip export licence. And C calls on one, the Federal Minister for the Environment, to directly request the Victorian Government to honour their commitments under the National Forest Policy Statement and to withdraw their approval for the logging of the Hensley Creek catchment, and two, the Federal Minister for Resources to impose a condition on the exporter's licence to exclude the catchment from logging. Senator Panitza. Thank you, Mr President. This one might sound like Senator Zakharov, but it is different. Uh, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move the, that the Senate uh, notes one that Wednesday, the 5th of October of this year, is the first ever International Teachers' Day sponsored by UNESCO. Two, that this day be fully acknowledged by the Senate as a mark of appreciation of the efforts of all of Australia's teachers. Three, that the Senate particularly acknowledges the selfless work of teachers who choose to serve rural and remote Australia through correspondence, school of the air, or by living and serving in remote communities. Senator Ian Macdonald. Mr President, uh, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move a, that the complete Peter Valentine report on the Port Hinchinbrook development, quoted from at length by Senator Kernow in the debate on the motion to take note of an answer from Senator Faulkner to Senator Ian Macdonald yesterday, be tabled by Senator Kernow in the Senate forthwith. B, that the Senate one notes that this document was commissioned by the Minister for the Environment, Sport and Recreation and is not yet publicly released. Two, calls upon the Minister to explain how the Australian Democrats have been able to access a copy of this confidential report. And three, requires the Minister to make available to the opposition parties a copy of the Peter Valentine report. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Faulkner. Order that overtaken. Mr. Um, Mr. President, uh, I move that the order of general business uh, for consideration today be as follows. Consideration of government documents, firstly. Secondly, notice of motion number 1068 standing in the name of Senator Spindler relating to the rights and exploitation of children and third notice of motion number 1077 standing in the name of Senator Woodley relating to Hinchinbrook Island. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I, th I think the ayes have it. Senator Reid. Mr President, I move that motion number 1102 standing in my name be deferred to the next day of sitting. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that government business notice of motion number one be postponed to the next day of sitting. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Kearney. The day number three relating to the presentation of the report of the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs on the provisions of the complaint. Australian Federal Police Amendment Bill 1994 be postponed till a later hour this day. The question is that, that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Report from the yes, Senator Reid. 1089 standing in the name of Senator Alston be deferred to the next day of sitting. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Is there a report from the selection of 
Bills Committee, Senator Jones. I present the 15th report of 1994 of Selection of Bills Committee and move the report be adopted. I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Leave granted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. We shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Senator Coates. I ask that uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in my name, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Coates. Mr. President, I move business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Watson. I move that um, item of motion number 1091, standing in my name, on behalf of representing this select superannuation committee relating to an extension of time for the committee to report on the operation of the superannuation guarantee charge be declared formal. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Move Watson. motion in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have opinions say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Shamaret. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1090, standing in my name, be taken as formal. Is leave granted. Being no objection. Is leave granted. Madam President, I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill to implement Australia's international obligations under Articles 17 and 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Gibson. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Oh, sorry, Senator Shamaret. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Shamaret. I move. Minister, oh, sorry. A bill for an act to implement Australia's international obligations under Articles 17 and 26 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Senator Shamaret. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek uh, leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Question is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Those of the opinion say aye. Senator Jones. Madam yeah, President, I move that the uh, bill be adjourned until a later date. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Gibson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move that Notice of Motion 1084, standing in my name, be taken as formal. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Uh, Early, Senator well, Portman. on formality, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, the, I don't intend to, uh, to oppose uh, formality, but, uh, but uh, I would like to make a sh I could seek leave to make a short statement in relation to this motion. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, in relation to the motion that is to be moved by Senator Gibson in a moment, the government, uh, recognising the force of numbers, will not be uh, opposing uh, um, this motion. I do take this opportunity to indicate that while the government will attempt to comply with this order on a best endeavours basis, the request involves a great deal of work. Uh, and it is uh, not absolutely clear at this stage that the opposition's revised time for the production of the documents can be complied with. I stress uh, with the Senate that the government is not being obstructionist on this matter. We simply seek to cross-check documents, categorise them against security classifications and ensure the accuracy of the information given that some uh, inadvertent errors uh, have uh, already uh, occurred. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I understand that the Minister for Transport will continue to consult uh, with the opposition on this particular matter. Senator Gibson. Um, I, I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that, that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I ask that General Motors Notice Motion 1095 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? No objection, Senator Jones. 
Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the motion standing in my name. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Burns. Acting Madam President, I ask the general business notice of motion number 1096 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is no objection, Senator Burns. I move the motion standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Gibson. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I move notice of motion uh, 1105, standing, standing in my name, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes, Minister. Deputy President. There is an objection. Um, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, pursuant to contingent notice and the request of the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senator Hill, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to pr provide for the consideration of a matter, uh, namely general business notice of motion at 1105, standing in my name, uh, concerning uh, the Senate engaging the Auditor General to look at uh, ANL uh, matters. Um, Do you wish to speak to that? Oh, Senator Gibson. There's been, there's been a lot of confusion in the public arena concerning, concerning ANL, and particularly about the valuations and the various statements about the value of a public, of a public asset. And because there's been a lot of uh, confusion in the, in, the, in the public arena, the various statements about, uh, about, uh, about value as going concern, values as of the organisation as, a, as a, to be liquidated. Um, I think it uh, behoves the parliament uh, to seek some clarification on the various statements that have been out in the public arena so that the public has some understanding of where the truth actually lies and what has actually happened through this uh, con very confusing process. And, and, that is, and I believe this matter is urgent. It shouldn't be allowed to go on uh, much further. And that is why uh, I move that, uh, that uh, in the notice of motion 1105, standing in my name, uh, to engage the Auditor General to produce a report for the Senate uh, to sort of clarify this matter and set, set out, the, if you like, the truth of the matter. Uh, I do believe the matter is, 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 is urgent and uh, the public is certainly confused, the Parliament's confused, and I believe the, the Senate um, uh, should, should have the access to a report as soon as possible uh, on this matter. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, um, as I indicated, uh, uh, the government uh, will not be supporting this motion that uh, uh, Senator Gibson uh, has moved. I understand that uh, Senator Collins may be on his way to, to make a contribution on this, but time will tell. Uh, can I say that, uh, that um, of course, the Auditor General is, uh, is already uh, required to uh, audit, the, audit the accounts of ANL. The Auditor General uh, has signed off uh, an unqualified uh, report for 1993, which of course uh, has already been tabled. And in my view, it would be uh, absolutely uh, inappropriate uh, for the Parliament to order uh, the uh, Auditor General to, uh, to inquire further into uh, ANL uh, when they already have uh, a statutory uh, obligation to audit the annual reports. It seems to me, uh, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, that this is, uh, this is um, uh, an exercise uh, uh, that has uh, been motivated by very base uh, political motives by Senator Gibson uh, and the opposition. Something that, uh, something that uh, we've been become used to, uh, I suppose, over the years as uh, this desperate crew uh, on the other side of uh, the chamber try to change uh, the political focus away from uh, their extraordinary troubles and travails at the moment. Uh, I, I don't believe that they will succeed in, uh, in that particular task, and I think that uh, it would ill behove the Senate to undertake uh, uh, or to agree to this, uh, this extraordinary and, and very unnecessary uh, proposal that's been, uh, been moved by Senator Gibson. So, as I say, Madam Acting Deputy President, it's, 
it is uh, a matter that clearly the government will not uh, be uh, supporting, and I'd urge uh, other honourable senators uh, to uh, to treat this particular uh, proposition with the, the contempt that it deserves. Senator Watson. Madam Deputy President, I'm surprised at the uh, minister's remarks. The Labor Party, I always thought, prided itself on open government. Earlier today, the government agreed with a recommendation from the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration, which in itself provided a move in that direction in terms of freedom of information. And here we have a, a very valuable contribution from my colleague Senator Gibson which states that there is now available in the public domain, and yet we are being precluded to be able to debate relevant issues and, uh, uh, that, are, that are in the public domain. Now, this is a house of review. This is a house of debate where we expect the facts to be put on the table. If they are in the domain, why can't the issues be debated here in this place? And I, I believe that uh, it's not a good day for this parliament or for this Senate when the government denies the Senate the opportunity to, uh, to agree to the, to the motion as moved by my colleague Senator Gibson or in any way to attempt to delay the debate on this issue. Question. Is the standing orders be suspended? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Well, yes, Senator Coulter. I'm, well, I wonder if I might avoid a division by indicating that uh, I will be voting with the uh, opposition for suspension on this case, so uh, we might uh, save time by moving on. The ayes have it. Well, if I can say, Madam Acting Deputy President, even though, uh, now that uh, there's been a clarification from Senator Coulter that it appears uh, yet again the tyranny of numbers uh, 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 are against us, uh, on that understanding I, I won't call a division, having made, having made the government's position absolutely definitively clear. <laughs> the ayes have it. Senator Gibson. Um, thank you, Deputy President. Um, uh, thank, you, thank you, Minister. Um, I move in general notice of, notice of motion number uh, 1105, standing, standing in my name for the. T for, uh, Can the you, you've got to move a procedural motion to give precedence first, Senator Gibson. Sorry, I'm a bit confused there. Oh, that this, may, that this matter take precedence over, other, other, uh, over others. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those opinion, that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have. Ayes have it. I, then, yeah, okay. um, I, I move the, the motion uh, 1105 stand, standing in my name. Please proceed. You. Okay, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Gibson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator, what, Senator Coulter. Just very briefly to explain our position. Um, Contrary to what the minister has just said, it seems to me that the purpose of this motion is somewhat different from the uh, audited reports to which uh, um, the minister has drawn our attention. This motion uh, draws attention to the fact that there are a number of reports which, uh, between which there is conflict, and the auditor in this case is being asked to, uh, to give some opinion in relation to the, uh, to the conflict uh, in, that, um, in that situation. And it seems to me that as the, uh, the sort of independent arbiter in this area, it's very appropriate for uh, Senator Gibson's motion to go forward. Um, it is not sufficient just to look at the, the ordinary audited reports. This, this is a, a, different, uh, a different thing that the auditor is being asked to do. And under those circumstances, <coughs> I think the auditor uh, general is an appropriate person to carry out that, uh, that um, study. Uh, on material which, as the motion says, is already readily available, and uh, to provide, therefore, a, an independent source of advice and, uh, and interpretation to the Senate. 
Uh, now, I'm not in any sense uh, supporting Senator Gibson's position in relation to the sale of ANL. Uh, Senator Gibson may well, uh, having got this information, want to go on with uh, uh, later uh, proposals that ANL be sold. That is not our position. But at least uh, in relation to the basic information and the interpretation of that information, we would support this, uh, this motion and think it, it is appropriate that, uh, that the Auditor General be asked for this uh, interpretation and report. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Gibson be agreed to. Though. Is that opinion on Minister? Acting Deputy President, as I indicated uh, in my uh, speech uh, on the motion for suspension, of course, uh, for the reasons I outlined, the government will be opposing this motion. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Gibson be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No for Senator Watson, are you? Okay. Tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator, Senator Gibson, you have some reports to table? Committee reports? Please proceed. Hang on, I'm just <laughs> making sure the right one first. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, I present report number 332 uh, of the committee entitled The Australian Government Credit Card and move that the Senate take note of the report. Do you speak? Um, I, in, in order, because of time short, I, I do, have a, do have a speech, but I, I seek leave of the, of the Senate to incorporate that speech. Uh. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Okay. Question is the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator, Senator Reid. Consideration of the report be adjourned. The question is agreed to that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Devereux. Senator Devereux. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the report of the Standing Committee on Environment, Recreation and the Arts on waste disposal, <coughs> together with a transcript, transcript of evidence and submissions received by the committee, and move that the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Deborah. Madam Acting De Deputy President, I move the Senate take note of the report. The inquiry which led to this report focused on the issues associated with incineration as a means of disposal of waste and energy recovery. I wish to emphasise, however, that the committee considered this in the context of the waste minimisation hierarchy and as such considered that incineration and landfill should be used as a last resort. The primary focus of policy in operational sectors of government should be waste minimisation, reuse and recycling. The committee agrees with the view put to it by some, by some in submissions that there is no such thing as waste. Waste is nothing more than a resource that needs some innovative idea on how it can actually be, be used. Waste is a resource which, is, which in the right quantity and used in the right way is, is recyclable or reusable. The committee believes that if incinerators are to be constructed for the process of domestic or municipal waste, there should be a requirement to have recycling and waste to energy facilities and has so recommended in its report. The committee does not report the support the construction of high temperature incinerators to deal with Australia's scheduled wastes as it was given evidence during its inquiry that there are alternative technologies available. The committee has recommended that technologies designed to reuse or recycle be given priority and, envir and environmentally friendly or alternative technologies for the destruction of scheduled waste be considered in preference to high temperature incineration. Australia's adherence to the Basel Convention, which, which prevents the export of hazardous wastes and a virtual ban on high temperature incineration construction, has facilitated the development of a number of alternative technologies in Australia for the disposal of hazardous material. There has been a great deal of progress on various technologies since the work on, of the independent panel on intractable waste and a number of innovative technologies could be operating commercially in the next couple of years. The committee looked at a number of these technologies which are described in the report. We do not, however, wish to comment on the relative effectiveness of these technologies or on their appropriateness for dealing with particular waste materials. These decisions will be made by the appropriate agencies and enterprises in terms of their commercial and public acceptability and technical requirements. The committee was concerned at the lack of national standards for both the operation of incinerators and landfill sites and has recommended the establishment of panels to act as an independent facilitator in the settlement of disputes where communities and governments are unable to resolve the issues 
relating to the siting or the operation of disposal facilities and other waste management issues. During the inquiry, some unsatisfactory aspects of current practices in the disposal of hospital waste were brought to the attention of the committee. As a result of a competitive tendering process, hospital waste from Sydney was being sent to Brisbane for incineration at what was alleged to be a substandard facility. It was also alleged that some of the waste should be sent to Melbourne when some of the waste would be sent to Melbourne when the, the Brisbane facility was not working. On at least one occasion, when the Brisbane incinerator was not working, it was alleged that waste material was stockpiled in skips covered only by polytarps and stored in the open at the rear of the premises at a time when summer temperatures were around 40 degrees centigrade. The committee has therefore recommended that the government investigate the need for legislation relating to the transport of hospital wastes across borders and, and implement an appropriate strategy re to reduce the risks associated with the transport and treatment of hospital wastes. Economic considerations of any proposed waste disposal facility should include direct and indir indirect environment and social cost. Currently these costs are rarely included. They should include costs such as subsidies for road construction and maintenance, traffic regulation, site supervision and, monitor and monitoring and the long-term maintenance of landfills. It is only when the full implications of waste, waste are factored into the production process that industry will have a real incentive to minimi minimise waste created by its products and packaging. The trend to employ private waste disposal companies has left the system open to a number of problems. Private companies tend not to have any incentive to reduce the amount of waste to be disposed of or to reduce the distance the waste is transported. The committee considered that these problems should be addressed by an effective regulatory and monitoring system operated by the re relevant government authorities. The committee also believed that there should be, be independent panels which could provide advice to residents groups who felt they were disadvantaged by waste management arrangements. The committee did not accept the argument that it is cheaper to use raw materials and to recycle products. There is a finite source of non-renewable raw materials and these should be conserved. The committee therefore recommended that where technology is available, governments should work with industry to encourage the, the use of recycled materials instead of raw materials. The committee believes there still exists a great deal of confusion in industry and in the broader community about the principles of the national waste minimisation and recycling strategy. Accordingly, the report recommends that as a matter of urgency, the Commonwealth Environment Protection Agency be required to establish formal and informal consultative processes with local, state and territory governments, industry and the broader community on all the major problem principles of waste management, particularly those relating to the national waste minimisation and recycling strategy. The committee believes there is an urgent need for a review of the current situation and approach to the strategy. It is more than two years since the strategy was adopted and there is still ad inadequate quantity, quality, quantitative and qualitative information available to enable effective waste management decisions to be made. There is still a great deal of confusion and a lack of knowledge and understanding of key, princi key principles at the community within industry and at the local government level. Accordingly, the government has recommended that the government give priority to the measure, measurement, review and monitoring of performance against the waste reduction targets contained in the National Waste Minimisation and Recycling Strategy and that the Minister provide details of the actions taken when responding to this report in Parliament. During its inquiry, the committee encountered on a number of occasions a situation where leading industry associations and, comp and competing technologies were unaware of the progress of relevant com competent te technology which, would, which had been public for some time. The committee had accordingly recommended that that emphasis be given to the, the prompt dissemination to the local, state and territory governments, industry and the broader community of the information collected in the review of available technology for the treatment of scheduled waste. The committee has also recommended that the government recognise the central role of local government in waste management, include representatives of the Australian Local Government Association in, national wa in the National Waste Min Management Planning, assist local government to disseminate information about the cost and benefit of waste management options, and encourage local governments to exchange information about development and waste management. The committee is concerned at the lack of progress in a number of areas since the introduction of the National Waste Minimisation and Recycling Strategy. The committee will therefore monitor the progress at regular intervals. There are a number of issues which were not dealt with in detail in this report because insufficient information was obtained in time, in the time available. The committee will 
keep the terms of reference open with a view to taking up issues such as Gerasite, the illegal dumping of DDT on a property near Orange and the government processes relating to its treatment and the dumping of dangerous waste at landfill in Victoria at a later date. Another matter of concern to the committee was the reluctance of some Commonwealth departments to assist with this inquiry. The exception to this was the Commonwealth Environment Protection Agency, SEPA, who provided a comprehensive written statement, provided inf informative comments at the public hearings and, su and supplementary material subsequent to the hearing. The committee appreciates the effort of the officers of SEPA, from SEPA. The other relevant Commonwealth departments did not provide information on very basic issues and did not answer adequ adequately the fundamental questions asked at public hearings. The committee reserves the right to follow up this matter at a later date. I would, uh, at this stage, uh, given the time, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, in a moment I want to, uh, to um, move to have the, the remainder of the tabling statement, which covers a number of uh, other issues uh, incorporated in Hansard, but uh, just prior to doing that, uh, I would uh, just like to place on record um, my thanks to uh, my committee colleagues. Uh, uh, Senator Gibson, who was uh, the previous deputy chair and the uh, person who moved that, um, that this reference be referred to the committee. Yep. Uh, I thank them all for their efforts and I uh, particularly want to thank uh, the staff for the work that they did. And, uh, it was, uh, uh, given the changes going on in the committees, there was a lot of pressure put on staff to have this report finished on time. And, uh, as I said earlier, there is, um, we had a lot of uh, uh, additional submissions and uh, correspondence and, um, and people were really pushed hard to uh, have this report finished. Uh, so I thank uh, the staff uh, for their work and I uh, seek seeking leave, leave to incorporate the rest of my statement in hand, Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Bell. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I uh, uh, wish to say about this report that it was one of the uh, most enjoyable uh, uh, inquiries that I've participated in, in that uh, it was most enlightening and uh, I find uh, the process of, of learning particularly enjoyable. It is a process uh, which uh, uh, the committee members all undertook and I say that on behalf of other committee members who participated in the inquiry, knowing that uh, we started the uh, inquiry um, from one uh, aspect of knowledge and uh, I know that no committee member can say that they emerged from the inquiry without learning a considerable uh, amount more about this particular problem of what we do with uh, waste material in Australia. Um, <coughs> the, um, the process involved the discovery also that uh, there were many authorities in Australia which have the responsibility for disposing of waste who uh, also seemed to benefit from our inquiry. And at one stage, uh, I know uh, uh, Mr Chairman uh, uh, and myself were, were particularly uh, uh, concerned about this, that we seemed to be uh, providing a vehicle for the dissemination of information between authorities rather than just gathering the information ourselves. And consequently, uh, that forms a recommendation uh, that, that particular process uh, forms one of the recommendations, uh, recommendation uh, 15, that the committee recommends that emphasis be given to the prompt dissemination to local, state and territory governments, industry and the broader community of the information that's collected in the review of available technology for the treatment of scheduled wastes. And that's because we found examples of uh, uh, responsible authorities who were unaware of uh, the developments in technology uh, and in the management uh, regimes. And it's very important that they no longer remain ignorant of what is to happen. Another thing that uh, was particularly important was that the, the committee found that uh, during the process of, um, of investigating what possible technologies could be used to, uh, to deal with uh, or manage waste materials, it was found that if a commitment had been given to a total solution some years earlier, and in particular the best example was the high temperature incinerator, uh, if a commitment had been given to uh, such a management regime, then of course Australia would have uh, not benefited from the development of alternative treatment uh, technologies 
uh, technologies now which are uh, potential and increasing uh, export opportunity for Australia. And I speak particularly with the, uh, in regard to the, um, the technology that is uh, available now to treat uh, the um, uh, PCBs. Uh, the, uh, um, the sorts of material which um, was previously considered the prime candidate for um, disposal by high temperature incinerator. Now Australia has developed effective technology to, uh, to deal with that material and is in a position to export that technology worldwide. So uh, that was an opportunity which was created by the, the very step of not endorsing and establishing high temperature incineration. And uh, we have turned, I believe, a threat into an opportunity, a, uh, a quite beneficial opportunity for Australia. So um, uh, it, it, it was a part of the uh, inquiry which I enjoyed, that uh, uh, learning process. The, um, the part that I didn't enjoy, and uh, to be frank I, I think uh, other members of the committee felt the same, uh, was to, uh, to be dealing with the uh, confusion and lack of cohesion and coordination in this area, where we found uh, some uh, authorities which were responsible for waste management uh, being able to apply best available technology and also able to apply uh, imagination and foresight in their planning for how to deal with uh, what we normally consider waste, uh, whereas we found other authorities who seem to be more concerned with uh, uh, perpetuating a, uh, a set of practices which could only be described as both destructive and, uh, and uh, costly, uh, both in, in financial and in sociological terms, to the communities to which they are responsible. And uh, it, was, uh, it was that confusion and lack of uh, coordination and cohesion which I think uh, uh, is a matter of uh, urgency which should be addressed. And uh, I think uh, the Commonwealth Government has a role to play in leading uh, the way in coordinating some of the efforts of uh, those who are responsible for uh, managing our waste. We, we see um, uh, targets of uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions reduction programs, we see uh, targets of waste volume reduction being set, but we see very little evidence of uh, leadership by way of either example or um, uh, financial assistance being applied, and there is plenty of room for it. Uh, that is an area in this, uh, in this whole, uh, uh, I suppose, topic. That is an area in this topic which uh, could be very productive in terms of achieving goals uh, with uh, comparatively little input, either financially or uh, in the space of time. The, uh, the other important thing that emerged uh, as a result of uh, the committee's work was an eagerness on, the behalf, on behalf of local government to be involved in uh, uh, taking uh, the opportunities that were identified, whether they be in recycling or whether they be in reuse or whether they be in reduction of waste. Local governments around Australia are seeing the opportunities to, uh, to work very well on behalf of their, um, their communities to, uh, to, see, to uh, take hold of the benefits that are available here. But um, again, uh, it is uh, the communication of what one local government is doing uh, across Australia to uh, another local government which may, may have the, uh, the same problem. And again, uh, there is a capacity there for Commonwealth leadership in uh, sharing that information and making sure that the uh, opportunities were understood. The, um, the other area, I suppose, was an appreciation of uh, the need to, to see uh, waste disposal as uh, uh, a conflict of, uh, of definitions, if you like. We, we actually spent a fair amount of time in the committee trying to define waste, and at one stage we were even told that there is no such thing as waste, merely resources which have yet to be identified. And it's easy to understand that when uh, the, 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 uh, the person who, who introduced that concept to us was able to demonstrate that, uh, for example, his uh, uh, lateral thinking in uh, determining and 
demonstrating a use for furnace dust, which was a problem in Wollongong, uh, the use of furnace dust and sewage, which could both be identified as waste by one definition, but which he managed to demonstrate were resources when they were combined in the right way and using the technology that he had developed and capable of producing a product which had uh, some intrinsic value. So, uh, so that, uh, uh, again, the committee was exposed to, and I, I must say enjoyed its, its exposure to, uh, such lateral thinking and such productive uh, exercise of, of Australia's uh, resources. There we had an example of waste which was not waste. And uh, the, uh, the attitude which can be applied to so many of the things which we dispose of, particularly that which we dispose of in landfill, the attitude, if we have the attitude that it's not really waste but merely a resource which we should be looking for alternative uses for, then <coughs> I think we will improve both Australia's productivity and Australia's economy and Australia's employment uh, situation. The other concept which was important was that uh, it is not merely sufficient to uh, uh, segregate and collect materials and say that that is recycling. To complete a recycling process it is necessary to repurchase the product of the recycled materials. And again we saw that local governments can play a significant role in that. And perhaps again the Commonwealth Government, particularly in, uh, in terms of whether it be bounties for recycled paper or the use by purchasing departments of materials that have been made from recycled material, that is again a role which is important for the Commonwealth to play. I welcome this report, endorse its recommendations and recommend the reading of it to all honourable senators. Senator O'Chee. Further debate on the matter be adjourned. Madam the question is that motion be agreed to. Those other opinions say aye. The contrary, not the ayes. Have it, Senator Jones. Thank you, Madam the President. Uh, I present a report on behalf of Senator Cooney. I present the report of the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs on Crimes and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 1994, together with the transcript of evidence and submissions received by the committee, and move the report be printed. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Jones. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I have a further report. I present the report of number one of 1994 of the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade on the examination of annual reports and move that the report be printed. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Jones. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the report. In doing so, uh, I say the annual report included in this report refers to the year 1992-93 or the calendar year 1993 and were tabled in the Senate during the period of the 1st of July 1993 and the 30th of June 1994. The committee was due to have reported to the Senate by the 30th of June 1994 on its examination of the annual reports but was granted an extension of time until the 13th of October 1994. The delay in reporting was caused by the committee's concerted effort to meet the deadline of the 25th of August to report on its inquiry into sexual harassment in the armed forces. The committee's effort to finalise the sexual harassment report also resulted in a postponement since late 1993 of work on the committee's other inquiry into the relationships, uh, relations with China. The committee will now concentrate on completing this wide-ranging inquiry. Early today, the Senate granted the committee an extension of time until the last sitting day in June 1995 to report on the matter. All the annual reports examined by the committee were in accordance with the guidelines, and pre uh, guidelines for preparation of annual reports. In its previous report on annual reports, the committee had commended, commented on the predominance of female staff in ASO 1 to 3 ranges and the progressive increase in the proportion of male staff in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The department recently wrote to the committee outlining the steps which had been taken to develop a strategy to integrate equal employment opportunity principles into the department's management practices. The committee was pleased to note that the secretary himself had taken the lead in developing this strategy. The committee believed that such uh, action by the secretary should signal to all staff 
his determination to increase EEO principles into departmental management practices in accordance with the government's uh, equal employment opportunity policy. Although the Department of Defence stated in its annual report for 1992-93 that there had been a small but significant increase in the number of women in senior executive service levels, this statement was wrong. Other tables in the report showed that the number of women in the SES remained at five during the year and the department confirmed that no increase in numbers had occurred. The department also confirmed that two columns on table seven on page 274 of the report were also wrong because some categories of professional technical staff have been included in the wrong salary ranges. There is little evidence to show that the department is making a serious attempt to integrate EEO principles into the department's management practices in order to improve the representation of female staff and their career prospects throughout the department. The employment of women in senior officers and senior executive service range is still well below public service norms. The committee believes that the department management should make a more determined effort to improve its EEO record. I commend the report to the Senate. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that retire, country not if the eyes have it. Senator Gibson, do you have one? Yeah, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, I, I present report number 331 uh, of the committee entitled An Advisory Report on the Financial Management and Accountability Bill 1994, the Commonwealth Authorities and Companies Bill 1994 and the Auditor General Bill 1994 and on a proposal to establish an audit committee of the Parliament and move that the Senate take note of the report. Questions? I, I go on. Do you want the report printed? Questions? Uh, can I go on with my, yes. my speech, please? Um, I welcome this opportunity to table the Joint Committee of Public Accounts 331st report, which is an advisory report on legislation to replace the Audit Act 1901 and a response to a resolution by this chamber. On June 28 this year, Senator Ray gave notice of a motion in the Senate to establish a joint standing committee to be known as the Audit Committee of Parliament. The notice of motion detailed the functions of the Audit Committee in summary as being Firstly, to advise the Auditor General of the Committee's audit priorities. Secondly, advise the responsible minister when the Committee wishes a performance audit conducted on a government business enterprise. Thirdly, consider the resources of the Australian National Audit Office. <coughs> and finally, to report to the Parliament on any issue arising out of the performance of the Auditor General's functions or reports of the Auditor General of the Independent Auditor that the Committee believes should be drawn to the attention of Parliament. The notice of motion also proposed that the committee's membership be the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President of the Senate, alternating as Chairman and Deputy Chairman, the Chairman of the JCPA, that's the Joint Committee of Public Accounts, two government and three opposition members of the House of Representatives, and one government senator, one opposition senator, and one senator to be nominated by any minority groups or independent senators. On June 29, the Senate passed a motion I moved that the proposed resolution for the establishment of an audit committee should be referred to the Joint Committee on Public Accounts for inquiry. The referral also requested the JCPA to give particular attention to the appropriateness of establishing a separate committee rather than conferring the functions of the proposed committee on the Joint Committee on Public Accounts. On 23 August, the Senate agreed to extend the reporting deadline until today. Senators will be aware that on the 29th of June 1994, the Minister for Finance in introduced a package of three bills in the lower house. The bills were the Auditor General Bill 1994, the Financial Management and Accountability Bill 1994, and the Commonwealth Authorities and Companies Bill 1994. For the sake of brevity, I shall refer to the bills as the FMA Bill, the CAC Bill and the Auditor General's Bill, respectively. After their first reading in the House, the Minister successfully moved the bills referred be referred to the Joint Committee on Public Accounts for review with an advisory report to be presented to the House. The Joint Committee on Public Accounts decided to combine it, its report on the proposal to establish an audit committee and its review of the three bills in, one, in the one report. Let me say at the outset that the JCPA has welcomed the opportunity to consider, consider the Senate's referral and to review the bills. The Committee's review has allowed many Commonwealth entities and organisations outside the Commonwealth an opportunity to comment on the proposed audit committee and the three bills. 
The committee received 65 submissions and held six public hearings, with witnesses coming from afar afield of South Australia and Tasmania to give evidence. The committee also invited the coalition, Democrats and, and, and all independent senators and members to consider their comments. The review pro process has been important and valuable. The committee believes that the constructive and bipartisan approach of all involved in the inquiry has led to recommendations that will enhance the effectiveness of an audit committee and the quality of the legislation. Before I detail some of the major recommendations by the committee, I should like to draw the Senate's attention to the Joint Committee on Public Accounts' long involvement in moves to have an audit committee of parliament established. The formal motion to establish an audit committee of parliament draws heavily on a proposal to establish such a committee made by the same committee in 1989. In that year, the Joint Committee on Public Accounts reviewed the Audit Office and in its report, entitled Report 296, the Auditor-General, Ally of the People and the Parliament, Reform of the Audit Office, it recommended the establishment of a separate parliamentary audit committee. This recommendation was based on the precedent of the UK House of Commons, which had established a statutory audit committee called the Public Accounts Commission in 1983. The government's interest in establishing an audit committee is particularly welcomed by, by the committee. However, the notice of motion proposes creation of a separate audit committee, a move proposed by the Joint Committee of Public Accounts in 1989. The committee now considers that for reasons of efficiency and effectiveness, the functions of an audit committee should be more appropriately conducted by the Public Accounts Committee itself. The committee has come to this conclusion for several reasons. Firstly, the Public Accounts Committee has a long history of liaison with the Auditor General. This has given the, the Public Accounts Committee members a, long, a strong understanding of the issues affecting the Auditor General and his office. Secondly, the Public Accounts Committee has a statutory obligation to examine the reports of the Auditor General. Public Accounts Committee members have developed a detailed insight into the Auditor General's levels of activity and the efficiency with which they are carried out. With this information, the Public Accounts Committee members are well placed to comment on the Auditor General's proposed levels of future activity. Thirdly, the Public Accounts Committee already acts informally as a conduit for parliamentarians to indicate aspects of public administration that they would like the Auditor General to examine. If the Audit Committee functions were added to its responsibilities, the Public Accounts Committee would, would undertake this task on a formal basis. The Committee does not believe it appropriate for Australia to follow the United Kingdom precedent, where the House of Commons Audit Committee and the Public Accounts Committee are separate. The reason for the separation in the UK is that, by tradition, the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee is by convention a member of the opposition. It was not considered appropriate for the opposition to preside over a committee reviewing the appropriations of an agency of state, and thus the function was given to a separate government control committee. A similar separation is not necessary in Australia, given that the chair of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts is always a government member. However, the Joint Committee on Public Accounts believe that it is highly desirable that an audit committee of parliament have statutory recognition to give the necessary permanence to such an important committee. The committee believes that statutory recognition can most appropriately be, be achieved by amending the Public Accounts Committee Act 1951. This act details the membership, duties and functions of the Public Accounts Committee and should be amended to give the Public Accounts Committee the additional powers to perform the functions of a parliamentary audit committee. The JCPA believes it is important that its functions as an audit committee should be clearly distinct from its traditional functions. To clarify the distinction, the Public Accounts Committee believes that the Public Accounts Committee Act should require the committee to convene as the Audit Committee of Parliament when performing audit committee functions. It is also important that minority parties and independents should be represented on the audit committee. This is most appropriately achieved by increasing the membership of the Public Accounts Committee by one and reserving the extra position for a representative of any minority groups or independents in the Parliament. The Committee believes that these recommendations will give the Parliament a strong and efficient Audit Committee that will strengthen the links between the Auditor General and the Parliament. As I mentioned, the Public Accounts Committee decided to combine its report on the Audit Committee proposal and its review of the three bills to replace the Audit Act into the one report. 
I shall now focus on the Committee's major recommendations concerning the replacement legislation. The first one, the Auditor-General Bill, defines the, fun the powers, functions and role of the Commonwealth Auditor-General. The Public Accounts Committee welcomes the introduction of the Auditor-General Bill and supports the principles behind the legislation. In particular, the Committee welcomes the fact that the Auditor-General has been given an unambiguous mandate to audit the financial statements of all Commonwealth entities and almost as extensive a mandate to conduct performance audits. The decision to establish the Audit Office as a statutory agency is also a positive step. However, the Committee believes that the Bill, as proposed, represents a limitation on the, on the Parliament's capacity to make informed assessments about the efficiency with which, governments, uh, which taxpayers' money is being used by government business enterprises. Clauses 14 and 15 of the Bill only allow the Auditor-General to conduct performance audits of business enterprises at the request of both Houses of Parliament by resolution or at the request of the responsible minister. Although the, bill does not allow, does, although the bill does allow Parliament to request a performance order of a business enterprise, the committee believes that the required resolution of both houses is cumbersome, time-consuming and, and, and potentially impractical. It is important there be an easier mechanism by which the Parliament can direct, directly request the Auditor-General to conduct a performance audit of a, of a business enterprise. Accordingly, the Committee recommends that Parliament delegate its authority to request a performance audit of a GBE to the proposed Audit Committee, without the need to go through the responsible minister or both houses. Of course, Parliament as a whole and the responsible minister would continue to be able to request the Auditor General to conduct a performance audit of a GBE. The Committee expects that the Audit Committee would really exercise this power and only after consultation with all parties involved. I shall briefly mention the two other bills, the FMA Bill and the CAC Bill. The FMA Bill establishes an appropriate structure of financial management and accountability within Commonwealth agencies, and in fact the Committee has made two minor recommendations for change. Finally, the CAC Bill. At present, the accountability requirements for Commonwealth authorities and companies are scattered through numerous enabling acts, company memoranda and articles of association. The CAC Order. Bill. Order. The Honourable Senator's time has expired. Okay. Uh, well, I move that the Senate take note of the report. Senator Forshaw. Acting Deputy President, um, I take this opportunity to, um, to comment uh, also on the Joint Committee of Public Accounts Advisory Port Report on the notice of motion to establish an Audit Committee of the Parliament and on the legislation to uh, replace the Audit Act of 1901. Uh, Senator, Gibson, in uh, presenting the report, has uh, already outlined the additional functions that the committee envisages for an audit committee and why the uh, uh, Joint Committee on Public Accounts has recommended that the functions of an audit committee be conducted by the, uh, the Joint Committee on Public Accounts itself. Uh, I'd like to stress uh, just three of the uh, principles about the Audit Committee of Parliament that uh, have arisen from the um, uh, Joint Committee's recommendations. Firstly, the, the Joint Committee believes that it is highly desirable that an, aud an audit committee of the Parliament have statutory recognition to give the necessary permanence to such an important committee. As has been discussed, the uh, Joint Committee recommends that this be uh, achieved by way of amendments to the Public Accounts Committee Act of 1951. Uh, secondly, the Joint Committee believes that its function as an audit committee should be very clearly distinct from its traditional functions. And for this reason, uh, the Joint Committee has recommended that when it is uh, uh, convened as the audit, uh, uh, sorry, when it is uh, performing the functions of the, the audit committee, that it is specifically convened uh, um, in that uh, forum. Thirdly, the Committee believes that minority parties and independents should be represented on the Audit Committee. And Senator Gibson, uh, in presenting the report, has indicated that uh, the Committee recommends the membership uh, of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts be increased by one and that uh, that extra position be uh, reserved for uh, <coughs> representatives of the minority groups or independents within the Parliament. Um, and I uh, endorse what uh, Senator Gibson has said, that uh, these recommendations 
together with the various other recommendations in the report, uh, will, the committee believes, uh, ensure a strong and efficient audit committee. As, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Joint Committee's report also reviews the package of three bills to replace the Audit Act of 1901. Uh, those bills are the Auditor General Bill 1994, the Financial Management and Accountability Bill 1994 and the Commonwealth Authorities and Companies Bill 1994. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to highlight some of the recommendations that the committee made regarding the Auditor General Bill. Um, one of the recommendations made by the Auditor General was that the Auditor General Bill should be amended to provide the Audit Office with the authority to establish appropriate terms and conditions of employment of staff. Now, currently, audit office staff are employed under the Public Service Act 1922, and this arrangement will continue under the Auditor General Bill as it currently stands. In uh, his submission, the Auditor General argued that he needed to be able to set terms and conditions for his staff that are competitive with private sector equivalents, uh, and that, that would give him or her uh, the flexibility to meet changing requirements. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government's 1987 policy guidelines for Commonwealth statutory authorities and government business enterprises state that statutory authorities should be staffed under the Public Service Act unless there are strong reasons for doing otherwise. In the government's view, the case has not been made out to exempt the National Audit Office from this policy position. Furthermore, the Department of Finance has pointed out that there are many other Commonwealth agencies uh, besides the National Audit Office that have difficulty providing professional staff with competitive remuneration packages. So it's not an issue that, uh, that is unique to the Audit Office. But the committee does believe that the Auditor General is in a unique position in the public sector, given his or her vital role in strengthening the accountability of the executive to parliament and improving public sector efficiency. And the committee believes that the Auditor General's capacity to undertake these functions would be enhanced if he or she had greater flexibility to negotiate competitive remuneration packages. This would assist the Auditor General in attracting and retaining the highest quality staff. And accordingly, the committee has recommended that the Auditor General bill be amended to allow the Auditor General to negotiate the terms and conditions of uh, the staff of the Audit Office with those uh, officers and employees. However, the committee is aware of the concerns expressed by the employer's representatives uh, during the proceedings that the terms and conditions of staff could possibly be eroded if they were no longer employed under the Public Service Act. And it's the committee's view that it should be possible to balance the Auditor General's uh, desire to have uh, freedom to determine competitive packages uh, for his staff with the requirement to protect their basic terms and conditions. This can be achieved by placing safeguards in the legislation along the lines of those included in the enabling legislation of other budget-funded Commonwealth authorities not employing staff under the Public Service Act. And so the committee has recommended that the terms and conditions set by the Auditor-General must be consistent with government industrial relations and employment policies and the principles decided by the Australian Industrial Relations Commission from time to time. We recognise that the process of establishing terms and conditions of the audit office staff is likely to be complex and lengthy, involving negotiation between all relevant parties. For this reason, we recommend that audit office staff should continue to be employed and appointed under the Public Service Act uh, until such time as any new terms and conditions are agreed with staff. Uh, I might also uh, uh, deal with uh, one other recommendation of the Auditor-General, and that was that um, former Auditor-Generals should not be able to take up further employment in the public sector. 
upon completing their term of, uh, of office. The Auditor-General uh, was concerned that there could be seen to be implications for the independence of the Auditor-General if an Auditor-General is reliant on the executive for future employment at the end of uh, the completion of the appointment. The committee acknowledges the position of the Auditor-General is unique and has a special place within the system of government. However, inclusion of such an amendment to the bill would prevent a former Auditor-General from making a further and valuable contribution to Commonwealth administration. And accordingly, the committee believes that there should not be a restriction on former Auditor-Generals seeking offices of profit under the Crown. Mr Acting Deputy President, in the very short time uh, left to me, I just uh, make some brief comments on the other uh, bills, uh, the bills within the package, uh, and in particular um, the uh, uh, Commonwealth Authorities and Companies Bill, known as the CAC Bill. Uh, a matter of concern to a number of witnesses appearing before the committee was that the penalty regime established under the CAC Bill for breaches of duty by executive officers of Commonwealth authorities is unnecessarily harsh. An associated concern was that Commonwealth authorities will find it increasingly difficult to attract quality men and women to, to fill positions on boards of management of government bodies. The committee is aware of the trend in the private sector towards boards being filled by professionals skilled in financial management uh, as non-financial experts become reluctant to accept the more onerous obligations being placed on directors. The committee believes it is desirable that the boards of Commonwealth authorities and companies should contain a mix of financial experts and community representatives with relevant, although not necessarily financial, ex uh, expertise. And uh, it believes also that the penalty regime for executive officers in the CAC bill should not discourage appropriate people from sitting on the boards of Commonwealth authorities. But on the other hand, it should also reflect the high standard of duty and care that Parliament expects of people undertaking a public duty. Uh, in order to ensure that uh, there is no uh, confusion regarding the definition contained uh, within the bill, um, the committee has recommended that the explanatory memorandum be amended to state that the individual circumstances of each particular case will be relevant in determining whether an officer of a Commonwealth Order. authority uh, should Order. be classified as an executive officer or not with respect to the Order. penalty Order. regime. Order. Time. Thank you. Senator Gibson? To incorporate the rest of my speech on, uh, on this particular report uh, in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Gibson. So moved. Yeah. Senator O'Chee. Deputy President, I move that further debate on this matter be adjourned. The question is the motion be agreed to. Senator Fortune. Would it be uh, appropriate if I also sought leave to uh, uh, include the rest of my speech in uh, the Hansard? Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Childs. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I present the report of the Standing Committee on Industry, Science, Technology, Transport, Communications and Infrastructure on the Australian Postal Corporation Amendment Bill 1994 and move that the report be printed. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. Right. Messages. We now move to messages from the House of Representatives. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Higher Education Funding Student Organisations Amendment Bill 1994 for concurrence. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Higher Education Funding Act 1988. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? 
question is that the motion be agreed to. I move that further debate on, on this bill be adjourned. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives returning the International War Crimes Tribunal Bill 1994 and the International War Crimes Tribunal Consequential Amendments Bill 1994 with amendments. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that consideration of the messages in committee of the whole be made an order of the day for the next day of sitting. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. I have received a letter from the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate seeking a variation to the membership of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the membership of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that Senator Vanstone be discharged from further attendance on the Scrutiny of Bills Committee and that Senator Ellison, having been duly nominated in accordance with Standing Order 24, be appointed a member of the committee. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Colton. <coughs> Senator Coulter. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, <clears throat> this um, motion seeks to refer to the um, Standing Committee on Environment um, the matter of the um, uh, international um, uh, agreement in relation to um, the uh, uh, um, International Convention on Desertification. And uh, senators will recall that um, uh, at the time that this, uh, this motion was put forward, there was also a, uh, a motion put forward uh, by yourself, Mr Acting Deputy President, in relation to uh, referring uh, the same uh, matter, but, but not with the same terms of reference, to the uh, Rural and Regional um, Committee of the Senate. Uh, that, that motion was, uh, was defeated, and this motion is the uh, alternative uh, proposal to refer this, uh, this convention and its impact uh, in relation to uh, a number of matters in Australia, which I'll pick up in a moment, um, <clears throat> to the Committee on Environment. Now, in, uh, in moving this motion and on other occasions, I have drawn attention to the fact that uh, in uh, relation to international conventions and uh, international obligations, uh, the federal government has often entered into uh, agreements which really have bypassed the, uh, the uh, proper democratic processes of parliament. And uh, <clears throat> we have seen numerous uh, uh, examples of this in which, uh, for instance, the, uh, the London Dumping Convention, we have given uh, effect to, uh, to, the, uh, to that convention in uh, local law and when one sought to uh, tighten the provisions in that, uh, in that piece of legislation, one was told that one couldn't uh, change uh, one full stop, one comma. In, uh, in the legislation because that had already been agreed to uh, in, the, um, in an international forum. And similarly, one finds at the, uh, uh, by analogy, at the state level under international in, intergovernmental agreements within Australia, one often finds that uh, governments have entered into uh, agreements and the parliaments are presented with, uh, with legislation which cannot in any way be modified. So the, uh, there is a, a general concern in the, uh, in the parliament, and I think that concern is certainly uh, 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 one which is shared with the, with the opposition, to some extent by government, I believe, but certainly with the opposition, that uh, these um, international conventions should in some way be brought before the, uh, before the parliament and the parliament should have an opportunity to uh, have a look at them and make some, uh, some comment upon them that uh, <clears throat> we are the elected representatives of the Australian people. We have a responsibility, therefore, to uh, ensure what it is that our government is, uh, is entering into on our behalf and uh, when it comes to matters of legislation to give effect to, uh, to conventions, we also need to uh, be able to uh, have uh, a serious and, uh, and sensible comment on those, uh, on those pieces of legislation with the right to, uh, to amend them and to change them if, in fact, 
uh, we, we don't uh, particularly like the provisions or we feel that the provisions are not uh, strong enough, and uh, that has not been the situation uh, up to this time. Now, <clears throat> I think on, on that there is, uh, as I say, there is wide agreement with the, uh, with the opposition that that is, that is an area of, of quite serious concern. Um, I think um, senators will know that um, Senator uh, Vicky Bourne is uh, intending to uh, move some legislation, uh, to, or to, to have uh, legislation debated in this uh, chamber in relation to, uh, to that matter. So in a sense, uh, motions of this sort are a first attempt to go down that road to uh, democratising the processes in relation to uh, international agreements, conventions and the like. Now, uh, when uh, Senator Chapman uh, moved uh, his motion, uh, we believe that there was a, um, a certain amount of misconception in relation to this specific uh, convention on desertification, in that the desertification convention really uh, relates to uh, the countries which uh, provided aid uh, in relation to desertification, and therefore Australia in, in it itself would not be subjected to any provisions uh, within that desertification convention. However, we do have, as world citizens, a responsibility in relation to environmental protection and, uh, and the uh, effect of desertification. And there might be some argument about this, but uh, this can be looked at uh, um, by, the, uh, by the committee to which uh, this matter is referred. And I know uh, Senator Chapman earlier um, quoted from, uh, I think it was two uh, Oxford scientists who had done work on desertification and uh, were uh, claiming that uh, desertification uh, had not uh, advanced as far as, uh, as many other people were claiming and that um, there was somewhat of a, a beat up in relation to desertif desertification. But leaving that matter aside, uh, we see the, the question of desertification very much as an environmental matter in relation to this, uh, to this convention. And as I say, as world citizens, we do have a responsibility to look at that and the consequences, while they are uh, significant in relation to, uh, uh, to uh, the, the social and other, other uh, consequences, the primary concern should be one of environment. And that is why we've chosen to, uh, to uh, um, refer this uh, convention to the Environment Committee. Now, as I say, I think there, there has been a great deal of misunderstanding in the, uh, in the rural community in Australia in relation to the, uh, the uh, uh, impact of this convention on uh, people in the rural areas in Australia. We believe that uh, the convention will not have impacts on those people, but in deference to, uh, to uh, Senator uh, Chapman's concern, I hope he will notice that the, uh, the last term of reference of this committee has been modified to take into account those matters so the committee can look at those matters and if in fact the committee finds that, uh, that we are right, that there won't be uh, uh, economic and social uh, impacts on uh, rural people in Australia, uh, then in fact that will be reported and hopefully that process will help to lay to rest those unfounded concerns which people in the rural community have. And I draw attention to, uh, therefore, particularly to uh, Clause E, I draw uh, Senator Chapman's attention to it, in which the, uh, the original motion read, uh, the impact of the desertification convention on the sustainability of rural, pastoral and mining communities, etc. And now it reads, the impact of the desertification convention on the economic, social and environmental... Uh, um, sorry, I should have the... Uh, Actual, <clears throat> the impact of desertification convention on the economic, social and environmental sustainability of rural, pastoral and mining communities. And I believe that does pick up the, uh, the concerns which, um, which Senator uh, Chapman uh, had expressed in his original motion, a motion which was rejected by the Senate. Um, and therefore I, I would hope that the, uh, the, the opposition will see fit to uh, support this resolution because I think it will uh, it will clearly achieve the first objective, which was to bring the convention before a committee of the Senate, and in relation to the specific, the specific uh, concerns which Senator Chapman voiced, I believe they have been taken care of in that amendment. 
Now, originally, in relation to the government, uh, it was our understanding the government would actually uh, support uh, this um, this um, uh, reference to the Environment Committee, but uh, had not uh, um, been prepared to support Senator Chapman's reference. I'm not sure now what the position of the of the government is, but uh, I have heard some rumours that the government may have changed its mind. But I would certainly enjoin government to support. <laughs> I've just had an indication that they're not now <laughs> supporting the reference, but I hope they. Uh, I hope that they would, because uh, this really is a serious matter. The, the, uh, the first matter to which I referred, namely that governments enter into these uh, international agreements and conventions and bypass, bypass the democratic processes, bypass the elected representatives of the people of Australia who should have some input into uh, the acceptance or otherwise or modification of these international conventions. And uh, the, uh, the Labor Party, which prides itself on being a, uh, a democratic party, I'm surprised, uh, seeks to continue evidently uh, a situation in which uh, government unilaterally can go ahead and do these things. Now, it, it, it is often argued that uh, governments uh, are the elected uh, uh, body to, uh, to make these sorts of decisions. Uh, but, uh, and that they have a mandate to do that. But governments never set out, and, and uh, uh, political parties never set out at the time of election that they intend to enter into this, that and the other agreement. It's not part of, the, uh, of their charter to do that, and it's therefore not part of the mandate which they have to enter into those agreements without bringing those, uh, those agreements back before the um, before the elected representatives, that is, before the House of Representatives and the Senate chamber. And therefore, uh, one is rather surprised that uh, the government on this occasion is not prepared to uh, accede to, uh, to this motion. So, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy, uh, Mr. Deputy President, I um, strongly recommend to the opposition that they support this because it does achieve, I believe, the uh, objectives of their uh, original uh, request. Uh, it is somewhat broader in that it, uh, it recognises the uh, environmental aspects and emphasises those. It does pick up the concerns which they themselves have expressed in relation to the democratic process, and it does pick up the concerns which they have expressed in relation specifically to the, um, the impacts of, uh, of, this, uh, of this convention on, uh, on rural uh, people, because it uh, specific specifically talks about the, the economic and social uh, impact on rural, pastoral and mining communities. And that's been done by way of amendment, and I would uh, strongly urge the opposition, therefore, to, uh, to accept this motion and to support it. Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. This uh, motion moved on behalf of the Democrats this morning by Senator Coulter to refer to the Senate Standing Committee on Environment, Recreation and the Arts for inquiry and report um, the proposal of the federal government to sign the International Convention on Desertification with uh, a range of particular references uh, which, which I would uh, seek to have incorporated in Hansard. I believe is granted. No objection, Lewis. It's, it's the, the terms of reference of, of, the, of the motion. I just want to have that incorporated. Thank you, Minister. To, to this, uh, this particular uh, order, order, Senator Chapman, um, leaves granted, but it's in a pedantic sense because the terms of the reference are already incorporated in hand, because it's the motion that we're debating. Senator Chapman. In, in the, in my, yeah. my Senator speech. Chapman, <laughs> leaves granted. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Those, uh, those terms of reference really indicate that this motion is a rather unsubtle attempt by the Democrats at a pea and thimble trick. Because what uh, the Democrats are doing by proposing this reference is using the advent of the International Convention on Desertification as an excuse to promote a wide-ranging environmental inquiry in Australia. And that is an inquiry that is simply not needed. In his uh, remarks 
Moving this reference, Senator Coulter claimed that there was a misconception regarding this convention in relation to Australia because he said it relates to countries which are provided aid to deal with the particular environmental problem of desertification. In saying that, of course, Senator Corder is completely ignoring the potential domestic impact of this convention through the capacity it gives the federal government to yet again abuse its external affairs power under the Constitution. Senator Coulter also indicated that this uh, inquiry really is, a, as I said, a pea and thimble trip, trip, trick by saying that the environment was the most important issue in relation to this convention. Now, there's no doubt about the importance of the environment, but the environmental issues in relation to desertification in Australia are already being handled in a number of satisfactory ways. They are being in already the subject of an inquiry by the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee of this Senate in their land care inquiry. There are a number of programs underway to deal with the particular environmental problems that relate to this matter. But what, of course, has not been properly investigated is the potential impact of this convention on Australia and, as I particularly referred to a few moments ago, its impact in relation to the power it gives the federal government under the external affairs power. And as, uh, as I said, if we are going to have an inquiry into this uh, convention, that, is, that should be the focus of the inquiry, not uh, the Australian environment, which is already subject to uh, adequate inquiry in this regard. And certainly the last, uh, the last term of reference in Senator Coulter's motion, which looks at uh, the impact of the Convention on Economic, Social and Environmental Sustainability of Rural, Pastoral and Mining Communities, does, to some extent, attack that issue. But I suggest that is merely a sop to try and persuade our side on this chamber that we ought, we ought to support what really is an inquiry focused in an entirely different direction. And it is not adequate to simply tack on at the end of Senator Coulter's terms of reference one term of reference that looks at uh, one particular aspect of that convention when the whole, thr whole thrust of the inquiry is in a different direction altogether. As I said, the inquiry that Senator Coulter has proposed on behalf of the Democrats is simply not needed. In the terms of reference that uh, he's provided, it diverts attention from the main issues which surround this United Nations Convention. And those main issues are, first, its potential to centralise the control of land management in Canberra, a shameful, shameful uh, possibility, Senator Ochi. Secondly, Australia's potential liability at international law under this convention. And thirdly, this Labor government's appalling record of abusing the external affairs power under our constitution to override the, override the proper jurisdiction of the states. These are the important issues that relate to Australia's intention to sign and subsequently ratify this Convention on Desertification. These are the issues which my proposed reference to the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee of the Senate would have addressed had it been carried successfully when it was debated in this chamber a couple of weeks ago. These are the issues of real concern to Australians, and especially those living in regional and rural areas. But sadly, these are the issues to which the Democrats, along with the Greens and the government, paid scant regard when they voted to defeat that proposed inquiry two weeks ago. Instead, they now want to initiate a wide-ranging, unnecessary inquiry into desertification in Australia, an issue which, as I've already said, is being addressed and indeed is already the subject of an inquiry by the Senate to Regional and Rural Affairs Committee in its land care investigation. Senator Coulter, uh, in that debate a couple of weeks ago, argued that he would not support uh, my reference to the Standing Committee on Regional and Rural Affairs of the Convention, and he's, he's repeated it again today because he said that the Convention 
in his view, wouldn't apply to Australia. If that's the case, then we've got to look at his attempted reference today as a rather cynical and transparent attempt to confuse the issue and to manipulate the political agenda with the possible intended outcome of affecting the national rangelands management strategy, which he knows does not have the support uh, of either we in the opposition or indeed of the federal government. Senator Coulter's narrowing of the context to examine desertification only in Australia ignores the substantial nature of the convention, which places Australia in the category of affected developed country, which will not receive assistance, but which is required to provide assistance to affected developing countries. Examining desertification in Australia does not go to the problem of the extent to which aid is necessary to assist developing countries. The reference which I saw a couple of weeks ago attempted uh, or would have examined the potential domestic policy implications of implementation of the Convention on Australia, and that, as I've already said, is quite a separate issue. But it is the key issue with regard to this particular convention. One of Senator Coulter's uh, reasons for seeking this uh, particular reference, as he uh, referred in his remarks a couple of weeks ago, was the impact of population growth on the incidence of desertification. Given the Australian <coughs> context of today's motion, that is uh, rather irrelevant and inconsistent. Australia's rural regions have actually experienced negative population growth. They've experienced falls in population. Senator Coulter well knows that. And uh, population considerations are therefore not relevant to desertification as an issue in Australia. The inescapable fact is that the impact of the Convention on domestic policy will mostly affect rural and regional Australians. And consequently, it is that earlier reference that should have been undertaken if we were really concerned about uh, the impact of this convention. Yeah. Senator Coulter's motion pays lip service to the international nature of the convention by seeking examination of the capacity of the desertification convention to contribute to Australia's efforts to halt and reverse desertification, both in Australia and overseas. It ignores the consequences for Australia of being bound at international law, of handing, over its of handing over its national sovereignty and providing the Australian government with the legislative capacity through the capricious exercise of the external affairs power to centralise control of rural land management. And one can ask where the Democrats' allegiances really lie. Well, that's, uh, the evidence would suggest that, Senator O'Chee, but of course we have in South Australia Senator Lees running around the rural areas of South Australia all the time, trying to cuddle up to farmers and rural communities, suggesting that the Democrats are the true friends of, the, uh, uh, of rural uh, people. Point of order, Senator Baggett. Um, I'd like to point out that I believe that is a sexist connotation to what was just mentioned by Senator Chapman, and I would ask for that to be withdrawn. It's, it's no point of order, Senator Muggets. Senator Chapman. Point of order, Senator Muggets. Uh, can I just po seek a point of a clarification? Is uh, sexist connotations not considered unparliamentary? Not unless, they re not unless they reflect upon any senator, any senator who so, who so has the remark, remark directed towards them takes offence. What well, you describe? I have taken offence. Well, there's no, no reflection towards you, as I understand it, Senator Muggets. Order. Senator Chapman. Senator Margett seems extremely uh, sensitive this morning, Mr Deputy President. I wasn't even referring to the Greens, I was referring to the Australian <laughs> Democrats. And uh, I mean I don't I, I assume that her remarks related to my comments that the Australian or Senator Senator Lees on behalf of the Australian Democrats was running around South Australia cuddling up to uh, to farmers and rural communities. Now I don't see uh, any sexist uh, connotation in that remark at all. Males or females can cuddle up. I don't see why it uh, can be particularly regarded as being disparaging to, to females. But, <laughs> but uh, as I was 
was saying before that interruption, uh, Mr Deputy President, Senator Lees runs around South Australia purporting to be friends of farmers and friends of the rural community. And yet, uh, on the other hand, we have them come in here proposing a wide-ranging inquiry, completely ignoring the detrimental or the potentially detrimental impact of this convention on rural communities and looking at only one aspect of, of, uh, of this issue, one side of this issue, rather than taking a balanced approach and, as I said earlier, really ignoring the main issue of this convention as it impacts or potentially impacts on uh, rural and regional Australians. The real issues seem to have totally escaped the Democrats with regard to this proposal because the real, impact, the real uh, issues aren't about the impact of desert regions in Australia or the extent of deserts in Australia or even what is required in Australia to halt and reverse desertification. They are about quite different issues. And the first of those is whether it is appropriate that Australia deal with desertification as an environmental problem, as a social and political problem in Australia or Africa or Latin America or the Mediterranean or the Caribbean through the mechanism of an international bureaucratic body. The second uh, issue is the United Nations Environment Programme's scandalous mounting of a publicity campaign based on flawed scientific evidence on a subject largely misunderstood even at the international scientific level purely to manipulate the global environmental political agenda and attract aid funding to maintain its own bureaucratic hierarchy. And I addressed that in some detail in my remarks uh, on the earlier proposed reference a couple of weeks ago, and I don't need to add anything more to that today. Thirdly, as an issue which the Democrats have ignored in their proposed reference, is the usurpation of Australian sovereignty by an international committee and the stifling of democracy in this country by not allowing the public some foreknowledge as to how their lives and livelihoods may be affected by Australia's accession to this convention. The government's given no indication as to how this convention may be implemented in this country. But the government has chosen not to do so, but instead has displayed a willingness to sign away our sovereignty without confronting the Australian public's legitimate concerns, should ring alarm bells even for the Democrats, but it seems that it's uh, failed to do so. And of course, we shouldn't forget that when Senator Richardson, as the then Minister for Environment, was questioned on this issue, he refused to rule out. And I think it was Senator O'Chi that asked that question. He refused to rule out the possibility of the Australian government at some future date using its international, the international affairs the external affairs power that it would have under the signing of this convention to impose its will with regard to rangelands management. The signing of this convention represents an almost certain potential for this abuse of the external affairs power to further control land management in Australia, to override state laws and to centralise federal government to power in the process. It should be noted that this ludicrous situation has not escaped some of those from the government's own side. Former Labor Minister Peter Walsh, in an article which appeared in the Financial Review on 12 July, wrote, and I quote, I am not and have never been a monarchist, but find it ironic that so many contemporary Australians, determined to protect us from the non-existent threat of English tyranny, fall over each other in a scramble to surrender Australian sovereignty to a ragtag and bobtail of unrepresentative United Nations committees accountable to nobody. And I say here, here to that. And of course, he's not the only senior Labor figure expressing concern about the federal government's abuse of power. Only this week, we've seen the Queensland Labor Premier, Mr Goss, launch a detailed criticism of the federal government's uh, approach. Premier Goss is therefore now on common ground with the, the Liberal State Premiers. And he's, I might say, he's in, on this issue, he's on common ground with us in the Federal Opposition. 
While there's an obvious overlap in terms of the environmental impact of desertification, and perhaps uh, the Democrats in this proposal have taken account of uh, my criticisms of the wide-ranging and conflicting scientific evidence and attempt to clarify the nature of desertification, one cannot ignore that Australia's existing programs and inquiries are already examining this issue in the Australian context. And I must repeat again that Senator Coulter's and the Democrats' uh, emphasis in this proposed reference represent both a duplication of and an interference in that process that's already underway. The majority of Australians are preoccupied with a national drought of crisis proportions. This convention is something which they simply don't want. To them it's unnecessary and it's irrelevant. And if uh, we need to provide assistance to other countries that are suffering from this problem through aid and technology exchange, that can be readily accommodated through our existing bilateral and multi multilateral aid provisions. Perhaps if the government came clean on how it proposes to implement the convention and address some more relevant Australian concerns, instead of indulging in this preoccupation with international posturing and centralisation of power, the Australian community in general, not to mention those of us uh, in the opposition, might feel a little bit more charitable in regard to their approach to international conventions. But let me conclude by summarising that the signing of an international convention and the consequent domestic policy impact is not a matter for a wide-ranging environmental inquiry as proposed by the Democrats. The most unsatisfactory aspect of Senator Coulter's motion today, apart from the inconsistencies on which it's based, is that it is an attempt to manipulate the environmental agenda in this country for political point scoring purposes. It is quite senseless to attempt to turn every, every issue into an environmental issue, regardless of the nature of the problems. And I would suggest that uh, an attempt to do that is nothing more than uh, political opportunism and, and political cynicism. And that is something that the Australian public, I would uh, believe, would find unacceptable. So it's on that basis that uh, the opposition certainly will not be supporting this, uh, this resolution for a reference uh, of the convention on the basis provided by the Democrats to a committee for investigation, and I would urge the Senate uh, likewise to vote against it. Senator Cook. <coughs> Mr. President, uh, I think it might be appropriate if I, on behalf of the government, speak at this, on this occasion because my uh, next duty minister will be here shortly and not uh, briefed on this uh, debate. I therefore apologise for uh, jumping ahead of Senator Margetts in the queue. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the government does not support this motion, doesn't see the point of it, and uh, thinks that uh, the consultation is necessary to qualify the government to, I think on the 14th of October, sign this convention, uh, have been wide-ranging, comprehensive, and justify the government taking the view that this convention should be signed. Mr Acting Deputy President, this convention arises because of global concern that the planet Earth is increasingly turning to desert, that the areas of natural environment are in decline, the areas of rangeland and cultivatable land are in decline, deserts are taking over, and most importantly that's occurring in third world countries, but not only there. Australia is a first world country, uh, arguably that phenomena that we're witnessing is occurring here. As a consequence of that global problem, governments of the world believe an international solution must be found and international action must be mounted. That action mounted in one country to solve the problem may not uh, even help in that particular country if there isn't unified action elsewhere. This is a classic case of the United Nations playing a role for the planet. This is a classic case where international cooperation and action is necessary. And it's a, as, a, as a consequence of that universally perceived view that this convention has come to life. 
I'm not sure of the exact number of countries who have been involved in the process of hammering out this convention. I think it's 112. I might be wrong on that figure, but I think it is 112. And what we have uh, is a convention, the product of the labours of 112 different countries in the world, all with di different political systems, all with different political views and different ways and uh, responses to the development and versus environment debate, but united around the view that we can't let the globe go the way it is, is going without taking an international stand. And that one last point unified everybody. And as a consequence of all that diversity and difference, there is now an international convention in which Australia has played an important part in bringing to life. Now, I think when the United Nations succeeds in getting global action around a major issue, they ought to be applauded. It's a miracle in itself that you can get 112 countries to agree on anything. And yet we have a convention about a serious matter, and there is universal international agreement at the negotiating table for it. The trouble is, when it gets to Australia, it falls foul of I, what I regard as petty domestic politics, and those petty domestic politics overwhelm the vision of what is necessary here. When the, United Nations does, when the United Nations does something which stimulates the world, people say, good on the United Nations, what a fantastic system. The United Nations system tends to be one in which it is more mired down in squabbling and detail and unable to act than one in which it can act cleanly and effectively. This is an occasion in which it can act cleanly and effectively. And uh, the detractors say, well, you know, we haven't had enough time to consider this. We shouldn't uh, have to vote on it. This is anti-democratic. It's an usurpation of the, of the constitutional powers and, and criticisms of, of, of those things. But here is a global problem. Here is a global response, a unified global response, and it is the government's role and the government will, on the 14th of October, play its global role in supporting this international convention by signing it. Now, I want to just deal, before I go to the detail of this motion, with two of the uh, threshold arguments put forward, first by the Democrats and secondly by the, by the opposition. The Democrats without denying, I think, the larger picture at all, and in fact, uh, to be fair to them, would come and emphasise the larger picture in stronger and more colourful terms than perhaps I have. And I note for the record, Senator Coulter is nodding uh, his agreement to that point. And I express, Senator Coulter, to you, I think that would be the case. That in no way denies our commitment to it, but your tendency would be to express that more strongly. However, the Democrats say there should be greater parliamentary debate, and it's a usurpation of power by the executive for the terms of this convention not to be subject to greater parliamentary debate, and somehow that's uh, un undemocratic. Can I put it to you in these terms, Senator Coulter, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President? There are 112 countries, if my figures are right, involved in this. We are one. That means that 112 parliaments of some sort or another, some of them not, not democratic, that is true, others of them very democratic, are required to support this one way or another, yes or no. And well, what about a reservation? Well, they can put reservations forward if they want to, if we want to in, indulge in the, uh, in the, in the technic, right. in the tech, yes if we want to indulge in the, yes no. in the technicalities. It's not a yes or no thing. You're right. You're absolutely right. I concede the point. You can vote yes or you can support it yes or no, or you can put reservations to it. What the purpose of putting a reservation to it uh, might be escapes me, because what is required is not someone to say I'm half pregnant or I'm half in support of these things, or only in these circumstances owners of pearl-handled pocket knives can can indulge in that particular act. And, and non-owners can't, those sorts of trifling 
technicalities. What is required here is firm, across the board, unified international action. Now, the point is, if every parliament of the 112 countries is going to have a complete and utter licence to pour over the terms of this convention and change it at will, and if to take the example further, as some uh, in the opposition may wish to put, that the states in the Australian Federation should have that opportunity too, the number of negotiators is expanded by the number of members of the 112 parliaments and the possibility of the United Nations ever being able to agree on anything when, if any one of those can veto it, becomes just absolutely impossible. There has to be a simple and sensible democratic way of doing it. And there is in Australia. There is. That is found in our constitution. It is given to the, uh, to the Commonwealth government by the constitutional forefathers in their wisdom that the Commonwealth government of Australia has the power under the constitution to enter into these conventions. And if the Commonwealth then wants to apply those conventions within Australia, it has to come, it, uh, and wants to legislate to do so, it has to come to the parliament for the right to do so. But the right to enter into them is under the constitution with the Commonwealth government. Otherwise, every member of this place and every member of the other 112 places would have their say. You would never arrive at a conclusion, and that is not a, not a recipe for action. That is a recipe for defeating the purpose of a convention such as this, where there is overwhelming international recognition that something has to happen. It's a, it's a recipe for preventing action, not a recipe for doing anything. It's a recipe for avoiding the point, not reinforcing the point. It's a recipe for befuddling the community, not galvanising it around the purposes for which there is perceived public need. And while doing all those befuddling, beguiling and, and misrepresenting things to pretend that there is a serious belief here somehow that you are still on the side of arguing for, for improvement in the environment. Now, the, the question raised by the opposition is that this is an abuse of, uh, of constitutional power by the Commonwealth. Well, it's a silly argument. It's an argument that has no basis in foundation. I mean, you can't have an argument in which says the constitutional forefathers who drafted the Constitution of Australia didn't mean to include an empowerment of the Commonwealth government to affect international treaties and conventions. They did. That's accepted. And because they did. If a government exercises it, you can't say that a government is abusing that power. It is not. The government was clothed with that power by the Constitution. We are, on the case of this convention, exercising that power quite properly and after widespread consultation in the community around an international problem that requires urgent action and then to describe that as abuse is to abuse an understanding of the Constitution and to use the Constitution in debate as if, it, uh, as if it is some sort of toy that can be thrown up to, uh, to prevent action by a government uh, on the basis that somehow the government is misre misrepresenting the Constitution. The people who do that misrepresent the Constitution, not the government. We are not signing away our sovereignty. We are, in fact, reinforcing our sovereignty as the constitutional forefathers uh, had uh, have framed the constitution. Now, I'm one of those people who think the Australian constitution is in, inadequate in many respects and ought to be changed. But uh, I will argue that in the proper forums at the proper time. This is a power in the constitution. The government is entitled to exercise it. Now, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, or Madam Acting Deputy President, turning to the arguments as to why we won't support this motion. The first argument is that the government has consulted widely with interested parties at every stage of these negotiations, that the government has invited contributions widely within Australia to the development of Australia's objectives for this, 
for this convention, and we have then acted on that advice and sought uh, those objectives to be enshrined in this international convention. The objectives that we have had arising from that community consultation are those that go to its uh, those those objectives are that the convention itself should be international in scope, but that would, it would provide for the development of regional, national and local plans and programs to, com to combat a desertification. <coughs> it should uh, ensure that it's addressed the underlying causes of what's turning land into deserts, including environmental causes, human behaviour and socio-economic factors, and it should include specific and remedial measures to turn back deserts into arable land. One of the objectives that we have, uh, we have pursued is one which uh, ensures that it contained effective and equitable funding provisions which maximise coordination of existing programs to combat desertification. The Convention should also recognise the relationship between the Des Desertification Convention and other international environmental agreements ensuring consistency between them all and that it should uh, maximise possible commercial opportunities for Australian expertise in arid land management. They were the objectives that uh, arose from our community consultation that we proceeded to the negotiating table internationally with. Who did we go to that negotiating table with? Did we go on our own as a government or did we bring community representatives? We brought community representatives to the negotiating table so that it was not just the government negotiating, but it was the government and the Australian community organisations negotiating together. We brought the National Farmers Federation and the Australian Conservation Foundation, and they participated in the negotiations with us as a government. They participated actively as members of our delegation and in the international negotiating sessions. Did the government of Australia go as the government of Australia without recognition of the role of the states or the territories in Australia? No, it did not. The government of Australia consulted closely with the states and territories. The states and territories, I might say, have played a significant role in the development of the policy positions that uh, have been put forward. This input that they, that, they, uh, that they made led to the provision in the final text that the preparation of national action plans to combat desertification should be voluntary for developed country signatories, an issue that Australia pursued in these international talks. And the state of New South Wales represented the states and territories of Australia on the Australian delegation at, at all but the first of the five international negotiating sessions. So we went as the government of Australia with the community organisations, the National Farmers Federation, and the Australian Conservation Foundation, and we went with the state of New South Wales representing the states, a comprehensive delegation representing the spread of and spectrum of Australian political and, uh, and ethical views on this matter. The CSIRO, as well, I'm told, uh, acted in an advisory way on this delegation. Importantly, Mr President, Acting Deputy President, Australia's objectives were met in full in the final text of the Desertification Convention, and they were agreed at the final negotiating session in Paris on the 17th of June this year. All parties involved in the Australian, in the Australian delegation, those parties I've referred to, the NFF, the Australian Conservation Foundation, the State of New South Wales representing the states and territories, uh, supported the final text. Now that's the act of a responsible government representing the Australian community in the width and depth of its uh, political and socio-economic spectrum and of views on this subject. And their voice in signing off on this agreement is one that is bound, I think, to be heeded when the Australian government gives effect to uh, their will by signing the formal document on the 14th of October. Now, in terms of the impacts of de desertification in Australia, there are several processes underway which are working towards researching its effects 
and which uh, seek to develop and implement policies designed to relieve these effects. So I come to the second argument. What are we doing about implementing this convention and what are the things that are underway? Let me refer to a few of them. The Commonwealth Government is working with state governments and with uh, non-government organisations on the formulation of a national rangelands management strategy. The national rangelands management strategy will seek to provide management guidelines, scientific advice and recommend an ongoing consultation process relating to land use in Australia's rangelands while taking into account the economic and social implications. That's one major work on foot. The Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs is currently inquiring into the land care policies and programs in Australia, reporting on the last sitting day in December this year. A significant policy under scrutiny and subject to report later this year. The same committee is also inquiring into the Rural Adjustment Scheme, reporting in December, and the value adding in agricultural production, uh, reporting in June of next year. That, that committee has a full workload doing significant things in those areas as well. And the review of the decade of land care currently being undertaken under the auspices of the National Land Care Advisory Council we look at the operations and appropriateness of land care programs. How they operate in the rangelands will be a key issue to be considered in formulating the National Rangelands Management Strategy. So there are a number of things, inquiries in, in principle, currently uh, being undertaken. The advice from those inquiries, the findings of those inquiries, will go to make up what the government decides will be its most appropriate uh, approach in implementing these reports. I don't think anyone can seriously argue that the government should preempt these inquiries and declare an implementation program instantly to satisfy and gratify some of the members of this Senate who say what, it would, what, what should it be. I think it's entirely appropriate that those inquiries go through, be completed, the findings be, uh, be publicly aired and contested, and the government draw from them in formulating its implementation program. So, in conclusion, the government considers that the issues raised in this motion have been or are in the process of being addressed to the satisfaction of the majority of the interests that are involved. And that's through the consultative process which surrounded the effective preparation of Australia's negotiating position on the convention, a position which is reflected in the final text, and through the ongoing processes I've outlined in which government, scientists, experts and land users are working together to find solutions to the environmental, economic and social difficulties which our arid environment presents us with. I conclude my remarks by saying that there is nothing that is happening here which can be uh, stalled by allegations that we are undemocratic. That's a nonsense. We are acting perfectly and responsibly within the Constitution, as everyone knows. If we were not, there would be a challenge to us and we would be struck down, and so we should. There is no challenge. We are not struck down. We are acting with authority and we should proceed. The issue on which we are proceeding, what is the issue? The fact that this globe's land mass is turning to desert and requires international, concerted international action by all countries in the world to remedy it an overwhelming international environmental issue, supported by all colours and stripes of government and political opinion, as a major international problem. Australia, in those circumstances, has an obligation as a leading and developed nation in the world to play its role with the United Nations under this convention to attack that problem. That's all that this government is wanting to do—stand up for this country, play its international role properly and ensure that a serious environmental problem is properly dealt with. Senator O'Chee. Acting Deputy President, I went to the dentist this morning and the pain of having a tooth pulled is nothing in comparison with the pain which will be inflicted upon rural Australia if this treaty is signed without scrutiny. There are therefore two issues which need examination today. The first is whether it is appropriate to sign this treaty as the government would have us without any consultation with the parliament and without any parliamentary scrutiny. And then the second question to be asked is, if parliamentary scrutiny is appropriate, what is the best manner in which to conduct that scrutiny? 
Now, honourable senators listening to Senator Cook might be mistaken for believing that Senator Cook was actually concerned about this country, but in fact he is not. And some of the arguments that we've heard from Senator Cook have been totally and utterly spurious, Madam Acting Deputy President. He started by saying that there were 112 countries involved in the negotiation of this treaty. Well, that is probably the case. He then went on to say that there are 112 parliaments that will have to decide yes or no. Now, leaving aside the question of reservations, that is exactly what Senator Cook said. But the interesting thing, Madam Acting Deputy President, is that this parliament will not get the right to say yes or no, because this arrogant minister and this arrogant government have taken it upon themselves to decide what is good for this country and what is not, and without any reference to the parliament and without any reference, uh, without any reference to this chamber. The role of the parliament is to keep an eye on the ministry. The role of the parliament is to ensure that the executive does not have an unfettered power to do as they wish. And yet this minister says, look, forget about your responsibility as parliamentarians because there's 112 nations who've negotiated on this and now that it's all negotiated, we don't want you to fulfil your obligation to scrutinise this convention. That is the argument the government puts up. If one follows that argument, then it, it follows, Madam Acting Deputy President, that there is no point in having this parliament. There is none whatsoever. Because on every issue they would say, well, the executive has gone and done it, the executive has gone and signed this particular uh, treaty or decided to do this, that or the other. There's no role for you. There is a role for us, and that is why this parliament is here. This parliament is here because our founding fathers did not believe that any person did not believe that any government should be given an unfettered power. And our role is to scrutinise what the people who sit opposite do. They gave us the right to sign it. Now, Senator Cook interjects they were given the right to sign it. Senator Cook's understanding of constitutional law is minuscule, to say the least. Now, one of the most appalling misrepresentations that I've heard in this chamber is the argument that the Founding Fathers, through the Constitution, gave a power, gave a power to the Commonwealth Government to sign treaties. That is arrant nonsense. Senator Cook has obviously never read Section 51 of the Constitution. It does not say that there is a power given to the Commonwealth Government. Section 51 of the Constitution merely says that the, com that the Commonwealth Parliament shall have the power to make laws with respect to, amongst other things, external affairs. It doesn't say the Commonwealth Government and it doesn't say the Executive. It says the Commonwealth Parliament shall have a right to make laws with respect to external affairs. And it follows, Madam Acting Deputy President, that if the Commonwealth Parliament has a right to make laws with respect to external affairs, we at least have the right to refer some of these matters off to a committee for examination and report beforehand. But Senator Cook doesn't even want us to do that. Now here is the hypocrisy from the other side. They say, they say that there is a power to make laws with relation to external affairs. Yet when you don't even want to go so far as to make a law, you merely want to examine the issue beforehand, they say, no, you don't have a right to do it. Well, what arrant hypocrisy, what utter, utter garbage. No, listen, listen, Senator Cook, maybe it would be a good thing if you were honest for a change. You have a reputation in this chamber which is quite without parallel, and you are only adding to it at the moment. Now, Senator Cook says, Senator Cook says that there is an unfettered power. Well, that is nonsense as well. To the extent that a power exists, to the extent that the executive has a right to sign treaties, that power and that right is not embodied in the written constitution. It's embodied in the common law. And when this country became a commonwealth in 1900. What happened was that the common law, as it stood at that point in time, was embodied in our constitution. So what does the common law say, Madam Acting Deputy President, about the power of the executive to sign treaties? The interesting thing is that the common law before 1900 or before 1901 did not recognise an unfettered power of the executive to sign treaties. And that was recognised in a case— Well, I think you ought to withdraw that. 
Well, I take offence, Madam Acting Deputy President. I ask it to be withdrawn. Minister, would you please, for the sake of withdrawing? Madam Acting Deputy President, I withdraw the remark, but anyone who, uh, who, anyone who wants to argue Un that there was a federal constitution before 1901 uh, really invites that sort of comment. Unqualified withdrawal. Senator Achey. Madam Acting President, was that withdrawal unqualified or otherwise? That was withdrawn, Senator. Well, I thought you were just asking for unqualified withdrawal. He has, un he has withdrawn it. Please continue. OK. Well, let's get on to the, to the next silly point that Senator Cook came up with, which was the suggestion that there was no constitutional law in this country before 1900. I mean, that is garbage. That is utter garbage. Senator Cook, again, shows not only his ignorance but his lack of manners in interjecting as he leaves the chamber. And he obviously shows he has no concern for this issue if he wants to march off in a huff. Well, that sort of schoolboy stuff is not going to do in this place. Let's examine the existing common law in relation to... Senator and Minister. It is a standard practice in this place not to attribute motive to people. And Senator O'Chi has just attributed a motive to uh, uh, Senator Cook, and I would like to ask him to withdraw it. I was merely reflecting on the fact that Senator Cook did not have the good manners to sit in his place whilst he interjected. Now, if I... Oh. And further to the point of order, that is not what I was objecting to. It was suggesting that Senator Cook was leaving this place in a huff. That is completely inappropriate, Senator O'Chi. You know that. And I'd ask Madam Acting Deputy President if the Senator could withdraw it. Well, to the point of order. Madam Acting Deputy President, to the point of order. If anybody thinks that Senator Cook was in anything other than a huff as he left this chamber, you know, I think they'd be sitting on their own sin because it is quite clear that Senator Cook has all the way through this debate shown an utter contempt of this parliament and an utter contempt of the right of people in this parliament to raise these matters. Now, I merely reflected on his conduct as he left the chamber. I did not say why he was leaving the chamber. I reflected on his conduct as he left the chamber. Minister. Well, further to that, Madam Acting Deputy President, Senator O'Chi has just confirmed my point of order by suggesting and claiming again that Senator Cook was leading in a huff. You have no understanding or uh, can you cannot you cannot assume that that actually intent that implies a state of the senator's attitudes. You, you, I am being very serious, Senator. Senator Cook had to leave this chamber just as much as I came here for all sorts oh, of other reasons. Senator you, are, you are the person who is flying in the face of decent practice in this place. Now, if you want to go by the rules of the Senate, Senator O'Chi, let's do that. You have ascribed motive to Senator Cook. That is clearly outside of the standing orders, and I would ask Madam Acting Deputy President that the Senator withdraw it. Senator O'Chi, you were making comments in I was interpreting that you were indicating that Senator, you thought Senator Minister Cook was misleading. Am I correct in? Madam Acting President, that was not the point of order taken. No, but in the, in the debate, you, I would. If I may assist you on the point of order, at that point in time, Senator Cook was in the chamber and took no offence whatsoever. Senator O'Chi, I would appreciate the debate returning to them. I don't think there is a point of order. However, I would appreciate that if you would withdraw your comments about later comments about him, if you made them, about misleading. And if you could return to the subject and be perhaps a little less effusive in your language. Madam Acting Deputy President, I did not say that he misled the Senate. I said he misrepresented the Constitution. Now, Senator Cook, in okay. his address, accused honourable senators on this side of the chamber of misrepresenting the Constitution. I think it's perfectly in order for us to reply to that matter and to reply in substance, which is what I'm seeking to do. But, so, so, Madam Acting Deputy President, for clarification, I did not say that he, Thank you. he misled the Senate. Thank you. But he clearly has misrepresented the Constitution, and he has clearly misrepresented the constitutional law. And the constitutional law is very clear on this matter. It was, it was considered in a case called the Parlement Belge, and it was held that there was no unfettered power in the, in the, uh, in the executive to execute treaties. And in particular, the court in that case, and it has been upheld in numerous occasions since, has ruled that where the executive signs a treaty, which could have implications for the property rights of private individuals, the effects of that treaty are a nullity, are a nullity, because the execution of the treaty is ultra vires. Now, Senator Cook clearly either does not understand that 
or does not wish to understand it, and that is the problem that this parliament faces. What we have seen from this government is nothing but obfuscation. Nothing but obfuscation on the entire issue of their constitutional power and nothing but obfuscation on what is really behind this convention. Senator Cook, for example, told this Senate just a couple of minutes ago that there had been a widespread process of consultation. That widespread process of consultation, Madam Acting Deputy President, did not go so far as the tabling of this convention in this parliament. So much for the process of consultation. This parliament is the forum to which this government must bring its ideas, must bring its proposals. This parliament is the body with which the executive must consult. And have they consulted with the parliament, Madam Acting Deputy President? The answer is clearly no. They haven't even had the decency to table the convention. So how can they say there's been widespread consultation? Nothing could be more offensive to the truth than to suggest that there has been widespread consultation, whereas in fact there has not. Now what has this government done? This government has rushed off overseas with the idea of signing yet another convention. What is really behind this convention? Is it a concern for countries in Africa that are suffering from desertification, or is it in fact that this federal government wants to grab the land management powers off the states and grab powers off local authorities to manage their own shires? This is what it's really about. Because Senator Cook gave the game away. He said in relation to the national action plans that are called for under the convention that they were voluntary on affected developed countries. That is true. They are voluntary. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, you see, once the government lodges a national action plan, it is bound by that plan. So, yes, the plan is voluntary, but once it's lodged, it becomes binding. It's merely the lodgement of the plan that's voluntary and not the undertaking to follow that plan. As soon as this government lodges a national action plan, they will then say, I'm sorry to the states, they'll say, I'm sorry to the local authorities, they'll say, we now have the power, as a result of this treaty, to handle land management issues in the states. And the idea that a couple of bureaucrats sitting here in Canberra can tell a local authority how it should manage its shire is quite simply preposterous. I mean, there are over 300 local authorities in my state of Queensland alone. Goodness knows how many hundred local authorities in New South Wales and South Australia and Victoria and all of these affected areas. But you see, this is what the federal government's real agenda is. It's all about power. It's not really about the environment. And of course, it was made clearer what their agenda was when Senator Cook said that the rangelands management strategy was part of the process of implementation. Implementation is the appropriate word, Madam Acting Deputy President, because they intend to implement against the wishes of the states and against the wishes of local communities some sort of plan which is drawn up by UN bureaucrats. And it is really offensive to me and offensive to many people in rural Australia that the Europeans, who have done a wonderful job of destroying their environment, will now get a say in how we run ours. I mean, that is a marvellous suggestion from the government, and that is where they're going. Now, one of the disturbing things about this whole process, one of the very, very disturbing things about this whole process, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the manner in which people seem to suggest that there is massive desertification in Australia at the moment. I mean, it is a fact that, drought notwithstanding, there is in fact more water in some areas of Western Queensland than there was a hundred years ago. And there is a reason for that. And Senator Crowley laughs because she obviously doesn't understand the issue. Senator Crowley laughs because she doesn't understand that it was only a hundred years ago that they started putting bores in Western Queensland and starting put, started to put water into areas which were previously dry. Now, Senator Crowley represents that very narrow view of a small group of intellectual people who sit in Adelaide, who never get off the bitumen, who wouldn't have a clue about Queensland, who wouldn't have an understanding of the issues at question, and that is the danger in signing this convention that the best people to manage land management issues in Queensland are people who live there. Now, people, people in Queensland, people in Julia Creek and Richmond and Hewenden and Boulia 
and Baduri don't say how they should live life in South Australia. People in Western Queensland couldn't be concerned with what Rosemary Crowley, Senator Crowley, does with her backyard in Adelaide. That's her right. All they say is, when it's our backyard, it should be our right. And that, you see, is where the government comes to a screaming halt, because it doesn't believe that people in rural Australia ought to have a right to manage their own properties and manage their own shires. They want to manage it all from Adelaide. They want to manage it all from Adelaide. That's what this story is all about, Madam Acting Deputy President. And the more and more Senator Crowley continues to interject in his rude fashion, which we have at the moment, the more and more it is patently obvious that Senator Crowley has no interest in listening to what people in Western Queensland have to say, because she knows it all. She knows it all. Well, I'm afraid, Senator Crowley, you don't know it all. And the more you listen and the less you interjected, perhaps the better this debate might be. Now, Madam Acting order, Deputy order, President, order. it is very clear. It is very clear that it is not necessary for us to sign this convention as is. And it is very clear also that they have, uh, we have other rights available to us, for example, the right to sign the convention with a, with a reservation. Now, of course, if one listened to Senator Cook, one would believe that all of the countries which have negotiated this convention will sign without reservation. Of course, this is a myth that the government puts around on a, on a whole host of conventions. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, it's clearly not the case. For example, the UN Convention on uh, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights is signed with reservation by large numbers of countries. By large numbers of countries. Yet this is part of the myth that the Labor Party wants to perpetuate, that everybody is going off on this utopian global action thing. The fact is that we will be probably one of the few countries that signs without, reserva without reservation and without any consultation to the parliament. And that is how arrogant this government has become. So it is clear that this convention does need parliamentary scrutiny. The next question is, what is the best way in which to scrutinise this convention? Do we go down the route that Senator Coulter is proposing? We in the coalition disagree because we believe the better forum for this matter is in the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee. And I'm very concerned with the terms of reference that Senator Coulter has provided, because these terms of reference give absolutely no scope to the committee, which he proposes to examine this matter, having a chance to look at the issues for local authorities, to look at the issues for land management and to look at the constitutional powers of the states and look at the rights of local communities to determine what happens in their own backyard. Instead, Senator Coulter's motion seems more aimed in points A, B, C and D at establishing a massive program, a massive pattern of desertification in this country so that this country's land management can be further handed over to the scientific bureaucrats. For example, in paragraph A he says that the committee should examine the extent of desertification in Australia's rangelands, its causes and environmental, social and economic impacts. In B he says the committee should examine actions required to halt and reverse desertification in Australia. In C he says the means of monitoring the progress of programs directed at reversing desertification in Australia should be examined. And he further argues that, uh, indeed, that we should examine the capacity of the Desertification Convention to contribute to Australia's efforts to halt and reverse desertification both in Australia and overseas. But nowhere in there, nowhere in there does it look at the competency of the federal government to legislate with, relation, with respect to these matters, and that is of concern to us. Now, we, on this side of Parliament, do not believe in giving a blank cheque to the government. And that is what the first part of this debate is about. The second part of, of, of this debate is who should examine these issues, who is best to, equipped to examine these issues. And we clearly believe that these terms of reference miss the main point of the objections that people in rural Australia have. And the sad thing, Madam Acting Deputy President, is that there is so much that can be done to make inland Australia more productive. And one of the sad things is, if this sort of motion goes through, and if this convention is signed without reservation, that we may in fact lose the opportunity to deal with those problems. Because the best way to deal with problems of desertification and so on is through water storage, water conservation and irrigation. And our concern is that these terms of reference don't examine that at all. They don't give you the scope to do that. And instead, of focusing on the bigger issue, which is how can we make inland Australia more productive? Because there's nothing wrong with the soil in most of inland Australia, it's just it doesn't rain. 
If we can get more water to these areas, then we can really make the country productive and we can in fact improve the capacity to care for the soil, certainly in Western Queensland, which I know very well. Yet, if we limit all of our efforts to halting desertification, if it exists, then we really miss the point of how do we make Australia more productive. And for those reasons, Madam Acting Deputy President, we on this side of the chamber cannot accept Senator Coulter's motion. We do not believe it offers anything to people in the bush. We do not believe it offers anything in terms of a grand vision for the productivity of this country, and therefore we will oppose it. Senator Chamaret. Uh, Senator Margaret. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak briefly today in support of the motion today from Senator Coulter. Um, people would realise that I was involved in the debate um, with the motion some weeks ago by Senator Chapman in relation to a proposal to refer, um, refer a reference to a committee in relation to the desertification treaty. I certainly sat here finding it a bit rich that Senator Chapman at that time um, has, or today has suggested that the Greens and the Democrats, and especially the Greens, uh, were not prepared to look at a balanced um, inquiry. What we did do at that time was talk in detail to the opposition about the fact that if such wording as is included in today's proposed motion had been included in the motion which the opposition were proposing to put to the committee, that is a truly balanced uh, proposition which wasn't just treaty bashing but being prepared to put their information where their mouth was in relation to not just environment, and I wonder about the the ability to read on, in some instances because Part A clearly says includes social and economic impacts. The call seems to be always one way when environment is concerned and when anyone actually suggests taking any actual action about environment then the call is, but this will cost money. It may well do. But I don't know if the opposition are aware that the federal government doesn't actually have any department whose job is to look at the social and economic implications of government decisions. So basically, we have in Western Australia, the, the current state government has abolished the social impact unit. We have a federal government who has put no resources into looking at social and economic implications of any policy decisions, especially environmental ones, perhaps. So therefore what is being asked isn't actually being done by any other committee or unit officially in Australia, as to my knowledge at the moment. Yes, there is a national rangelands management strategy being developed. No, it won't have any requirements for people to actually uh, do anything in particular other than what's happening now. But the Rural and Regional Affairs is looking at a land care study, but that's not also specifically looking at economic and social implications. They, Senator Cook says it takes into account the economic and social implications. Who is providing that information on economic and social implications? Well, again and again we see from both major parties in this chamber that they separate out the environment for the economy from the economy except when it is convenient. When there are economic implications of us turning a blind eye to the damage we're doing to the environment, we're not giving ourselves the ability to find out what those implications are. Now, if it is true that irrigation in Queensland, as has been mentioned by Senator O'Chee, if it's true that that has improved or has reduced desertification in Queensland, then that information is also the kind of information that it's looking at in terms of actions required to halt and reverse desertification in Australia. It doesn't mean that that information isn't taken into account. But at some stage in this parliament, we actually have to work out whether or not we want to know not just about the environment, but whether we want to know about the social and economic implications of decisions which impact on the environment. And so far, I've seen no evidence that either side actually wants to know. They perhaps want to make cheap points, but they don't actually want to know. 
So therefore, when you see that both the impact of desertification and the impact of the desertification treaty were mentioned in this motion, I find it extraordinary that the government doesn't want to know either, because they can't tell me, they cannot tell me which department, which people are actually paid by this federal government to tell us, to actually look into these kind of implications and tell us what the implications are, because they don't exist. So therefore, the, as I say, we're prepared to support this motion. I'll also reiterate we're prepared to support a sensible, properly balanced motion from the opposition which wasn't forthcoming. And I'm extremely disappointed, disappointed that the government is prepared to allow this point scoring going continue to go on, because if we don't at some stage look at the way that we can integrate environment, economy and social issues, then we are going to continue to have these arguments on every single occasion. Senator Burns. Uh, acting Madam and President, uh, I was very interested to hear Senator O'Chee talk about the right of parliament. He was painting for me a picture of an all-powerful organisation that really doesn't have to take into consideration a wide variety of views on issues that should, uh, should be are dealt by parliament. It might I just say that much of the legislation that goes through both the chambers has been as a result of interest groups lobbying the government, asking them to put in place legislation which will assist them in furthering the interests of their industry and the people associated with it. He talked about the validity of a, treat of a treaty affecting private property. It must be very clear to anybody who thinks about these matters that any law of any consequence or any treaty of any consequence which has been signed by a number of people will almost automatically affect a private property. It's a question of dealing with that in a very thoughtful and considerate way and making sure that people aren't disadvantaged. But surely the public interest on many occasions has got to override the interests of individual people. Now, the United Nations, in my view, is much more important to this globe of ours and to the future of young people in this country, in this uh, globe, than Australia or any other nation. Any nation is capable of being wiped out in the event of war. I believe that the United Nations, while it is, it is imperfect, has played a great role in preventing any wars of any great significance, even though they have had to deal with uh, many of uh, the regional conflicts that now exist and I believe is the only organisation capable of really solving these problems and restoring peace in those areas. Now, if one looks at the way in which the United Nations deals with developing uh, protocols, developing conventions and the role, the role of nations within that concept, I guess one is reminded of all sorts of negotiations that go on in various areas of interest. Now, to suggest that representatives of this country should go to the United Nations, sit down with representatives of quite numerous other nations to try to get some sort of uh, compromise or some sort of a consensus on what should be applied on a worldwide basis in the interests of all nations, and then say, well, look, this is the position uh, we would be prepared to go so far on this issue if you'll come so far on the other issue. But then, of course, we've all got to go back to our individual governments and say, what do you think of this document? We would then be sent back to, they would be sent back to negotiate it again and again. I've been involved in many negotiations in the industrial relations field, and might I say the key to the success of most of them is that the people who are involved in the negotiation have the authority to say, yes, our country will accept that. That is the view of our country. And it isn't done, done in isolation. It's done because the people who are there should understand what the policy and the position of Australia is in all of these negotiations. Uh, Senator Cook has already indicated that there was an involvement in the negotiations on the desertification uh, convention, and he mentioned the fact that uh, the New South Wales government was represented and it was, that was by the District Lands Commissioner, the New South Wales Western District Lands Commissioner, which is an area 
of rangeland that could well and has been already, to some extent, affected by desertification. So here we have a situation where we go forward with people who understand the issues, drawing into the process people rightly into the, in the community. To me, that, that, that is democracy, that you do those sort of things, that these people understand and they're able to put forward a view having in mind the general position in Australia. Now, on this particular convention, of course, those people went into those negotiations with the knowledge of the development of what is known as the decade in land care, a land care policy which was put in place as the result of a lot of work being done by the conservation movement and, on the other hand, by the National Farmers Federation. And I can say here in this chamber, as the chairman of the inquiry into land care, that one of the, first, uh, the two first people we interviewed as witnesses were representatives of the Conservation Foundation, who at the time were one of the generators of the idea of land care, and Rick Farley, who is the chief executive of the National Farmers Federation. And one might think there would be differences in that area, but we found that most of the goals that they'd set were pretty, pretty much the same. There were some short differences in some areas of how we should get there, but each of them wanted sustainable use of the land and the land preserved for future generations in this country. So we found that land care is operating based on evidence in various public hearings reasonably well. But how then do we say, well, you know, land care, we, we think it's a great idea, we've got to preserve the land, and then look internationally at a proposal to do something about desertification, which is a big part of, of a concern, of course, for land care. And Senator Hsu talked about irrigation and water points and preservation of water. The facts are that in most cases desertification is caused by grazing clove-footed animals on, on, on areas which cannot sustain it, where they destroy the, the, the land cover, all the vegetation, and gradually the sand takes over and the desert encroaches on land that was once used by, say, native animals like kangaroos and other soft-footed animals. And so it get, does get to the question of the use of the land at all or how many beasts you might have on that particular land. So we went to that particular conference uh, at the United Nations with this fairly long history of land care and our concern for the land in Australia. And of course there would be no doubt that there would have been views expressed of a fairly conservative nature as to what should be put in writing and accepted by the international community. I imagine there are others who are fairly gung-ho that would have suggested some, uh, some views and some uh, construction of clauses in the agreement that would have created a situation where the land could not be grazed or could not be used at all. But what we have, of course, is a situation that is different to that where we've got a compromise by the groups. Now, of course, people who are concerned on the other side, as Senator O'Chi, is about the government having a scrutiny about the, this particular convention. Uh, you would think that there was something terrible about it, that it was going to be in danger of everybody. He talked, for instance, about the right of local government to decide what should happen in their area. Well, the facts are that local government boundaries and state boundaries in this nation are nothing but a hindrance when it comes to looking after the land, when it comes to land care. If we look at one of the largest of the land care projects, and an area where probably more degradation has occurred than anywhere else is the Murray-Darling area. And there is a body that looks at the Murray-Darling area right across state boundaries, let alone local government boundaries, and it cannot be solved on a state-by-state -state basis. It has got to be solved on the whole catchment area. In our discussions and listening to witnesses on our, our inquiry travels throughout Australia, we gauge very clearly and very easily and very early that the most successful of all the land care programs to bring the land back to its health and to look after the land in the future were based on catchment area plans and cooperation between farmers on a catchment area, even if it was only a small creek, on a catchment area. 
We were told, for instance, this silly idea that uh, had come into vogue over many years that if one was cutting up land for ownership by farmers, whether it be under leasehold or, or freehold, it was all done in squares. Where in fact for somebody to look after that particular land, it is more obvious and more correct to run maybe a fence along a ridge line so that per a person in that area could more effectively look after his land without having to ask the person next door or to enroach onto his private property or whatever. That of course is being overcome, as I said before, by the idea of the catchment approach to management because many of the farmers are sensibly now looking at how they work operating together. It is no good, as I say, to, to, to look after the area down at the bottom of the catchment area if above is creating problems which make it impossible. So there we are. We had that situation. We went over with all this knowledge and we put our footprint on the national, international convention with our skill, with our credibility because of the way we are able to operate and the things that we've done in the, in the international forums. But let's have a look at uh, some of the provision, for instance, in that convention. It says, two, national action programs shall specify the respective roles of government, local communities and land users and the resources available and needed. They shall, enter alia, incorporate long-term strategies to combat desertification and mitigate the effects of drought, emphasise implementation and be integrated with national policies for sustainable development, allow for modifications to be made in response to changing circumstances and be sufficiently flexible at the local level to cope with different socio-economic, biological and geophysical conditions. C. Give particular attention to the implementation of preventative measures for lands that are not yet degraded or which are only slightly degraded. D. Enhance national climatological, meteorological and hydrological capabilities and the means to provide for drought early warning. Promote policies and strengthen institutional frameworks which develop cooperation and coordination in a spirit of partnership between the donor community, governments at all levels, local populations and community groups and facilitate access by local populations to appropriate information and technology. I don't see anything so far to be all concerned about and want to take up the time of the Senate. F. Provide for effective participation at the local, national and regional levels of non-government organisations and local populations, both women and men particularly resource users, including farmers and pastoralists and their representative organisations in policy planning, decision making and implementation and the review of national action programs and G require regular review of and progress reports on their implementation. Now, if you look at all that, of course, uh, it, it, it fits in with uh, some of the things that Senator, uh, Senator Chi suggested there should be an involvement of local government. But what it does say is it shouldn't give them dictatorial authority as it shouldn't give any parliament to make these decisions. Democracy is not about electing people for three or four years and then letting them do what they like. It is about people being involved all across Australia in all walks of life to make sure that those people that are elected do the job properly and in the interest of the community as much as possible because, as we know, there are conflicts and different points of interest. Now, Landcare has found its way through a process of cross-fertilisation of international processes into other United Nations plans and strategies. The essential elements of the land care partnership concept was imported from the Desertification Convention to the Program of Action for Sustainable Development of Small Island Developing States, which was adopted in Barbados in May this year. I mean, here we have a situation where we develop a concept and an attitude that's correct based on inputs from people right in all in all areas of life in Australia, because Landcare also talks about parks and gardens and areas around the urban uh, parts of Australia. We have all this input and we influence people all over the world as to correct approach to these things. And yet we have people opposite suggesting that uh, it is a matter uh, where we are being dictated to by other nations of the United Nations. It is absolutely untrue 
we have a great deal of influence and shall continue to, to assert that, exert that influence as long as our credibility lasts. And that cr credibility does require that we not only make these suggestions, have input into these conventions, but that we also sign them and carry them out ourselves. Now, I think a, a classic example of how we should ignore the aspects of state and local government boundaries is a development that's taken place in recent times, where a number of people have got together from Queensland and, and New South Wales in the southwest Queensland area and the northwest uh, New South Wales area in the Mallee, where that particular land, uh, which is used for grazing, is very similar in either side of the state border. They are developing a system and a plan which will ignore that state boundary, but will be good for the people who live there. People who are really Australians first and people in, who are making an input into the plan who will have ownership of the plan. And if that experience that we have there can be then used and translated into the international field, then as far as I'm concerned it's a great idea and any convention that might cover that area should be signed by this particular nation. I would suggest that hypocrisy has been shown on the other side in regard to this resolution. I oppose the resolution put forward by the opposition recently to refer the matter to the Rural and Regional Affairs because I think the convention is correct. I think the government has behaved in a correct manner and I oppose it for the same reasons today. I think it's a great convention. We should sign it and be proud of the fact of the input that we've had into it and be determined to make this, give the same sort of input into other issues that will benefit everybody on this globe of ours and, as I, I repeat, so that we can create the sort of situation and circumstances where we can have a peaceful globe and a peaceful future for the children of every country in the world. Senator Coulter. Thank you. In concluding this debate, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, the, um, I was really surprised at what uh, Senator O'Chee had to say because he devoted at least half of his uh, speech to uh, really supporting the, uh, the notion that uh, these conventions should come in some form back towards this parliament. In fact, uh, I think he was most eloquent on that, in that uh, respect. And, uh, he then went on and quite uh, inconsistently said, but bringing it before this parliament by way of bringing it before a committee did not fulfil that requirement. Now, I'm not too sure, unless he actually wants to, and I suspect that is the position of the, of the opposition, they actually want to get rid of this convention altogether and they don't want to do anything about uh, desertification. If that is their position, of course, well then uh, they're, they're really just simply using uh, this process as an excuse uh, to, uh, to get rid of the convention and get rid of an attack on, uh, on desertification. And of course that is supported. Because if one uh, goes back to uh, uh, Senator Chapman's original uh, address when he was moving his own motion, he uh, spent most of his time arguing that desertification uh, did simply uh, did not exist. So uh, putting those things together, I think you find the inconsistency in Senator O'Chee's argument and you find the, um, the lack of acceptance that this motion which in fact speaks quite specifically of the impact of the desertification convention on the sustainability of rural pastoral mining, um, the economic and social environmental uh, communities and so on. It, it picks up the concerns which he has but um, uh, genuinely but does not go down the track of uh, arguing that desertification does not, uh, does not exist. And um, one is therefore uh, unable to accept that inconsistency from the from the opposition, and again, I would enjoin them to come in behind this uh, this uh, motion and support it on the grounds that it is a mechanism. It is a mechanism by which the uh, uh, this convention, not conventions in general, but this particular convention, can come before some parliamentary scrutiny. Now, turning to uh, what uh, uh, Senator Cook said, he seemed to argue that. Uh, uh, because there had been consultation, and he specifically mentioned the ACF and the Farmers Union and the, the, uh, the government of, of the state of New South Wales in framing the convention, that therefore it was fully democratic. Now, you know, as a member of the Australian Conservation Foundation, certainly 
you know, that is a democratic organisation, but democratic within the bounds of those people who join the organisation. It's not broadly representative of, of all the people of Australia, as this parliament is. And uh, similarly, the farmers are, are uh, democratically elect the National Farmers Federation, and it's representative democratically of farmers. But again, it's not broadly representative of all the people of Australia. So, if one really is concerned about democratic representation, the appropriate uh, uh, um, institution to review this convention and conventions in general is clearly the parliament. Now, of course, uh, when you look at the House of Representatives, you find that that is a, a very unrepresentative uh, organisation in which the government has the numbers, and simply bringing it before the, uh, the House of Representatives would result in the, uh, in the government guillotining through uh, the, uh, the terms of the convention without any further, uh, further consideration. It is this House, it is this house where um, no party has the numbers to, uh, to uh, do that that you get the proper consideration of, uh, of bills, of legislation and of conventions. Now, essentially what Senator Cook was arguing was that it is dangerous, it is dangerous to bring this, uh, this matter, these matters before the Senate because the Senate might in fact uh, water down the, uh, the, the requirement. In fact, and, and I think he conceded that uh, the Democrats and the Greens would actually be seeking a strengthening of, uh, of measures dealing with desertification. Our collective wisdom may in fact improve, improve the, uh, the terms of, uh, of management of desertification in Australia. And uh, a horror of horrors, wouldn't that be terrible if in fact we improved the way in which we uh, managed our environment with respect to this very, very important uh, matter? Senator Cook then went on to say, yes, but uh, we have 112 uh, nations all dealing with, uh, with this matter, and uh, 112 nations will come up with different, uh, different results. Now, how inconsistent of this government that has simply handed away its powers in relation to the environment by way of an intergovernmental agreement. It has handed to, uh, to arguments among nine governments the ability to undermine proper environmental uh, concern, the setting of proper standards for water, for air, uh, for uh, chemical exposure, for a whole range of environmental uh, issues under this uh, intergovernmental agreement, and then come in here and say that uh, in relation to, the, um, to this international convention, it is not appropriate for this parliament to have a, uh, have a voice, when the government really doesn't have a logical leg to stand on with respect to that. If this government wants to unilaterally go into uh, these international conventions and sign them, then of course it should take up the powers which it undoubtedly has under the Constitution, which are probably clearer, clearer with respect to environmental protection than uh, in relation to uh, international agreements, and it should uh, appropriately legislate. But it doesn't do that. So in fact, it wants, it wants two bob each way. It wants to uh, argue one way with respect to international agreements and argue uh, in quite a different direction when it comes to uh, Australia's environmental protection under the so-called intergovernmental inter agreement. The, uh, this motion does, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, do what uh, we believe is appropriate. It brings before the parliament the, uh, the terms of the uh, desertification convention as they will impact on Australia and as they will impact on desertification elsewhere in the world. And it specifically mentions that because as, as world citizens, and I was pleased to hear Senator Cook at least pick up that part, we have a responsibility. And primarily this convention is to do with uh, those other countries to which uh, Australia will give, uh, will give aid. Now, of course, the um, uh, when you look at the, uh, the 112 nations uh, who came together, those 112 nations were essentially represented by uh, bureaucracies. They were not represented by the uh, elected representatives of the, uh, of the people. And that is the way these international conventions inevitably, inevitably must be initially formulated. And one can have no argument with that. It would be quite impossible to do it otherwise. But it is appropriate. It is appropriate that these international treaties and conventions come back before the parliament, because I believe, contrary to what uh, was, was being said, that uh, one would necessarily lead, uh, this would necessarily lead to a weakening of these conventions and treaties. It may indeed 
uh, lead to a strengthening of them, in which the, uh, the treaty undertakings um, become the, um, the minimum requirement on countries, and each country then can, uh, can uh, legislate and uh, move to uh, impose uh, uh, stronger protective measures in relation to, in this case, uh, desertification in the environment. So again, I would, I would strongly uh, enjoin the, uh, the opposition in particular to, uh, to support this motion because it does pick up the, uh, the point on which Senator O'Chee spent most of his time. It does bring back before the parliament the, uh, the essential elements that were of concern to you, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, but it does—and you're quite correct in your, um, in your comments on this—it does lay emphasis on those environmental aspects of desertification, and I would have to disagree uh, with you totally in respect to your argument that desertification uh, does, not, uh, does not exist. And I believe that the, uh, the several scientists whom you, uh, you quoted initially uh, were right out of, uh, out of step with many of the other um, uh, scientists who have uh, commented very extensively on this issue. Therefore, I, I um, strongly uh, commend this, uh, this motion to the Senate. Question, question is the motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the no's have it. No. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
time. Lock the doors. The question, the question is Senator Coulter's motion to refer a matter to a committee. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I, do, I appoint uh, Senator Bourne, teller for the ayes, and Senator Panizza, teller for the noes. There being eight ayes and 40 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Would <laughs> Could honourable senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber? Minister. Senator Chapman. To have been misrepresented. Claim to be misrepresented. Yes. Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. In his uh, remarks closing the debate on, on the proposed reference to the committee a few moments ago, Senator Coulter claimed that in my moving of a motion for a reference of the Convention on Desertification to an alternative committee a couple of weeks ago, that I had said that uh, there, were, there was no problem of desertification. I simply point out that is not the case. What I did say on that occasion was that the United Nations bureaucracy had overstated uh, the extent of this problem, and indeed reputable scientists disagreed on the extent of the problem with regard to desertification, and also in that context that re reputable scientists disagreed as to the causes of the problem of desertification. I at no stage made any such claim that there were that there were not deserts or that desertification uh, was not a problem that needed some attention in certain countries. But, uh, that, as I said, it has certainly been overstated by certain people and, it, and the nature of the, of the problem is certainly uh, a cause of disagreement. Senator Sharp. I move, I'm, I move the uh, suspension. The, the, the sitting of the Senate be suspended at 2 o'clock. The question is, the motion be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate stands suspended until 2 p.m.
Questions without notice. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, my question is directed to Senator Evans, the Leader of the Government of the Senate. Former Labor Deputy Premier Parker was jailed for taking money from his electorate campaign fund and using it for private purposes. How does that differ from Labor Party officials taking money from the central campaign fund and using it to pay off candidates' gambling debts and to provide holidays for candidates' families? Isn't such a payment a gross breach of trust to party donors who believe their contributions will go to legitimate campaign needs? And wouldn't such conduct demonstrate a seriously deficient sense of public morality on the part of such Labor Party officials? The Leader of the Government and the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, Mr President, for a start, the matters to which Senator Hill is referring obviously have to do with state candidates and state elections and nothing to do with the operation of uh, Commonwealth elections or Commonwealth electoral law, even if the funding in question that is referred to uh, had related to a Commonwealth election. It would not have had to be disclosed under the provisions of the Commonwealth Electoral Act as they stood uh, at the time of um, Premier Burke's administration. It was not until 1992 that the Act was amended to require uh, third parties to disclose gifts made to candidates or parties, which uh, would clearly have uh, brought this sort of situation to light earlier on, had that been the case. The further point to be made about the uh, particular case, however, of uh, Mr Smith is that um, circumstances, as I'm aware of them, or as I've been advised of them, are manifestly uh, very different in the sense that the, uh, the transaction between the party and the candidate was uh, completely uh, open and straightforward, at least as between them. It did involve uh, proper documentation and it did involve um, a very firm commitment for the funds in question being repaid. The basis of the uh, agreement was to ensure that a candidate who was in deep financial trouble didn't have to resign his parliamentary seat. Uh, the money was advanced to him to resolve his pressing financial problem. There was a written agreement that he'd repay the loan at commercial interest plus one per cent when he could, or at the latest upon his retirement and the receipt of his considerable superannuation payout. It was authorised by the appropriate party officers, and the transaction was one under the circumstance. Uh, which, under the circumstances, as I'm advised, uh, which manifestly didn't operate as a disbenefit to either the, uh, the party, uh, nor could it um, have operated uh, as a disbenefit uh, to any donor to the party from which the money was derived, because obviously it was to be repaid and on a commercially appropriate basis. So I don't have to say I don't have to say any of that because it's all to do with state politics and all to do with uh, oh, state no. electoral law and state uh, party administration. But I put the matters on the record because I think it is important to uh, to put the matter in context. Supplementary, Senator um, Hill. Mr President, um, what we're seeking to explore are the, the moral standards of Labor Party officials and where this and where this federal Labor Party government stands in relation to those issues. And it's got nothing to do with Mr Smith because Senator Chris Evans last night told us that Senator Behan's comments didn't relate to Mr Smith. What we're talking about are statements saying that uh, that uh, campaign funds will be used to pay off candidates' gambling debts, not alone, pay off candidates' gambling debts, and for holidays of candidates' families. And what I asked you, Minister, was, isn't if, isn't if money is expended in that way, isn't it a gross Order. breach of trust, a gross breach of trust to the party donors who expected the money to be used for legitimate campaign ends? And wouldn't such conduct demonstrate a seriously deficient sense of public morality? on the part of the Labor Party official Order. concerned. Senator Evans. Well, the Out of Capricornia, can I, uh, can Order. I, on my right. I hope Hansard has been taking down all those interjections because I want them incorporated passing uh, in the record, if that's, uh, if that's possible. Um, it is the case, as Senator McMullen has been saying more noisily than most, that people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. There's a long litany. There is a long litany of matters on the record or well known in political circles to be, uh, to be the case, so far as your side of politics is concerned, involving a whole variety of major corporate donors dealing in ways that I don't think you would be very keen to have exposed to the light of the day, but which I'll be perfectly happy to put on the record if you persist with this uh, approach. I've explained as best I can, to the best of my knowledge, the circumstance of the one particular matter that I am aware of so far as West Australia is concerned. I am not aware of any other transactions that may have occurred. They are entirely speculative, hypothetical, or the subject simply of gossip or rumour. They are not, not things about which I have any hard information at all. 
What I do know about, among other things, is the way in which some people on Minister's your side of politics have conspicuously expired. misused uh, taxpayers' Minister's funds. Minister's time has expired. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. What will be the role of Social Security in the provision of new assistance measures for farmers, farming families affected by severe drought, and how soon can the families expect to this, receive this assistance? The Minister representing the Minister for Social Security, Senator Crowley. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I particularly appreciate getting this question, and it's also very appropriate. It comes from Senator West, whose um, commitment to people in rural Australia is very well known. The, um, under this initiative, Mr. President, families affected by exceptional drought will be eligible for new drought relief payments. The payments will be equivalent to job search allowance, with an automatic flow on to eligibility for family payments. Aus study will also be extended. It means, Mr. President, that a family with two children aged between 13 and 15 uh, will be able to receive about $380 per week. This payment will not be subject to any assets test on the farm. The usual income test for job search allowance and off-farm assets test will apply to ensure that the payment is directed to families in need. There will be no activity test, in the, there will be no activity test on the payment. I'll come to that, Senator. Farmers will not have to put their properties on the market and they will not have to be rejected for commer by commercial sources of finance. The payment will be available to farmers subject to the exceptional circumstances declaration by the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy. And that definition of exceptional circumstances, Senator, will apply uniformly across Australia. The first payment will be made on October 10 and it will be able to be backdated to October 1 this year. The payment will continue for six months after the cessation of this declaration. The payment is part of a comprehensive um, package of assistance measures announced yesterday. It is estimated that farm families will receive a total of about $48 million this financial year and a further $21 million next financial year. If the drought breaks in autumn under the drought relief payment, that should see the payment uh, assessed at about $21 million for next year. But if the drought persists beyond that, then a further $58 million is expected to be spent next financial year. These figures could increase, Mr. President, if there are further exceptional circumstances declarations. The payments will be legislated and will be available for as long as necessary and in any future exceptional droughts. This initiative represents a major commitment by the government and a recognition of the legitimacy of the farm sector's argument that a targeted welfare response is necessary. The response is highly targeted to those in need as a result of severe drought. And I acknowledge, Mr. President, the um, good news was accepted very favourably by a number of the senators opposite who spoke during it last, yesterday in the, yesterday's adjournment, appreciating very much the, um, the package of this payment. And in particular, I think the recognition that payments to families are a critical part of the assistance. This is not just uh, ignoring the plight of the, the people out there. It is recognising very much that payments targeted to those families will have a very significant contribution to assistance during these exceptionally hard times. The package builds Mr. President, on the government's commitments to supporting families, particularly in need and particularly during this International Year of the Family. Senator Olson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is directed to you. Last night, uh, Senator Chris Evans uh, told the Senate that uh, Mr. David Smith was not the person referred to in your evidence at the Parker trial as the recipient of campaign funds for gambling debts. If this is true, who was the candidate that received campaign funds for personal purposes? How many other candidates benefited in a similar manner during your tenure as party secretary? How much money was involved? For what purposes were these funds used? And on what grounds was it decided that these funds could be used for anything other than campaign purposes? Point, point of order, Senator Ray. I mean, it pains me to take the point of order because it's directed directly at you, Mr. Chairman, and you thereby have to rule on it. But whatever uh, duties you performed or activities you had as State Secretary of Western Australia eight or nine years ago have no relevance to question time here whatsoever in your role as President. And that's the only, only questions you can be asked as, as your role of uh, President. Um, I know by raising the point of order it puts you in an awkward position having to, to rule on yourself, but I mean, had anyone else been in the same position, I would have taken the same point of order. Well, on the point of order, Senator Olson. Uh, I, I, I also acknowledge that you have uh, some slight difficulty in adjudicating upon a matter to which you clearly have uh, an acute interest, 
But the fact is that this question relates directly to evidence given by you when you were the holder of very high office. We are not talking about actions of yours in the past. Actions of yours are simply a party functionary. We're talking about actions, very public actions of yours, in giving evidence in a criminal trial. Those actions dire bear directly upon your current conduct and holding of high office. And I ask you in that capacity. Order, Senator McMullen. Speak to the point of order. Point of How order. can the same person stand in this parliament and say Easy. that to comment upon the cu current policy of the opposition is out of order, but to comment on the political party activities of the opposition of the government five years ago is in order? It takes to breathtaking proportions, to breathtaking proportions, the capacity to say two different things with a straight face and pretend you mean them both. Richard can do it. Order. The, uh, the point of order raised by Senator Ray is, of course, correct. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is that the, the questions such as this and the answers that flow from such questions could well be sub judice since several other charges have been levelled against David Parker, the person to whom you refer. But having said that, I, I do welcome this opportunity to put the record straight on what I think has been some terrible misreporting of, uh, of these events. I did agree to give evidence at, uh, at Mr Parker's trial. I gave evidence firstly as a character witness and secondly to comment in general terms on some of the problems faced by political parties in campaign fundraising. I was not asked nor did I comment on any specific matters relating to Mr Parker's trial nor was I aware, except through newspaper reports since that time, of the matters raised in that trial. In my comments on the use of campaign funds, I made two broad points, and these points were consistent with the points that I put to the Royal Commission prior to this. I made the point that the question of ownership of campaign funds has been a vexed and difficult one, since donations are frequently given to individuals rather than to the party, and since the intention of the donor is frequently not known. <laughs> this is a problem. I made the point also, order. I made the point also that this is a problem that's uh, that's experienced worldwide, and I gave some examples of uh, recent problems that they've had in America on this very thing. And as I said, this was consistent with evidence I'd previously given to the Royal Commission. I made the second point that in expending campaign funds, it's recognised that a wide discretion exists. Campaign expenditure sometimes involves judgments about whether certain things which may not appear to be directly related to campaigning are legitimate campaign expenditure. I indicated in relation to this that campaign funds had been expended on tidying up the image of a candidate. I believe that that is justified uh, use of campaign funds. And I indicated also under questioning that I had heard of a candidate who had had a gambling debt met by uh, what I thought was a campaign fund that later proved to be party funds in a, in a properly uh, arranged loan. At no time again did I refer to specific matters relating to Mr Parker's trial. I also made it clear that funds under my direct control while I was State Secretary from 1981 to 1987 were held under very tight control with complete probity and to strict accounting standards. All of those accounts have been examined by the Royal Commission and they have found nothing wrong with any of them. All of the accounts of the party over the period which I was there, I have no reason to believe that that's been any different since that time. And I made the point that uh, the instructions that were given to other funds, such as the Leaders Fund and local funds, were that they should be run on the, with the same standards and that under no circumstances should favours be given in return for donations received. As a result of the Royal Commission, the party's procedures have been tightened up. Order and codes of conduct have been adopted by all states and nationally. And of course, disclosure legislation introduced in this parliament in 1991 now applies to all donations, state and federal. It didn't at that time. I've always been a strong advocate of disclosure, and I've also been an advocate of public funding, which I think is the only answer to this sort of problem long term. I've made a private submission to the Royal Commission to this effect. I did not condone the misuse of some funds that were not under my control during my term of office. I was simply trying, in my evidence, to convey some of the complexities of political fundraising and the expenditure that arises from that. 
supplementary question. Supplementary, Mr. Senator Austin. I, I welcome uh, that uh, additional material that is now before the Senate. Uh, do I understand it from your uh, remarks that when you went beyond giving character evidence for uh, Mr Parker, you were in fact talking about party practices in such a way that you certainly did not dissociate yourself from them or disapprove of them? I therefore ask you, uh, on what basis do you say that uh, it is a vexed question when funds are paid, when funds are paid into a campaign account as Order. opposed to a personal account? When you say the intentions of donors are often not known, what attempts were made during your reign to ascertain the intention of donors before the monies were given? On what basis, on what basis do you now say that uh, the code of conduct has been introduced if it wasn't to improve practices which were clearly inadequate? And did, do I understand you to say? Do I understand? I understand your embarrassment. I understand your sensitivity. Do you now say? Do you now say that you dissociate yourself? From the sort of practices which you were quite happy to elaborate upon at uh, Parker's trial, or do you still take order, the view a, that anything order, in the interest Senator of the Redmond. party is just you, On a point, point of order, order, Mr. President, you're not obliged to expose yourself to this kind of second-rate magistrate's court cross-examination. You, under the standing orders, under the standing orders, you have no obligation whatsoever to respond to questions other than squarely to do with your administration of the presidency of this Senate. You chose to take the opportunity of an earlier question, which was manifestly out of order, to set the record straight. You've done so with dignity and in considerable detail. There's no obligation on you whatsoever to respond further, and I suggest that you do not do so. All I can say is that I've said all that I uh, was going to say in that statement. Um, Senator Childs. Mr President, my question is directed to the Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. I understand that a meeting of the Cairns Group representatives was held this week in Washington to discuss prospective developments in the United States agricultural trade policy. Will the Minister inform the Senate of the outcome of the meeting and any follow-up that is planned? The Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Thank you, Mr President. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to take the Senate back to matters of national interest. And this is profoundly in the interest of the nation and can, has the capacity to make a contribution to, as, and has the capacity Order. to substantially improve the living standards of many people, many of whom the National Party purports to represent, and I'd have thought they'd be interested and not welcome the interjections because they may wish to know. The Cairns Group seminar, uh, there was a seminar of Cairns Group countries held in Washington on Tuesday this week. It was inaugurated during the meeting over which I presided in May and organised by the Australian uh, Embassy in Washington. It was attended by ambassadors from the 14 Cairns Group countries. They came together for two reasons. The first of which, and that which I want to give most emphasis to today, is to continue the pressure for implementation of the agriculture of the uh, Uruguay Round decisions, and secondly, to maintain the pressure for agricultural trade reform, which was initiated by the Uruguay Round. The major preoccupation of the seminar was getting the Uruguay Round ratified and implemented by the U.S. Congress, and I thought we'd all have shared that priority. So. The Cairns Group ambassadors agreed to step up collective pressure on the United States administration and the Congress, because of course the administration is trying to get the legislation through. It's Congress that's causing the difficulty to pass the legislation in time to allow the uh, agreement to enter into force on the 1st of January 1995 and the benefits to start to flow accordingly. This action will serve to reinforce the message which I reported to the Senate earlier. The Washington representatives of the Cairns Group agreed to write a joint letter this week signed by all 14 ambassadors or their representatives to key congressional committee leaders. The message they will deliver is that it's critical, to the launching, uh, it's critical that they pass their legislation so that the World Trade Organization and the agreement it's designed to implement can commence on 1 January 1995. That, it's, that the United States must faithfully honour the commitments it's made and particularly on agriculture in the Uruguay round, and that it would be unacceptable for the United States to turn its export subsidy practices into general market expansion and trade development programs. The Cairns Group participants, of which Australia is one, are concerned that such proposals have been put forward in the context of the draft Uruguay round legislation. In addition to that letter, the ambassadors have agreed to follow up by seeking appointments to ram home the message to key congressional leaders. 
I will be taking the opportunity to reinforce that message to the Director General of the GATT, Peter Sutherland, when he visits Australia next week. The other important issue before the seminar, and it's more of a medium term issue but on the same matter and very important, is the early stage development of the 1995 US Farm Bill. The manner in which this bill evolves will be critical to all the Cairns Group participants and in Australia, critical to, United, to Australian agricultural trade to the United States and as a model for what might happen in other important markets. It's of direct relevance to Australian agricultural exporters, particularly sugar, dairy and beef. It's also significant in terms of its impact on the international agricultural market and export prices. It's important to note that in drafting the Farm Bill, the US will be bound by the undertakings it made in the Uruguay Round to reduce agricultural protection. So there's a plus for us, but we must watch the way in which these decisions are implemented. In recognition of the longer-term significance of the 1990 Farm Bill for Australian agricultural exporters, Senator Collins and I have set up with the uh, farm leaders uh, a Farm Bill working group to coordinate Australia's activity, government and industry groups to maximise our chances of getting a decent Farm Bill outcome in the United States. We'll be meeting again in November to assess the prospects for the bill, consider the debate Minister's and look at how we can maximise our impact on this important piece of legislation. Senator Lees. Questions for Senator Collins, Minister for Primary Industry. And Minister, we welcome the extensive range of assistance measures announced yesterday for farmers in Queensland and New South Wales that are suffering from exceptional circumstances due to four years of drought. However, Minister, there are farmers in many other parts of Australia, particularly South Australia and Victoria, also suffering from ex exceptional circumstances, not only caused by lack of rain, but by years of uh, other calamities such as mouse plagues, um, frosts, rain during harvest. During harvest. If you add to that uh, low commodity prices as well as high interest rates, Minister, I ask you, Will there be any additional assistance for farmers in other parts of Australia suffering from exceptional circumstances who have little or no income, and for South Australia in particular, as we watch pasture and crops dying, see dams empty, and indeed tens of thousands of sheep being trucked off properties in the West just this week? How long will these farmers have to wait for assistance? Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, I would hope, and I think most of the major farm organisations would hope they would never qualify for this assistance. And, uh, I, I hope that that doesn't happen. I've actually seen expressions used such as select group, uh, which I was extremely disappointed to see, I must say. I mean, this select group are in this select group uh, because they have, as you've said, uh, Senator Lewis, quite correctly, uh, been droughted now for four years on the trot. Um, and, and I'm not talking about well, the, significant, that's, the significance is these are not marginal lands I'm talking about. These are areas that for years have been and renowned as Australia's most arable lands, the Darling Downs of, uh, of Queensland, where farmers uh, have now suffered their eighth or ninth successive crop loss. They have had no income at all for four years. And as Senator Crowley said correctly, the criteria for this package apply nationally. And uh, I hope there wouldn't be too many more joining. And I'm sure that the, the members now of this group would be happy to opt out of it tomorrow. Exactly right. As I said, uh, I'm sure there's not a farmer in Australia that wouldn't uh, uh, exchange every dollar of what has to be um, inadequate uh, government support, even if you put a billion dollars it would be inadequate. What they actually want are some good seasons and some, and some decent rain. But the criteria do, do apply across Australia nationally, and that's one of the most significant parts of the package announced yesterday. Uh, the whole point uh, is, and as I said this yesterday, that if the drought does not break, as it's predicted by February or March next year, which could then involve other areas of Australia, uh, the fact is, at that stage, the whole country is going to be in diabolical trouble. It will then be a major domestic crisis, should it go past next autumn uh, with, uh, without any rain. We're, we're all hopeful that the Met Bureau will be proved to be correct, as long as, away as that is, and, and rain will come. But uh, there's a meeting tomorrow of primary industry ministers that I've uh, uh, convened. I had a meeting several weeks ago with the South Australian Minister, Dale Baker, uh, who approached me to ask if the Commonwealth uh, would uh, give consideration to the Rural Adjustment Scheme on a regional basis, and I told him that uh, not only would we, uh, but it was very much in accord uh, with my own thinking uh, that uh, I was keen to in fact regionalise as many of the Commonwealth's programs uh, across the board as possible. 
We've actually demonstrated that in a very tangible way uh, just in the short time that I've been in this uh, portfolio with a $9 million package for restructuring that we put into South West Queensland and, I might add, a similar package we offered to New South Wales uh, because the problem, of course, goes across that artificial border in the Western Division of New South Wales where restructuring is needed. Now, the reason I raise that, Mr President, is this. There are extensive areas of Australia where, the, where one of the fundamental problems that is exacerbated by drought is major restructuring is required. Decisions were taken decades ago, generations ago, by previous governments about the particular viability of certain blocks which we know were wrong. And, uh, sadly, there are a number of farmers around Australia who will never be viable, never be viable if they have 20 good seasons. But uh, I can assure you, uh, uh, Mr President, uh, through you, uh, Senator Lewis, uh, that, uh, that if farmers in South Australia should, be cut, should end up in the same unhappy state as the, as the farmers uh, are in northern New South Wales and Queensland that have suffered extensive years of drought, then under this package, the criteria of which are uniform across the country, they will receive assistance. Senator Denman. Sorry, <coughs> supplementary, Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, are you saying that because the farmers in South Australia have had no income for three years for other reasons, that you don't consider that they are therefore suffering from exceptional circumstances? Just to give you some examples, in the Wooden area now, it's been three years since there has been a profitable crop harvested. They trucked 26,000 sheep out of there on Tuesday alone. Just at the time wool prices are increasing, they are having to get rid of the sheep, the very things that may have indeed saved them on those properties. Is this area one of those that you are suggesting that uh, farmers should be phased out of? And if, they, if you are saying that some of these areas should, should have farming uh, phased out, then perhaps we should tell the farmers about that. What specific plans have you got to assist these farmers in South Australia, most of whom have used up their RAS entitlements totally? The Minister, Senator Collins. I don't think there are too many farmers around Australia that would argue with the central thrust of this proposal, which is to give this substantial package of assistance to the worst hit farmers. And it is a drought package. And Senator Lees, I'll happily acknowledge right here that we are not in a position, nor will we ever be, to offer compensation for the myriad problems that a primary producer faces, the ones you've mentioned, mice plagues, frost, too much rain, all these other things. We can't. That's why. That's why this has been identified as a drought package. I'd conclude by saying, and I'm delighted to have this piece of information, that today Premier Goss of Queensland has publicly committed the Queensland Government to match $20 million so that the funding uh, that we have provided in the Exceptional Circumstances grants will be matched by the Queensland Government. You'll be pleased to hear this, Senator Boswell, dollar for dollar to allow farmers in that state to get 100 per cent interest subsidies when they need them. Senator Denman. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Cook. I draw the Senator's attention to the fact that the Federal Government's campaign to attract corporate regional headquarters to Australia has been recognised by an international award this week and, might I add, accepted by our Ambassador to the Netherlands, Michael Tate. Given the emphasis placed by the government on the regional headquarters program in the May White Paper and the significant economic and cultural benefits that the regional headquarters can bring to this country, can the minister inform the Senate of the nature of the award and the stimulus that the award might bring to the regional headquarters campaign? The Minister for Industry, Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, it's indeed a very great honour for Australia that uh, this week the Australian Government received an award, the Best Campaign Award for Excellence in 1994. Mr President, the award gives international recognition to the Government's campaign to attract regional headquarters to Australia. The Ambassador, as the question indicated, our Ambassador to The Hague, former Senator, the Hon. Michael Tate, did the honours in accepting this award at the Grand Hotel um, Amsterdam on Tuesday evening for Australia. The award, the Best Campaign Award for Excellence 1994, was made at the fifth annual meeting of the investment promotion agencies by Corporate Location, the international investment advisory arm of the Euro Money publication. It is an award for the best campaign mounted, and our campaign, the one that attracted the award, was, of course, uh, for regional headquarters. 
It's, uh, it's Order, worthwhile Senator remarking, Kemp and Senator President, Schott, if you want to have that conversation, would you go outside? It's worthwhile remarking, Mr uh, President, when my colleagues will settle down if they will, that, uh, that, that, while, that while the campaign attracted the award, the product that the campaign was selling is the Australian economy and the opportunity for foreign companies to set up regional headquarters in Australia. So the, uh, the person who ought to take a bow here is the Australian economy rather than the actual campaign to sell it. From, the, uh, from my department's side, can I congratulate all of those in my department that have worked on this campaign. They've worked together with Austrade, they've worked together with the state and territory governments on a very targeted campaign to attract strategic uh, investment to Australia. There are now over 650 potential uh, international targets that have been identified as, as companies that might establish regional headquarters in Australia. These companies are being systematically approached and introduced to Australia as an excellent business uh, location for them. I uh, should also say that uh, the efforts of the government sector have been strongly supported by the private sector on this issue. The Regional Headquarters Leaders Network is a group of some 20 key chief executives supported by the Australian Coalition of Service Industries. and They have worked closely with us in a public-private sector push to, uh, to join forces, represent Australia and succeed at winning a number of major companies to locate here. Over recent uh, months, the numbers of uh, companies deciding to locate their regional headquarters in Australia have increased. Let me just name a number that have uh, made the choice. Cathay Pacific is one. Uh, two major uh, computer companies, Lexmark and Data General, the uh, French international hotel chain Accor, Novell, IBM, two other uh, computer companies, Edelman's, a public relations company, a manufacturing company, uh, Heller, manufacturers of, of uh, headlights, the Campbell Soup Company, Guangzhou Television and Oracle Computer. In fact, 23 multinational companies have established regional headquarters in Australia in the last 12 months. The best estimate is that regional headquarters have generated about $500 million in investment and around about 1,000 jobs, as well as bringing major investment in information technology in particular to this country. Senator Boswell. President, my question is to Senator Collins. The issue of easing eligibility criteria for the Rural Adjustment Scheme for those without off-farm assets was not addressed by yesterday's drought statement. It is a major problem stopping many farmers from getting essential assistance to see them through the drought and beyond. Will the minister give a guarantee that the issue of eligibility will be uh, sorted out in the, uh, in the next uh, week or so? Uh, you seem to not understand the question. You don't understand the question. The Maybe I could repeat. The, the Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, have you finished your question? Well, uh, the, the, the question of drought eligibility under RAS is very hard to access because of criteria. Are you going to uh, lower the criteria bar? Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. Mr President, uh, a couple of significant uh, uh, policy changes that were made uh, in, uh, in yesterday's drought package involved um, providing significant additional resources into RAS in order to get more farmers into it. Now, I think that's the bottom line of Senator Boswell's. Yeah, well, that's how you get them in, Senator Boswell, by the eligibility uh, criteria. And in exceptional circumstances, uh, that is going to be uh, done. And uh, I might add, uh, Mr. President, uh, for Senator Boswell's benefit. But one of the problems that we have identified over the last uh, uh, six months in the scheme, one of the major problems in terms of, of access, is that there are not enough of there are about 12,000, uh, rough 10 to 12,000 farmers out of the total of 125,000 in Australia that are in this serious situation. That um, there are certainly um, farmers in that group uh, who uh, will need access to. Uh, uh, to the rural adjustment assistance, uh, who will now get it? And among the other uh, identified problems is that were raised with us was restriction in the actual limits on the amount that could be borrowed. The people, in fact, had borrowed to the limit, were still able, because of the, the very valuable nature of the basic asset, to borrow more 
but couldn't do it because of, uh, of the restriction on well, the existing restriction on the caps. And also, a major problem was that people who should have been getting 100 per cent subsidy, in other words, an interest-free loan, weren't getting it. And one of the reasons for that, frankly, Senator Boswell, is because the way the scheme works is that we fund the lion's share of it up to 50 per cent. 90 per cent is provided by the Commonwealth, and over 50 per cent, they have to, not unreasonably, the states have to match us dollar for dollar. And there has been some reluctance, and that's why I read out the statement from Premier Goss that I was delighted to see. There has been some reluctance. Well, I'll tell you, a couple of years ago when this happened, the facts were, and I, and I don't want to be any politicking on this because that's not how I handle it, but the facts were, a couple of years ago when this happened, Queensland agreed to match us dollar for dollar, and it was very aggravating for those farmers in, in northern New South Wales when farmers on that side of the border were getting 100 per cent interest subsidies, and they weren't. We were putting our share in, but the New South Wales government refused to match us dollar for dollar. Plenty of rhetoric, but no action. Now I hope that will change tomorrow uh, at this meeting. And I am delighted, Senator Boswell, to see a public commit commitment today from the Premier of Queensland, because they have been doing it, and he's made the point in his press release that his state is the only state that's doing it. We'll put an additional $20 million uh, into uh, this uh, desperate problem and help the Queensland farmers get that 100 per cent subsidy. So the caps have been raised on RAS to allow people to borrow more. More money has been put into exceptional circumstances, Senator Boswell, to make it now a demand-driven system rather than a cash-limited system, a major breakthrough. I'd simply conclude uh, by saying, Mr President, that these are substantial policy changes. They'll actually require, I think it's something like seven acts of parliament to be amended here in this Senate, and I look forward to have them, having them given speedy passage Senator Boswell, I hope this is not another Marbo debate or gaze in Tasmania or, uh, or land fund debate in here, because if it is, I have got no doubt you will be beaten to death by farmers in both uh, northern New South Wales and Queensland. I'll make my contribution to this by not speaking for more than five minutes on each bill, and perhaps you'll absolutely cross my heart and hope to die, and perhaps we could give these bills put the clock on me and perhaps we could give these bills, Senator Boswell, speedy assistance, speedy the sooner you get, the better. I, I, uh, I, I, Mr President, look forward to seeing these amendments pass speedily through the Senate so that this desperately needed assistance for the farmers in Queensland and New South Wales can be delivered. And a fat lot of good you've been, Senator Macdonald, Order. because you haven't made a single representation to me Minister, on behalf of drought-affected farmers in the North Minister's, Queensland. Minister's Not time has one. expired. Order. Supplementary, Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I can give the minister. Order. The, uh, we minister can't hear the... Senator Boswell. It's important. I think I Senator can give Boswell. the minister a guarantee that, and an assurance that the bills won't be held up unduly. My. Uh, <laughs> My, uh, my, my supplementary question is, in your answer you indicated that the criteria situation would be addressed, you, uh, but you weren't specific and, and to tell the Senate when. When are you going to address this? The Minister, Senator Collins. He said it about 500 times on the public record uh, over the last three or four weeks. We're doing it now, and I can assure you, uh, Senator Boswell, that uh, we will uh, uh, give it uh, expeditious treatment. And could I once again, Senator Boswell, as I've done before, commend you on your assiduous efforts on behalf of the farmers of North Queensland? And of course you need to be particularly, particularly active, considering that some of your other colleagues from North Queensland, like Senator Macdonald, have been totally silent on the issue. Senator Shamaret. Mr President, my question is directed to the Minister representing the Attorney General, and I ask one, has the Attorney General received over the last 12 months repeated suggestions from the Australian Law Reform Commission that the Minister refer gay and lesbian law reform to the Commission for inquiry? Two, why has the Attorney General not referred the matter of gay and lesbian law reform to the Commission for inquiry despite strong support from gay and lesbian groups around Australia? And three, does the Attorney General intend to make such a referral? And if not, why not? <coughs> the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Evans. Mr. President, I'm informed that the Attorney General has received a submission from the new head of the Law Reform Commission, Alan Rose, outlining a number of inquiries which the Law Reform Commission may wish to undertake over the next year. The Law Reform Commission has nominated 16 topics for potential inquiries covering the whole range of human rights, social justice, business, and public law. 
protection of individual rights, which would, of course, encompass the rights of all Australians, regardless of sexual preference, is indeed one of the topics under consideration. I understand the Attorney General has yet to have discussions with Mr Rose to finalise the program, but I'll bring, his, I'll bring your question uh, to his attention so that he knows of your interest uh, in the matter. I'm certainly glad, Mr President, that the Greens do clearly understand the nature of the issues of principle involved in gay and lesbian law reform, and in particular that they so obviously share the government's view and the view of the overwhelming majority of Australians that governments have no business whatever in anyone's bedroom and that uh, sexual practices between consenting adults are entirely and should remain entirely their own business. And in that respect, of course, there's a conspicuous contrast to be drawn between that, uh, your position and our position and that of that once great party and once great coalition opposite who manifestly uh, fails to understand the basic issues that are here involved and which is presently divided between that large slice of them who regard uh, the issues involved in the current uh, government legislation, for example, as all about sodomy and other ways of encouraging godlessness. There's another group who uh, argue that it's all about states' rights. You've got another small group of crazed eccentrics like Wilson Tucky who say it's about genital mutilation. And there's only a tiny point handful order. that understand that it's about— Point of order. Point, point, point of order. On a point of I think order, Senator, uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate made a serious reflection on a member of the other House and he shall withdraw it. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying close attention. And if uh, I, I would ask you to withdraw, if you withdraw the reference to Wilson Tucky as a crazed eccentric, if that uh, is a problem for Senator Panizzi. He's not an eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> the shadow right. cabinet this morning may have uh, purported to do something about patching up their differences on this particular matter, but I understand the issue is still a live one uh, right now in the uh, in the party room. And I'm sure it will be the case that, like a, a worm cut into two or three or four or more different pieces, we're going to see oh, no. the different bits going on writhing oh, no. in Senator public Kemp. on this issue as Senator on so Kemp. many others over the period ahead. And it's a very tragic thing to see this once great party sacrificing and throwing away any shred of decency in its fundamental principles in this respect. Supplementary, Senator Chamaret. I think it wouldn't have escaped the notice of the opposition that the minister didn't actually answer my question and took the opportunity to make a few cracks. And I'd like to repeat the question, which is what priority does the Attorney General place on the uh, Law Reform Commission's request for a referral and when is it likely to be given that priority? The minister, Senator Evans, I would ask you way of responding to the giving you such a nice little rap. But the uh, Attorney General is a deeply caring and sensitive and compassionate soul, as we're all aware, who does understand the nature of the issues that are involved uh, in gay and lesbian law reform, as you so obviously do yourself, uh, Senator Shamret. And I'm sure you'll take uh, very seriously uh, into account in discussing with uh, Mr. Rose the priority areas of reference for the Law Reform Commission, just that particular area. But I can't preempt his judgment on that. He hasn't yet had an opportunity to discuss the matter in detail with Mr. Rose. Senator McGibbon. This is to Senator Evans, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I just ask you, Minister, how much longer are you going to tolerate that grossly insulting sign outside the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Sir, I'm not, I'm not aware of the particular sign to which you're referring. You're, you're referring to the Timor Embassy thing across the road. Well, I'm not sure of the particular sign to which Senator McGibbon is referring. In any event, these matters are essentially ones for the ACT uh, administration rather than the federal government. There is a capacity uh, for the government to act, as we have done in the past, uh, in relation to uh, certain things that constitute uh, I've forgotten the precise language of the, uh, the statute, but an interference in effect with the, uh, with the effective capacity to operate in term of the mission in terms of our responsibilities under the Vienna Convention. I'm not sure of the particular thing to which you're referring, but I don't think it's the case that there would be a foundation uh, on which we could act in this respect at the moment. Senator Carter, supplementary, Senator McGivern. If so, I'm, I'm, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that the uh, the minister doesn't know what's outside the Indonesian embassy, but for a party that proclaims that it's doing something to promote Australian-Indonesian relations, to tolerate a huge multicoloured sign that's been there for a long while in front of a friendly nation is absolutely intolerable. It's, uh, I'd like you to instance how many other embassies that Australia has around the world are subject to similar treatment. Name me the countries and tell me the number of Australian embassies that are similarly outraged. The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, while it is the case that we take the view that uh, protests 
should remain, of course, within the bounds of the law and should also remain within the bounds of decent respect for property, for national symbols and for differing cultures and countries with whom we might have differing points of view. It is the case that we do continue to acknowledge the right of peaceful demonstration as a very valued and indeed centrally core part of our system of democracy and freedom of expression. And I'm constantly in the position of having to uh, uh, live with uh, what might desirably uh, be situations that uh, didn't exist in terms of uh, dealing with countries uh, and issues of this sensitive kind. Uh, but over and over again, I simply have to make the point that in the kind of uh, democracy we are, that's part of the deal, uh, to tolerate that diversity, to tolerate uh, that, uh, that freedom of expression. And I think that's pretty well understood by the countries in question. I'm sure it's well understood by the Indonesian government. Senator Carr. Mr President, my question without notice is to the minister representing the Minister for Schools. That's to Senator Schott. It concerns Commonwealth education programs in Victoria. Is the minister aware of media reports based upon a leaked state government briefing paper that the Victorian Education Department is a, is a budget blowout of $143 million? Is the minister aware that the state government has already cut edu the education budget in by $78 million this year, which follows extremely large cuts over the last two years? Can the minister assure the Senate? that the Commonwealth education programs in Victoria will not be undermined by further cuts by the state government to Victorian schools, education programs, staff or facilities. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, Senator Sharp. Yes, yes, Mr President. Uh, Senator Carr being a concerned Senator from Order. Victoria, uh, uh, raising this question is, is obvious. There have, and I am aware, uh, Mr President, that there have been reports uh, about uh, the Kennett government in Victoria's cutbacks in, in education. Apparently the reports canvass possible further redundancies of up to 1,000 teachers, the apparently unknown effects on schooling of cuts already made and the use of statewide testing for public comparison between schools. Throughout this turmoil, Mr President, that's the, Vic the Victorian education system uh, has closed over 200 uh, schools reduced teacher numbers by 8,000. Point, point of order. Despite this, Senate, Mr. President, point of, point the order, Senator Kemp. Mr. President, uh, Senator Evans, in an earlier point of order, uh, pointed out that uh, answers should only be given to questions which relate to the responsibility of the respective minister. Uh, I ask you to uh, uh, find out what, what possible responsibility does Senator Schott and if her colleagues have for education in Victoria and I ask you to enforce the standing order. I, to enforce the standing order that Sen Senator Evans brought to your attention earlier today. Order. I, on the point of order, Senator Ray. Uh, so I don't think Senator Kemp heard. Senator Carr asked a general question about schools, but then went on to ask, in terms of Commonwealth funding, which is very substantial in the Victorian or any other state education system, how that would be affected. So, Mr. President, the question was entirely within order. The qu Point of order. 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 Senator Kemp raised the, before you. On the point of order. On the point of order. Yes, on, on the point of order. That if the issue, as you say, Senator Ray, is um, the issue of, of uh, funding from uh, the Commonwealth government, we haven't had one word of that from Senator Shot. Not not one word of that. So uh, if, if the issue, if Senator Ray is right, the issue is Commonwealth funding. Let's let's get the answer to that question. Order, Senator. You, on the point of order, Senator. Just as Shot. Senator Kemp was starting to get excited and jump up and down, I was then starting to refer to the Commonwealth funding for Victoria. And I, and I was going to then go on and explain, as Order. I will, the Commonwealth yeah. funding of, for education in Victoria. Order. The, the question was in order and so was the answer. Senator Schott. Ah. Thank, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr President. As I was about to say before Senator Kemp jumped up uh, with his, well, with his unnecessary or well, jumped up Senator Kemp uh, <laughs> with his unnecessary uh, uh, point of order. The, the, Commonwealth government, the, Com the Commonwealth Government in Victoria, uh, has, in this present year, has provided $296 million, has provided $296 million to make, which is the maintenance of funding in real terms. This contrasts with the Victorian Government making a cut of $78 million in real terms in 1994-95. 
We have maintained our funding to schools in Victoria. The Victorian government has cut it by $78 million. And of course we acknowledge Mr. President, that we are not about how to tell state governments to run their school systems. But there are two points about the policy and practice which I think should be made. Firstly, the policy, the, this highlights the critical need for all systems to develop adequate methods of reporting the outcomes of schooling. Most states are investing considerable time and money working towards ways of assessing, assessing and reporting learning and management outcomes. Apparently, Mr Hayward, the Victorian Education Minister, believes this type of approach is, and I quote, a lot of rubbish. Debate about education should be about the quality of outcomes, not about the input of resources alone. For the sake of their students, I hope the Victorian Government will come to terms with this and will follow the, other ex the example of other states in this matter. Secondly, it is quite clear that the outcome reporting should not be reliant on simple basic skill testing. What children are able to achieve as a result of their schooling is dependent upon the interaction of parents, the principals in schools, the teachers the, and the resources and the students themselves. To reduce the outcomes of schooling to a pen and paper test undermines the quality of our schools. Using a year's basic skill test to generate invidious comparisons between schools is really an attack on the whole process. Well, of course you will want to, of course you, of course you coming from an elite school system, the, Geelong, the representative oh, no, of Geelong Grammar. Well, Mr. President, a Scotch college, down a spag oh, no. over here from Scotch College. Uh, order. Point of this order. is down a spag from the private. Order. Order. The point of order, Senator. I ask, you asked Mr. Senator Schott to withdraw that uh, comment on Senator uh, Kemp. Well, I, I didn't see anything unparliamentary in it, I must say, unless there's something I missed. Did, Mr. Well, Mr. President, withdraw the comment in the interests of Senate Harmony, will you please? Well, in, in the interest of Senate Harmony, but I must say the term "fag" is well known mm. as a system in the in the private school system of this country and in Great Britain, of which this pe these people opposite represent. No. In, the, in your, uh, in, in deference to your request, Mr. President, I certainly withdraw it. So we have we have the op the, the opposition wanting. Uh, here, supporting Mr Kennett, wanting to reduce the outcomes of schools, as I say, to a pen and paper test. And uh, we will not, in this side of politics, take such a simple, simplistic approach to education policy as you lot opposite support Mr Kennett going about in Victoria, reducing the quality of education for ordinary students, not the ones you represent going to the private school system. Senator Chi. Mr President, my question is addressed to Senator Evans, representing the Prime Minister. It relates to visits by the Prime Minister of Ireland, Mr Reynolds, and the Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr Goh. And in asking the question, I'd like it noted that I was a former member of the executive of the Australia Island Parliamentary Group. Why is it, though, that when Mr Reynolds visit, visited Canberra, the government chose to honour him with an official dinner in the Great Hall of Parliament? Yet when Mr Goh visited, he was merely hosted to a private dinner at the Lodge. Given that I am advised that the Prime Minister's Department made all of the arrangements for Mr Goh's visit, and they were presumably approved by the Prime Minister, can you provide an explanation of the differing treatment provided to these two international leaders? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Represented them. Well, the only reason I'm aware why there wasn't a full-scale Great Hall dinner for um, President Goh was there was a non-parliamentary sitting week. It was the only week in which he could be here, and the government, I think, uh, rather responsibly took the view uh, that it would be inappropriate to spend the enormous amount of taxpayers' money in use, sending the usual invitations to members of parliament and others to come from all around the country. And it has often been the practice when distinguished visitors have been here, otherwise than during uh, parliamentary sitting weeks, uh, that other forms of hospitality have been offered. But I might uh, set the record straight for uh, Senator O'Chi. It wasn't only a dinner at the lodge that was offered for uh, Prime Minister Go. Uh, there was, in fact, a, a dinner in, or a lunch in Parliament House, attended by a number of ministers and a number of other uh, distinguished guests for some 80 or 90 people, uh, which was appropriately uh, targeted uh, for the nature of the occasion and the nature of the visitor uh, in, a in a circumstance where um, the Parliament was not sitting. Moreover, your own leader, your own leader, Mr Fisher, 
seconded the Prime Minister's speech of welcome to Mr Goh and, in a speech of great dignity and great uh, charm, uh, responded in a way that was absolutely appropriate for the occasion. He showed a lot more charm and a lot more dignity and a lot more sense and a lot better information than you've demonstrated on this occasion. Supplement. Supplement. Order. Well, well, if you read later, there would like Senator to keep Chief. quiet, you might actually find out that I knew about the lunch as well and wasn't intending to raise him at it to save you a little bit of embarrassment. But is the minister aware Order on my right. Is the minister aware that there is a need for a certain sensitivity because when quite apparently different treatment is offered to two ministers within the space of a couple of weeks, it reduces all of the Prime Minister's rhetoric about becoming closer and more attuned to Asia to just so much puff. And that is the concern that I've got. And I believe the government could have handled it much better. And there was not even an invitation delivered to most members of parliament. And that is a matter of concern. And if this government wishes to treat a leader like Mr Gove with a little bit of right. respect, at Senator least that Ray. could have been done. Minister, Senator Evans. There's only one thing that could possibly embarrass Prime Minister Go arising out of his visit to Australia, and that's the contribution that you have just made in this particular parliament. Go Chok Tong is a man of the utmost distinction, the utmost character, and someone with whom the Prime Minister of Australia has a very close relationship indeed, both in policy terms and in personal terms. He is someone who has been a very, very strong uh, supporter and acted jointly with us in the initiatives for trade liberalisation and regional security and otherwise that we've been mounting around the region. I, there are some relationships as close as our relationship with Singapore and our personal relationship uh, at the prime ministerial level with Mr Go Chok Tong, uh, but there is no leader or no relationship in the region that I think is more close. And for you to make that kind of point in that kind of cheap, grandstanding way is not only to totally misunderstand the nature of that particular relationship, it's to demonstrate that you just don't have the character to sit in this place. Senator, Senator Spindler. Thank order, you, Mr President. Order. There's a point of order, Senator O'Chief. I want that comment withdrawn, Mr President. That is thoroughly and utterly reprehensible and despicable. Order. And it shows, it shows, it shows, it shows the contempt that Senator Evans order. has for the proper parliamentary process. I think you should withdraw, Senator Evans. It's a reflection on the senator. Well, it's certainly a reflection. It was a very deliberate one, but in deference to you, I withdraw it. I'd, I'd, I did ask you to withdraw, and that's an unconditional withdrawal. Well, it was unconditional, but I've repeated. Thank you. I withdraw it unconditional. Thank you, Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Sport and Territory, Senator Faulkner. I refer to reports that clear fell logging and wood chipping are imminent in the high conservation value Hensley Creek catchment in East Gippsland, which contains old growth forest, is listed on the register of the national estate and is a state site of rainforest significance. I ask the Minister. Order! Senator Spindler is asking a serious question. It demands serious attention. Senator Spindler. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the Minister provide urgent interim protection for Hensley Creek catchment in order to conserve the area for inclusion in the National Reserve System, and when will, we, will he do so? And secondly, given the recent Victorian Government report exposing the extent of breaches by the timber industry of the Victorian Code of Forest Practices, is the Minister prepared to establish a Commonwealth monitoring function to ensure <laughs> compliance with state codes and Commonwealth Woodchip Licence conditions. <coughs> the Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I have, um, I have received a letter which has been co-signed by a number of Victorian voluntary conservation organisations expressing uh, concern about the planned commencement Excuse of logging uh, operations in the, the Hensley uh, Creek catchment in East Gippsland. The conservation uh, organisations have sent me uh, further information on the conservation values of the area, and this, is only, this has only just been brought to uh, my attention this morning. My portfolio has not had the opportunity yet uh, to uh, evaluate this uh, additional information, uh, Senator. The cons conservation organisations have been uh, invited uh, to provide uh, my department with uh, substantiated information on areas considered to have high conservation values. Mr President, I am committed to implementing the National uh, Forest Policy Statement 
and I will be advising the Minister for Resources on areas uh, likely, to be, likely to be of high conservation uh, value, which uh, should be avoided prior to the issuing of any uh, export wood chip licences uh, for next year. In line with the National Forest Policy uh, Statement, uh, an assessment of uh, old growth forest has been completed for the East Gippsland forests. In addition, the Australian Heritage uh, Commission is currently uh, finalising a uh, study of national estate values for forests in that area. Uh, these two studies put my portfolio I think, in a good position uh, to assess the information supplied by the conservation organisations. In the interim, I have uh, referred the uh, letter I mentioned to the Minister for Resources for further investigation. My department will, uh, will uh, follow up the uh, new information with the Department of Primary Industries and Energy. And once more, information has been uh, provided uh, to me by my department and the AHC. I'll consider what further action might need to be taken in consultation with my colleague, the Minister for Resources, Mr Bettle. Uh, can I say that uh, since becoming the Minister for the Environment, uh, Senator, uh, one of my priorities has been to address the implementation of the National uh, Forest Policy Statement. It's certainly been reflected in the nature of the advice I gave to the Minister for Resources over the, uh, uh, the uh, sawmillers uh, export uh, proprietary limit, better known as CEPL uh, export uh, licence. I also proposed uh, to the Minister that uh, CEPL report annually on their uh, wood chip uh, export activities and that this particular mechanism be backed up by a uh, monitoring capacity. My department has had preliminary discussions uh, with the Department of Primary Industries and Energy uh, concerning uh, monitoring compliance with export licence uh, conditions. And, uh, once those options have been uh, further developed, which of course is a process that is continuing, then I certainly will be discussing those options further with Mr Bettle, the Minister for Resources. Supplementary, Senator Spindler. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but seeing that the Hensley Creek issue is particularly urgent, I wonder if he can give the Senate some indication of the timescale of responding to that particular aspect of the question. The Minister, Senator Faulkner. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Senator, I can add very little to what I said to you. I had received some uh, advice in relation to what was occurring. And as I mentioned, uh, my office uh, has received, uh, received uh, this morning some, uh, some uh, further supporting evidence from some voluntary conservation organisations. I indicated in my answer to you that uh, I would, uh, would uh, examine that uh, advice as quickly uh, as, uh, as possible, and that is in train now. But I, I do, I do uh, stress with you, Senator, it literally has been made available. Uh, and uh, passed through to me only within the past few hours. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Cook. M Mr uh, President, a question was asked of Senator McMullen by Senator Watson on Tuesday concerning a recent draft taxation ruling on the investment and development allowances and the effect this will have on public infrastructure projects. The Hansard page I'm informed is page 963. I have obtained an answer to this question by the from the Treasurer, and the answer goes as follows. Taxation draft rulings represent the preliminary, though considered, views of the Commissioner of Taxation. Draft rulings are released publicly to allow a period of consultation before being finalised. The Commissioner has advised that the draft taxation ruling TR 94 oblique stroke D 37 does not represent a change to the Australian Taxation Officer's approach to the grant of rights to use property. The draft ruling is a consolidation with improved explanation of years of case law and of past public rulings by the Australian Taxation Office. Granting rights to use an asset can preclude access to the investment allowance and the development allowance. That restriction has been part of such provisions since 1976 
and is the subject of several public rulings by the Australian Taxation Office and of several reported decisions of courts and tribunals. The provisions of section 51 oh, order, order. There's too much, too much noise. Section 51 capital A capital D also may be triggered by granting rights to use an asset to particular classes of taxpayer or for particular purposes. This provision has been in effect since 1982. As the ATO has not changed its approach to the application of these provisions, the Commissioner said there was no case, no cases of which it is aware where public infrastructure projects entered into on the basis of the ATO's approach would be prejudiced if the draft ruling became final without changing. If in a particular case a taxpayer has a private, has a private ruling from the ATOA in, in respect of a particular arrangement, then generally the taxpayer will be able to rely on that ruling for the year to which it relates, notwithstanding an inconsistent public ruling. End of answer. Senator Crowley. Acting Deputy President, um, Mr. Deputy President, uh, on the September the 1st, 1994, Senator Patterson asked me a question without notice regarding Strathton Lodge, a dementia-specific unit for uh, aged care. I seek leave to have a further answer incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answers? That, that Order 190. I seek to make a, a person. Personal explanation. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator uh, Kemp. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, during the uh, answer from Senator Schott, there was a very oh, unpleasant. Oh, point of order, Senator well, Kemp. Is it a personal explanation on the basis of claim to be misrepre misrepresented? Well, under 190, that's the provision, Senator. Oh, it is that's the provision, yes. Sir. Thank you, Senator Se Schott. Senator, Senator Kemp. Uh, Mr. Um, Deputy President, uh, during the answer from Senator Schott, there was a very unpleasant attack on all people who attended private schools. And uh, I would like to stand up and defend the many thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians who go to private schools. And I'd point out to Senator Schott that Mr Keating's children go to private schools. Senator Evans' children have gone to private schools, and indeed large numbers of people on the front bench have sent their children to private schools. And could you, on the next day of sitting, supply the information to the Senate of the number of Labor ministers who have sent their children to private schools? Yeah. Yeah, we Senator are. Kemp, a, fa a fairly dubious point of order, Senator Kent. Senator Schott. On, uh, on, the point of, on the point of order, I claim to be misrepresented. I did not. Is leave granted? No, no objection. Senator Schott. I did not. I did not in any way claim to say that all people who attended private, attacking people who attended private school. I, I was saying that those who, those people opposite, some of who attended private schools, the interest you represent seems always to promote the interests of the rich schools vis-à-vis -vis the rest, and that is what that is what I, the order. point I was making. Order, order, order. Sen Sen Senator Baum, do you claim to be misrepresented? I claim to have been misrepresented. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Baum. Senator Schott, in fact, said, and he referred to me and my colleagues, describing us as representatives of the private school system. That was exact, an exact quote. I took it down. I, uh, in fact, was educated entirely by the state school system, as were many of my colleagues. It is simply incorrect to classify me as such, although maybe I might have preferred, who knows, to, had I had the opportunity to go to uh, a, a private school. The fact is a large proportion of the uh, members on this side had the benefits of state school education. I'm proud of that education. Not only was educated by the state school system, I, I also attended North Sydney Boys High School, as did many of my colleagues attend similar uh, schools. And it is divisive and uh, trying to uh, generate class, uh, class consciousness, uh, which is totally un unacceptable, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy President. The Senator shot to behave in this way. It demeans the, uh, uh, the parliamentary process and more. It demeans him, if that is possible. Senator Ray. Mr Deputy President, I seek leave of the Senate to pre present a petition to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Reid. 
Sir Deputy President, I present a petition containing 740 signatures addressed to Senator Evans as Minister from Foreign Affairs, which I accepted from a group of people uh, outside Parliament House last Sunday, who I addressed briefly, relating to the situation in Burma, in particular Aung San Suu Kyi and the operations of the Slork government. The petition sets out in more detail the views of those who have signed it and I would seek leave to present it to Senator Evans. Leave granted. Objection. Leave is granted. Are there any motions to take note of answer? Senator, Senator, Senator Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Acting. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I move to take note of the answer given by Senator Collins to Senator Lee's question today. And uh, I understand that the, the minister had to leave the chamber, and he did give me the courtesy of saying that he, he, he was sorry that he couldn't stay. But I know that. Uh, the Minister and all, certainly all Senators on this side would be well aware by now that the measures announced yesterday by the Prime Minister uh, with regards to drought specifically exclude South Australia because that state is currently unable to declare drought in affected regional areas. Now, the Prime Minister said that in his approach to the problem of exceptional drought circumstances that he was fulfilling his commitment not to leave farm families in distressed circumstances behind. Now, I know that that was what he said in his statement, but I'm just wondering how he can really explain that statement to a large majority of South Australian farmers, particularly those uh, on Air Peninsula and in the Murray Mallee, who are seriously drought affected and will continue to suffer unless funds are urgently provided. Now, Senator Lee's asked this question, and uh, as usual, the, Democrat, uh, the Democrats find some interest in rural affairs. And I was interested to note that uh, Senator Lee's, in her question, uh, mentioned the fact that there was a truckload of sheep leaving Woodna uh, to be taken to the market. Some 26,000 left the area. Uh, I wonder, uh, had the Democrats had their way, uh, as their policy was at the last election, and added an extra 18 cents uh, a litre to fuel? Uh, just whether those farmers would have been able to afford to send those sheep to market uh, under their particular policy that they had at that time. But uh, I, I understand that uh, one of the reasons because there are not, uh, you cannot declare drought in a regional affected area. I understand that two weeks ago uh, Senator Collins agreed to a request from the South Australian Minister for Primary Industries to accept the scientifically based criteria for the declaration of drought within regions of that state. Now, I understand that uh, the scientifically based criteria has been forwarded to both the Minister, and the, uh, Minister for Primary Industries and the Prime Minister at lunchtime today. And I understand uh, that once it was received, it would then allow this criteria to be used to trigger regional drought declarations in South Australia. Now, I understand there is a process that does have to be gone through before that can happen. But I would hope, if Senator Lees and the Democrats who, who the Demo let me say, there are regions in South Australia, and this needs to be put into place so that regions can be declared drought, and not the whole state can be declared drought. Now, I hope that Senator Lees and the Democrats uh, will immediately support the actions of the South Australian Liberal government, and certainly support the actions of coalition senators in this place when it comes to the time for this uh, trigger uh, to, to be put into place, because it is absolutely essential that people in South Australia and regions, and because of the diversity of South Australia, it's a very rare situation for the whole of the, the, whole of the state to be in a drought situation, but there are many, many large areas of South Australia that have been suffering adverse conditions now for a number of years. And already uh, on Northern Air Peninsula and in parts of the Murray Mallee, there are people who will not get a crop this year. Uh, I will be going over to visit that area next week myself, but let me say that uh, there needs to be special circumstances for areas such as this, and they are very large areas and very large grain-producing areas. Let me say that one of the problems that we've seen to face is that the only way that an area can be declared a drought uh, area or the only way that any assistance can be provided is for the Prime Minister to visit. And it's taken months and months now for the Prime Minister to be dragged into the areas of New South Wales and to Queensland where the drought has been so severe for so long. And I would have thought, I would have thought that uh, with all that has been said in this chamber and in the public arena regarding the drought in northern New South Wales and in Queensland, that a visit would have been paid to, to these areas by the Prime Minister far sooner than this. 
it, uh, it doesn't seem to take much effort to get uh, uh, the Prime Minister to visit uh, bushfires or floods, but in effect we have a prolonged, serious situation and have had for a number of years in many parts of South Australia, as well as those areas uh, I know in uh, northern New South Wales and Queensland that have suffered so much. I hope that relief measures can be made available, particularly to those farm families who are suffering so greatly uh, in many parts of South Australia. And I would certainly urge the uh, federal government to do what it has to do to act as quickly as possible now that these criteria have been forwarded to them uh, so that the suffering that's currently being suffered by these people in such adverse conditions uh, can be put right in the same way that, is, that many people uh, in the rest of Australia have received the benefits of drought assistance. Senator Carr, are you on the same subject? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, there's a number of speakers on the same subject. I apologise. Senator Campbell. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I won't delay the Senate too much. I was uh, at uh, about 20 minutes past seven this morning appalled to hear the uh, Minister for Primary Industries on the Alan Jones uh, breakfast program on 2UE um, take what was a blatant and cheap political shot, saying that he hoped that the coalition senators in the Senate would not delay the passage of, I think it's the seven acts that require um, amendment to implement the drought package. I thought it was a very cheap shot. I happened to be on the, on the program uh, straight after uh, Senator Collins explaining to, the, uh, explaining to Alan Jones, not in considerable listening audience, about the money that this uh, government has wasted in its various failed government dealings, uh, business dealings uh, from some of the businesses in DAS. But uh, I was going to go across to Senator Collins during question time and say that I did think it was a cheap shot, and just because he was talking on Sydney Radio, we're all in Canberra, that we had actually caught him out. Because the coalition, as you know, Mr Deputy President, has uh, been very proactive on the issue of, uh, of uh, coming up with a broad-ranging drought package, which was announced many weeks ago. And there's no doubt that we all welcome the government's commitment to the, uh, to the drought package, but certainly uh, it was a belated package. And, uh, but one w that one we no doubt um, welcome uh, anyway. So it was, of course, even more uh, surprising, I thought, for, for Minister Collins, even though he does take the cheap political shot whenever he can get it, uh, to repeat what he said on the radio this morning here in the parliament this afternoon. The coalition understands very well the plight of those who are stricken by drought right around Australia. And and have understood it, I'm sure, far better than the Prime Minister specifically um, for many, many years, as Senator Ferguson quite correctly uh, interjects. But, uh, Mr Deputy President, if uh, he wants to score cheap political points on, uh, on, on radio programs, it's not the way to handle what is a national crisis that has the potential of ruining the lives of thousands of Australians uh, right across this nation, be they the people who suffer uh, because they are on the land and suffering the consequences of the drought, or be they um, uh, citizens right around this nation who will, of course, have their own we economic well-being and living standards affected by a continuation of this uh, disastrous uh, national uh, disaster in the drought. Senator Peniza. Mr President, or Deputy President, uh, I was a speaker on the same subject, and uh, I welcome the package that the government has brought down to assist the farmers in drought, but uh, while doing so, I'm questioning exactly to where it's going, because it seems to me, by this definition, uh, in uh, extreme drought, uh, how you define extreme drought, and I believe, well, I know that RAS uh, system has got a way of describing it or, or defining it, but uh, I haven't understood uh, how many. I don't really know how many have really understood it and, w and worked out who is available, who is available for it, and not, because there are ex pockets of Western Australia, and I mentioned this morning, Air Peninsula in South Australia, that is in the situation of being in financial difficulties. And when it comes to uh, families putting bread on the table. If I may say so, well then I think it's, uh, they could be very much in the same situation as people in New South Wales or Queensland and parts of Victoria. They could be exactly the same situation. And uh, uh, you know, someone's got to tell us, or the government's got to tell us what they are going to do from them. As I mentioned yesterday, you've got the Esperance area, southeast region of Western Australia, that's in a, uh, a pretty bad way this year, even though they had a reasonable year last year. But, uh, 
uh, as Senator Ferguson, I think, mentioned, uh, the Air Peninsula of South Australia could be in the same situation. And the Mallee of Victoria, that's correct. Parts of the Mallee of Victoria and South Australia. Uh, well, surely it doesn't stop at the borderline, uh, Senator Chapman. Uh, droughts seem to don't follow borders. But the point is, say, I do welcome uh, the, the measures that I've done on the social security way because it gets to the core of the family. I also welcome the OS study measures. And uh, I'd just like to mention the uh, uh, RAS guidelines. There is quite a push to change those guidelines to make uh, finance more easily available. I caution uh, the Senate a bit on that because I saw the experiences in Western Australia of the 76, 77 droughts and also the 1983 drought that got farmers into more, uh, more strife than it got them out of by making the money too easily available. I believe in the RAS system as long as it's administered properly and I always said that in Western Australia it wasn't administered properly for just things I said because there was deserving farmers that were, you could see they're going to be viable in the long run and they weren't helped and there was others helped that you could see that they weren't going to be viable in the long run and it helped those go over the line completely where the ones that probably battled for themselves got there in the long run and are solid now. So I do uh, caution the Senate on moving too far down that line. But I mean, we've got to look forward, Mr Deputy President, to when this drought is over and the government has got to put measures in place to make sure that resources are available to farmers when we do get out of drought and build up. Because as, uh, as sure as we are on this earth, there'll be another drought another time somewhere. So we've got to work towards that by conserving fodder and conserving cash. Uh, the government has made a mention in the, in the release on drought that the, they're looking at investment allowance for building storage and dams and extra dams for water. But I don't think that will help farmers too much that are coming out of the drought for at least four or five years they'll have a low income. And uh, what's the point in allowing uh, further investment allowance if uh, you don't uh, have any income that you're paying tax on. So really th th that one doesn't mean much. But where the government has really got to look is putting IEDs back into place. And the sort of IEDs that we had before, uh, namely under the, well, under the Fraser government, which used to work all right, there was a massive amount in there that uh, were used, including the 1982, 83, 1982 drought in the east and 1983 drought in the west. Though uh, it did come very useful, but unfortunately, due mostly to a friend of mine who used to be on the other side, Peter Walsh, he reckons they've been rorted. I couldn't see where they've been rorted, and the system was changed, and uh, the total in the fund went from about 300 million, if I'm correct, way down, I think there might be, I don't know, 50 or 60 million in there. So they are useless as they stand, and I ask the government to bring them back to where they used to be. Senator, Senator McGibbon. Different subject, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I understood it was the same subject. Senator Chapman. Thank you, Deputy President. I want to join uh, Senator Ferguson in expressing my great concern and disappointment that the drought relief package announced yesterday does not, as the situation currently stands in South Australia, apply to those farmers on the Air Peninsula and in the Murray Mallee of South Australia who are suffering at this stage of the season the devastating impact of drought. Because, of course, the reason for that is that in South Australia at the moment there is no criteria whereby the concept of extreme drought can be determined to enable the re relief package to apply to farmers in that state. And of course, the blame for that lies fairly and squarely with the Labor Party. Because we had in South Australia, in office for a decade, a Labor government in that state that paid scant regard to the needs of the rural people of South Australia. And that scant regard is no better demonstrated than by the fact that during that uh, long period in office, they failed to put in place appropriate criteria whereby uh, extreme drought could be rec recognised uh, when it struck. And so what, uh, what uh, we now have is a drought package announced last night that won't be applicable to those farmers in South Australia. 
To his great credit, uh, the present Minister for Agriculture in South Australia, Dale Baker, or Minister for Primary Industries, Dale Baker, under the new uh, Liberal government in that state, has been working uh, assiduously to develop uh, appropriate criteria which might be acceptable and might be recognised by the federal government. And, uh, he will be putting those, uh, putting those propositions to the federal minister, Senator Collins, at a meeting tomorrow. And the proposal will be that uh, there will be a specific scientifically based criteria whereupon South Australian farmers could trigger the exceptional drought uh, circumstances and thereby benefit from the package that was announced last night. So it remains, Mr Deputy President, for me along with Senator Ferguson to urge Senator Collins in the strongest possible terms to give very favourable consideration to those proposals that uh, Mr Dale Baker will be arguing before him tomorrow. Because unless those criteria are accepted, South Australian farmers, who are suffering equally with the, the farmers in other states from the devastating impact of drought this year, will be left high and dry. They will be left behind, contrary to the claim of, uh, of the Prime Minister uh, when he visited rural areas a couple of weeks ago, and, and the, uh, the, the, which he uh, reaffirmed yesterday in announcing this drought package. South Australian farmers will be left behind unless these very worthwhile criteria, which Dale Baker and his uh, officials from South Australia have worked hard to develop, as I say, in the face of years of neglect by the previous Labor government that was thrown out of office uh, at the end of last year. They have worked uh, very hard to develop those criteria. They are viable criteria, and I can only urge Senator Collins to accept them to ensure that South Australian farmers obtain this much-needed relief. Senator Carr. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the question that I would like to— oh, well, I'm sorry, sorry, Senator Carr. I must put the question first. The questions that Senator take note of the minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye, it's against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Carr. Mr Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Schott concerning education in Victoria. It is a grave disappointment to me that the answer was uh, so misunderstood in this chamber by those opposite, and they have raised questions concerning private schools. The issues that were at the heart of this matter, in fact, were the effect on the state education system in Victoria. I do not think it is understood just how severe the changes to education have been in the state that I represent here. I don't think it is understood what sort of an impact that the cuts and uh, disruptions have occurred in Victoria are having on Commonwealth education programs. We have seen the last two years some 230 schools closed. 230 schools is a very, very large number. We have seen the teaching numbers reduced by about 8,000. 8,000 teachers are taken out of the education system in one state. We have seen a decline in the number of students attending school of some 7,000. We have seen cuts to the effect of $370 million. Now, all of that, of course, has a very dramatic impact on the quality of education outcomes in any school system. And as far as the Commonwealth is concerned, the prime objective of its educational support programs is to supplement state school funding and so as to provide the equality of opportunity for students right across Australia. The Commonwealth currently provides nearly $300 million for education in Victoria. My grave concern is that as we move increasingly to global budgets for individual schools at a state level, as we move towards greater devolution of education and authority in the states, we are likely to see the substitution of Commonwealth funds for state funds where their cuts are occurring. And this is a model that has an impact right across Australia and it has an impact in terms of the quality of service that are available for the education of students right across Australia. And so if we're the issue that arises in this question ultimately is whether or not state governments' attacks on education ultimately undermine the education objectives of a Commonwealth government. And that, to me, is a very, very important matter. And I think ultimately it would be seen as an extremely important matter 
for this whole country. We place increasing emphasis on Australian education and the development of skills necessary for a flexible and mature workforce. You can't have that while simultaneously undermining the very foundations of the education system in this country. And as I say, the importance of this matter is that the model that's being expressed in Victoria is one that's being copied now in South Australia, Western Australia and Tasmania. Now, the Commonwealth spends nearly $3 billion a year on schools programs. And of course, if this sort of pattern of behaviour is allowed to continue, where you will find state governments undermining national programs, we are entitled to ask whether or not very large sums of money are being put at risk in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the service provided to the young people in this country. And ultimately, the sort of impact that such an attack on education has for the economy as a whole. And so for this reason, I'm very concerned. Now, Mr Kennedy in Victoria has indicated that the uh, basis of this report was, of course, uh, a device whereby there was uh, a high jump uh, bar established to make sure that uh, we go to each minister and each department and, uh, and the scenarios are put to them in such a way as that they remain focused on the overall objectives. I'm concerned, ultimately, whether or not uh, we're entitled to ask if this is the question of a high jump bar to keep ministers focused, how long before Mr Hayward, the Victorian Education Minister, in fact is up for the high jump himself? What well, are the questions? The Senate take note of the minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye. It's against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate takes note of the answer by Senator Evans to my question about Indonesia. The two points I want to make very briefly. The first is I find it very hard to believe that as conscientious and as diligent a minister as Senator Evans is, and I mean that quite sincerely in the discharge of his duty, hasn't visited the major embassies many times in this uh, capital city of Canberra. In fact, I'd have thought he'd have visited all embassies. But putting that aside, we have a grossly offensive sign uh, about East Timor that's been there across the road for quite a long while in front of the Indonesian embassy. And to argue that somehow or other the Indonesians have to put up with the most robust elements of Australian society and at the same time argue for the development of good Australian-Indonesian relations is to show that you nothing, know nothing at all about Indonesia. The sensitivity, the obliqueness of dealing with the Javanese, the dominant culture in Indonesia is as remote as possible from the barroom behaviour of, uh, in parts of Australia. It requires tact, it requires sensitivity and respect for their position. And this sign to them is grossly offensive. Furthermore, it does not reflect Australia's official foreign policy. Australia's foreign policy is to support the, uh, or recognise the incorporation of East Timor into Indonesia. But my main concern about it relates to the weaseling answer that the minister gave and somehow or other saying that, oh, this is a democracy, you've got to like it or lump it. Well, this isn't a libertarian society. It is no way. There, people don't have a licence to behave as they see fit. They certainly have a right to freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of speech. All of those things aren't transgressed, though, by good manners or denied by good manners. And what we've got here is a permanent insult. It's not a transient one, like a group meeting outside the gates of the embassy demonstrating a point of view. What we've got there is deeply offensive to the Indonesians, and it's deeply offensive to me as an Australian. Because we have emissaries in this country, the representatives of other powers, other nations, and we have an obligation on us to treat them courteously not treat them discourteously the way we are treating the Indonesians at the present time and have treated them for quite a long time. And I would ask the minister to really consider his position quite clearly. If he is sincere in his aim to develop better relations between Australia and Indonesia, the very first thing he will do is improve the manners of the host country and get rid of gratuitous insults like that East Timor sign. Or the question is that the Senator take Senator Kearney on the same matter. You know, just, uh, I think the uh, point that uh, Senator McGibbon raises is a very important point, and many of the things that he says is uh, are true. 
We, on the other hand, if we are in a uh, robust democratic society, through you, Mr. Deputy President, I ask uh, Senator McGibbon this: uh, Where are we to stop if we are uh, to sp stop people expressing views that we don't like? If we are to stop uh, people expressing views that we think, uh, and with good cause, in this case, that uh, our friends overseas might dislike, if we are to stop that, uh, where are we to get to? Uh, the fact of the matter is we are uh, one of the world's uh, most robust democracies. We are a true democracy. And once we start uh, stopping people uh, expressing themselves and saying what they want, then uh, uh, we're in trouble. And if we are a democracy, we can't uh, claim uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deny, or we can't move to deny, people from saying things that we don't like and, that the, and, the, and what other people might uh, not like. And uh, uh, the great statement that's quoted again and again, uh, uh, I'll uh, write and like what you say, this is a paraphrasing of course, but I'll uh, give my life to defend your right to say it. <laughs> if we forget that, uh, then we start uh, going backwards as a democracy. I uh, sympathise uh, very much with the sorts of things that uh, Senator McGibbon says, but on the other hand, uh, uh, if we go down the line that he is suggesting, then we start diminishing uh, those freedoms that we uh, so much cherish in this country. Order. The question is that the Senate take note of the Minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Order. Uh, in speaking on the 19th of September 1994 in relation to the determination of the President that a motion relating to a matter of privilege raised by Senator Vanstone should not have precedence, understanding Order 81, Senator Vanstone invited the President to reconsider his determination. He has uh, since done that and I uh, incorporate it uh, in Hansard. Matters of public importance. The following letter has been received from uh, Senator Knowles. Uh, dear Mr President, for the sure understanding Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. In light of statements made by the Minister for assisting the Prime Minister on the status of women, the Senate notes the hypocrisy of the Australian Labor Party policy of quotas to get more women into Parliament, while recent pre-selection results demonstrate the reverse. Yours sincerely, Sue Knowles, Senator for Western Australia. Is the proposal supported? Order. I call Senator Knowles. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This is a matter of great concern to the Coalition that the Labor Party uh, has got an intended quota system for female parliamentarians, and uh, it will be the way in which their numbers are bolstered in the future, because it goes nowhere to removing the barriers which presently block or limit the entry of women into the parliament, and it may work to create reverse discrimination against male candidates. And it's interesting to note, uh, Mr. Acting, uh, Mr Deputy President, that over the time, over the last few months, while this uh, whole system has been debated within the Labor Party, that they started at 45 per cent. Uh, sorry, they started at 50 per cent. Then they dropped it down to 40 per cent. Now they've dropped it down to 35 per cent, and they still can't decide how on earth they're going to deliver such a quota system by the year 2002 because even originally it was going to be brought forward further than that. And it's amazing that someone like uh, Dr Lawrence can lower her uh, ideals in this regard so much where she needs to indulge in tokenism and actually belittle the role that women can play within the parliament. Because the Senate does note the hypocrisy of the Labor Party on this issue in the terms of the mismatch of rhetoric and record. And while the party has been arguing about affirmative action since 1981, it has still not done anything whatsoever to improve the situation. Now, this is the Labor Party that for some 13 years now has been talking about this affirmative action, and in many cases it has gone on its track record the opposite direction. The coalition governments of New South Wales, for example, have three female ministers. Why does the Labor Party not take an example being set without quotas? Why don't they have more female ministers? Why don't they bring more ministers into this federal parliament? Why don't they have more ministers in the uh, Queensland government? It's pu purely and simply because they need to have the quotas to do it. They don't just do it on their own behalf. 
they have to have quotas. In, Western Australian, uh, in the Western Australian Legislative Council, for example, the Labor Party had five members of the council. They now have two. Now it's going in the opposite direction. The Labor Party also had nine in the lower house, which has now fallen to five. So what are they talking about when at the same time as talking about quotas, they are actually consistently dropping their representation? The Labor Party is clearly making no progress on the issue of women in parliament in Western Australia or in a number of other states. The Labor Party puts up uh, uh, women as lambs to the slaughter. Let's have a look what they did to uh, Carmen Lawrence and Joan Kerner. While both of those women happened to be participants in, uh, in uh, ministries where they led their respective states into the ground, their Labor Party then decided that they had to be the sacrificial lambs and to be taken to slaughter because both of them then had to lead unsuccessful governments to defeat. And so, therefore, this is the track record of this Labor Party, where they actually lead their women into slaughter. Part of the Labor Party's resolution on this quota system states that the national executive shall have the responsibility and the power to determine the outcome in any public office pre-selection progressively between now and the year 2002 in order to ensure that the rule is complied with. Now, that's what they have to do. They have to actually get intervention to make sure that it's complied with. But of the several opportunities so far available to the Labor Party at a state and federal level to begin the ball rolling, very, very few of them have been taken. Only last Saturday week there was a by-election in the state seat of Helena in Western Australia. Until that election was held, it was a Labor seat. It was a Labor-held seat. What did the Labor Party do? Instead of complying with their own so-called demands of quotas and getting good women in, they endorsed a man against the Liberal Party, who had a, a very, very competent female, who now is the member for Helena. So all of this tokenism, all of this flapping of the jaws is absolutely leading nowhere in the Labor Party. Senator Evans may well displace a female candidate in running for Holt. And one may wonder whether he is prepared to endorse a female to fill his vacancy here in the Senate. But that deal has been done for Senator Evans to go into Holt with no consideration whatsoever for a female to take that seat. And yet the Labor Party are still saying we've got to get more women into winnable seats. It just does not gel. Of course, there is the case of Jenny Beecham, the candidate for the marginal seat in Victoria of Ballarat. Uh, Ms Beecham is one of the Labor Party's highest profile and, they tell us, most competent women and a former party state secretary. Why, if they think that much of her, do they endorse her for a marginal seat? Why haven't they given her halt? No, they give her a marginal seat. If it is the ALP's idea to endorse uh, more women candidates only for marginal seats such as this, then the policy uh, can, be a little, can be little more than uh, hot air at best and, I suppose, tokenism at worst. But that doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't seem to worry the Labor Party. Because, as Dr Lawrence has said, and I quote, I'm not into women coming up via male patronage. Well, I don't know what she is into, because there is no way that this Labor Party is actually demonstrating what it's talking about. The plan to introduce quotas may, of course, well and truly backfire, as it may in fact violate anti-discrimination guidelines and open the floodgates to damages claims being, uh, by unsuccessful male candidates. And this, of course, remains to be tested, but it is inevitable that it will be tested if a man is excluded by the Labor Party for pre-selection on the basis of his sex. Now, there has been a number of legal opinions, given that this government and this party, this Labor Party, is actually uh, con contravening the anti-discrimination legislation that they brought into this country. Now, I ask Senator Crowley, when will you be introducing legislation to make your decisions on quotas retrospectively legal? Because quite clearly what you are currently doing, as has been given by so many legal opinions, 
is illegal. And when are you going to introduce such legislation? And even allowing for the normal retirement rate of male politicians, there will not be enough seats available to come anywhere near the quota being demanded. Does that mean that men will simply be pushed into the scrap heap? And certainly the men in the Labor Party in Western Australia are uh, starting to dig in their heels because four of them have been earmarked for retirement and replacement. They're pretty cross about that. But does it matter to the Labor Party? No, it doesn't. Does it matter that they're contravening their own legislation? No, it doesn't. And no wonder those people are pretty angry, because the policy threatens to end the political careers of many good male politicians. But you don't care about that, because you are quite happy to indulge in reverse discrimination. And the Prime Minister says that this is just and wise. Well, I wonder how the 60 male members of parliament who are going to be given the flick feel about that. I wonder if they consider that it is just and wise. The policy is a classic band-aid measure. It's ill-conceived, it's clumsy and, above all, it's jolly patronising. And Does the Labor Party not recognise the achievements made thus far by women in parliament in the past and present? And Does it think that without male intervention that women will never get anywhere on their own future? The attitude is appalling and it's the most appalling indictment of the many notable achievements of women, not just in the parliament, but of women in sport, women in the arts and other professional women who, through their own blood, sweat and tears, have actually succeeded. And I was disturbed to learn the other night that Dr Lawrence made some inane quip on a program about, with three members of parliament, herself, a British member of parliament and, I think, a Swedish one. And the British member of parliament was saying how the, the House of Commons is such a boys' club, and they actually have a shooting gallery. And Dr. Lawrence actually said, "Dr. Lawrence actually said, oh, we have squash courts." In other words, insinuating that women shouldn't play squash. Well, I wonder whether um, Dr. Lawrence has ever heard of Heather Mackay, or Michelle Martin, or Rachel Grinham, because they all happen to be Australians. They all happen to be champions, they all happen to be women, and they all happen to be squash players. But what does Dr Lawrence do? Belittle women again by saying they're incapable of competing in sports. I wonder if she would like to recall the good work that the, the Australian women did at the Commonwealth Games. But no, she belittles women because there have somehow got to be quotas. These women achieved on their own, benefit, on their own behalf. They didn't have to have quotas. They didn't have to have some artificial uh, crutch to get them there, but that's what Dr Lawrence is talking about. But it's interesting, I think, to look at the progress made under the Liberal Party in comparison to the Labor Party, because the Liberal Party has traditionally encouraged women to play an active role in many facets of our society, including the parliament, and under the Liberal Party women have been encouraged to make real achievements. And it's been, never been the intention of the Liberal Party to implement a quota scheme whereby the numbers of women in parliament or the judiciary are artificially bolstered merely as an act of tokenism. The Liberal Party has got the runs on the board, had the first female member of the House of Representatives, the first female senator, the first uh, female minister, the first, fem the, first female, um, the first female cabinet minister, the first female cabinet minister responsible for a government department. The yes, exactly. Exactly, Senator Bohm. Ch shaking your head is not going to change history. You rewrite history on everything else. There's no point in rewriting history on this as well. The Liberal Party's had the first opposition whips. They've had the first government whips. They've had the first um, ethnic, ethnic, ethnic women in, in parliament, the first woman to ever be of uh, Chinese extraction, the first woman to ever be of Singaporean extraction. And there has been a first, 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 first all the way along the line. Without quotas, without quotas, and I repeat, just so that Senator Crowley and Senator Kerno might understand, without quotas, this has been achieved. And of course, there is always room for improvement in terms of uh, numbers of women represented in the parliament. But I believe that members of parliament, be they male or female, should be pre-selected on the basis of their merits and qualities as potential politicians. We do not subscribe to the Labor Party's concept of quotas, and we never will. 
And the fact of the matter is that you need to also bear in mind at some stage what women themselves feel about it. And many of them don't wish to enter parliament because of their family and personal commitments. But what are you doing drafting women into the parliament and working against your own legislation? Well, before I call Senator Crowley, uh, I understand that the informal arrangements have been made between the whips to allocate specific times for the various speakers, and I'll ask the clerks to set the clocks according to those agreed times. Senator Crowley. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, Senator Knowles, I don't know what you're doing in here with this ridiculous and peculiar debate. Are you, in fact, campaigning for less women in parliament, or are you actually wanting to have a kind of a, a Liberal Party women are better than Labor Party women? Well, let me start a couple of things. First of all, I'd say this for openness, Senator. I think the cult for Kuyong will not be replaced by a filly. Yes, it is. Secondly, secondly, in 1944, the age 16th of September 1994, Senator Knowles, in 1944, Robert Menzies discovered he needed women. In securing support to create the Liberal Party, he struck a deal with 40,000 members of the Women's National League in Victoria assuring them that 50 per cent of executive positions at every level of the state Liberal Party would go to women in return for their support and finances. Now, what do you call that, Senator? Not a quota? Not a quota, Senator? In fact, we know why he did it, because the women held Robert Gordon Menzies to ransom. If you don't guarantee us 50 per cent of all executive places, you won't get the money that our large families can give you to establish this party. That's what your party's founded on, Senator. Quotas for women to keep them in the back room because these quotas of women didn't deliver them into parliament. Now, I don't mind that you come in here and want to uh, whack and slang around the place, but for goodness sakes, do it on facts. Do it on facts and do it on, uh, uh, I think, understanding much better than you certainly do what this is about. Now, one of the extraordinary things you said was legal advice says, and Senator Knowles at this stage looks as though she's beating a hasty retreat from the Senate. Oh, she's not goody. That's good she's saying. She's going to be prepared to listen and really understand what she is being saying, which is absolute rubbish. For a start, she says legal opinion, legal opinion, legal opinion tells her that there could be complaints brought under the Sex Discrimination Act by anybody who is uh, dudded of a seat on the grounds that a woman might be pre-selected. It's going to be hard to decide that, Senator, because there's no guaranteed seats for men. But in fact, if you understood the Sex Discrimination Act, you'd know it was not possible because political parties are exempt from the effect of that act. You don't even know the legislation that applies, and why would you? Because eight of your colleagues, eight of your colleagues crossed the floor to support it because your party was in such disarray about it that you actually opposed the Sex Discrimination Act. It was going to wreck the world and ruin the world. You don't understand it. No complaints can be brought, Senator. Political parties are exempt from that act. And indeed, it's important and interesting to note what happened to the people who supported the advancement of women in this party, the members of the opposition who crossed the floor. What happened to Mrs Cathy Martin? She was sent to an early grave for wanting to support, political grave for wanting to support women. You could ask Peter Bowen where his career went after he had the courage to support women. Michael, you'd know that. Senator Michael Bowen would know that very well. You could also ask uh, a number of people in the opposition what happened to their careers when they took uh, the, the, the difficult step of crossing the floor to support the government's legislation of sex discrimination. They know that it was a very important thing to do because they knew, they knew, they knew, they knew what would happen to them. And I'll cite Senator Chris Puplik, ex-Senator Chris Puplik, in his very good book. He says the Liberal Party lost a generation over Vietnam. They lost another generation over green issues. And right now they're losing another generation on the Republic. And through all of those generations, they've lost it because of their attitudes to women. Their attitudes to women. This party, this Labor government, is totally unashamed of making it clear that voluntary affirmative action in our parties have not delivered sufficient number of women. Well, that's no longer any good. We want some rule changes to ensure that women are fairly represented across the margin of seats safe seats and marginal seats in any and future parliaments, until, starting from the year 2001, where a minimum only must be both men and women. A minimum only must be both men and women. So it's perfectly possible to have far more than that number of either gender. And of course the Labor Party will sort it out in the reasonable way that it always does. You can pick your seats, Senator. You can pick your seats. 
Well, I mean, it's doubtful, Senator Bohm, if you really want to get dirty on this or into tough details, you could ask what's happening about pre-selections in, in uh, Western Australia at the moment for the Liberal uh, opposition, uh, for, for their Senate ticket, for example. Well, I'm not going to sort of trawl it all out here, but you can hardly sheet home to the Labor Party difficulties with pre-selections or the challenge of trying to fit four people into three spaces, any of those sorts of things. It's a nonsense, an absolute nonsense. Now, in South Australia, with the um, <coughs> departure of uh, Lynn Arnold, an extraordinarily excellent candidate and wonderful representative of the Labor Party, it looks very likely—one can never presume these things, of course—it looks likely that the, the caucus in South Australia will be increased by yet another woman, taking the percentage in South Australia in the Labor Party to 35 per cent. 35 per cent, Senator. We're serious about it. We're very serious about it, and I want to take issue with you about another remarkable nonsense that you said, and that was that women in the opposition get there on their merit and have never had the assistance of men, but Labor Party women only get advanced because of the assistance of uh, men. Well, I never actually feel the assistance of men is an insult, particularly if it's actually a, a, achieving things for candidates and women. But in South Australia this year, Senator, we're selling an, uh, celebrating an extraordinary achievement where men assisted. They had to. We're talking about the centenary of suffrage. The vote for women in South Australia was won 100 years ago, and at the same time, the right to stand for parliament, the first democracy in the world that gave that advance to women. And as the parliament of the time that was bound to change the law was entirely made up of men, what were women to do? Accept the assistance of men who wanted to change the laws? Of course they did, Senator. Your claim for, for anything contrary to that is sheer and utter nonsense. They did. <clears throat> they accepted the support of the members, members of parliament, all men, who were prepared to see that the future of a real democracy was based on having fair representation for women, and certainly at least the opportunity for women to have a say in the shaping and formulation of the laws of the land by electing the people that they preferred. I remind this Senate, if they haven't been told before, it's not a reminder, but I'll tell them, that uh, Alexander Downer's grandfather at that time promised that he would support that legislation. But when it came to the time, the time for the vote, he did not. I'm very pleased to remind Mr Alexander Downer of that on any occasion. Said he would vote for women's suffrage, then he did not. Well, tell me what you'd say about that, Senator Knowles. Was he for you or against you? <clears throat> did he assist you in progressing the advancement of women? Are you wanting to give away the right of vote that men won for you, that you won because of your campaign? What did Western Australian women do? Uh, to win the vote for themselves, or was it men parliamentarians who won it for them? You have actually got a nonsense art, uh, argument over there, and in fact it's probably absolutely not clear to listeners why on earth you would want to be arguing as you are. Castigating the Labor Party for actually moving to a rule change that makes serious its intention to see a fair representation of women elected to parliaments. So I would have thought that you should be in here celebrating that. You should be in here celebrating that, Senator Knowles. It is no insult to women. The women who will be pre-selected, as all the ones who have gone before, will be selected on merit, on merit, on their ability to, to, to perform as a good candidate in the community for a House of Representatives seat, as an adequate and uh, comprehensive uh, person who covers the Senate. Different qualities may be needed. Always the women candidates have been chosen on merit, Senator, not because uh, uh, they're incompetent and men only choose incompetence. It's a pathetic and puerile argument. And I don't understand really what your point is except to say apparently the Liberal Party think women should be left to manage by themselves and not given any assistance. Well, this Labor Party <coughs> and this government are absolutely committed to ensuring that our promises for women make a difference. You're the first to come in here and say, why aren't there more women on boards? Why aren't you doing something about that? Well, of course, in boards we can only urge boards to see the appointment of more women. We can't force that. We are leaving it to, to the boards to understand the changing, the changing society that we have. And either one way you want more women on boards and you want them to achieve, or you want to not. Now, you, you can't have it both ways, Senator. Are you pleased about the success of the Labor Party in getting an increased, increased number of women in parliament? Or is it that you only want liberal women in parliament? And if you only want liberal women in parliament, come out and say that. Come out and say that. Only certain sorts of women are acceptable. Is it a disadvantage to have Democrats represented by men and women? If you are serious about more women in parliament, you should embrace all women in this parliament 
But when it comes to the political crunch, then of course we are down to our usual party disciplinary lines. But you are confused, Senator. You're very confused, Senator Knowles. You are not at all clear about what you are trying to say. You want women in parliament, but you don't want to take steps to assist them. You are in suggesting that a quota system guarantees not merit. You are absolutely wrong, Senator. Quotas you object to, but the Liberal Party was founded on quotas. Absolutely, Senator, I have to say to you, don't come in here and point the finger at us. If you can't guarantee a filly for Kuyong, it's just another cult, then I think you've got your own house to put in order before you criticise the government. The Leader of the Democrats, <laughs> Senator Kerno. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. It's a, it's a, it's a bit unfortunate that this motion should um, get us to reduce the bigger debate about women in politics to some sort of obscene competition about my party's got a better record than your party. I mean, that's a bit of a masculine approach, if I might say so, because it is true. It's true that women are underrepresented at virtually all levels of senior decision-making in this country. 13 per cent of the Australian federal parliament, 5 per cent of professors and associate professors in Australian universities, 3 per cent of company board members. That's just a few examples. And what it means is not about um, who's going to be moved on the government benches. What it means, Senator Knowles, is that while it's easier for Australian women to get themselves heard, that visibility doesn't necessarily translate itself into concrete action. I recently launched a collection of papers called Women in Government, in which Dr Elaine McCoy summed up the situation very well, saying, and I quote, that while the modes of publicity available to women to express protest against conditions of subjugation have increased, the incidence of discrimination and exclusion from the centres of power have not changed much in over a century. So while we might get more money for things like childcare or women's health, and we might see and hear more about uh, violence against women, we are not getting much closer to the real sources of power in this country. Jenny Wolfe said that the history of men's opposition to women's achievements was as interesting as the achievements themselves. And nowhere has that been more apparent than in Australian politics, where we've managed the grand total of just over 60 women in federal parliament since the 93 years of federation. There are many reasons for that poor record, not the least of them being that, I think, party loyalty rather than gender loyalty has effectively dictated the political behaviour of Australian women. But as many women have observed over the years, the rewards for party loyalty have often been very few, and they continue to be. If you look back through the history of women's involvement in Australian politics, you will see that there have not been too many women who have made it into leadership positions at a federal level or into the ministry, the cabinet or the shadow cabinet. But, Senator Knowles, it is a bit rich to come in here and have a go at the Labor Party when the coalition isn't exactly bursting at the seams with women shadow ministers. I mean, you have Bronwyn Bishop, the only woman in shadow cabinet. Now, we all know there are some particularly competent women in this place both your parties, who have been overlooked for positions in favour of considerably less competent men. But having said that, I will acknowledge that the Liberal Party overall has a better record than the Labor Party. Despite the Labor Party liking to trumpet itself as the great party of equal opportunity, its structural and historical biases against women have been very difficult ones for women to overcome. And it's interesting to note that from 1901 to 1975, the ALP fielded only 35 women candidates for the House of Representatives, while the major non-Labor parties fielded 51 candidates. But while their record may be marginally better, the Conservative parties in Australian politics also have a structural bias against women. And as many women in the Liberal Party have pointed out over the years, the party suffers from a paradox. So I'm going to explain that to you, Senator Ferguson. The Liberal Party suffers from a paradox because on the one hand, you have a historical willingness to incorporate women into internal party structures, but on the other hand, you have an ongoing failure to articulate policies which address discrimination against women. Because time and time again, the Liberal Party has chosen to see women's policies primarily in terms of family policies or to see women's concerns as being defined by their family responsibilities. And that sort of thinking fails to address the fundamental political and economic inequality of women. And it's limited thinking. 
and it's, it's thinking which reflects the Liberal Party's inability to see the need for structural changes in a whole range of areas, not just in terms of women. So I don't think the Labor Party has a monopoly on hypocrisy when it comes to getting more women into positions of power where they can influence and change party policy. But I'm not entirely sure that quotas will be the solution, although in the Labor Party's case at least it represents an acknowledgement of how much work it needs to do to get the reality matching the rhetoric. It worries me that quotas could be used as a cop-out and as a way of avoiding long-term structural reform. I will be surprised, I hope I'm wrong, I'll be very surprised though if that 35 per cent of women being pre-selected in winnable seats translates into 35 per cent of senior party positions or 35 per cent of cabinet positions being held by women by the year 2002. I bet it doesn't. It won't work if it's not really about structural change. It won't work if it's about imposing quotas on a system which is not a good one in the first place. Now, the Democrats haven't had a need for quotas, mainly, I suggest, because of the importance of our participatory structures. And this is something which is rarely acknowledged when people talk about the involvement of women in Australian politics. These are processes which have delivered the election of the first woman leader of a political party at a federal level in Janine Haynes. Now, I acknowledge the Democrats don't come with a lot of historical and political baggage. And we haven't had to battle with the sort of vested interest or entrenched male hierarchies which exist in other parties. But that's the very thing that appealed to me and to other women uh, when I joined the Democrats. Right from the start, the male and female founding members set up our party processes along participatory principles, inclusive principles. That is something which many women find attractive. I'm not revealing anything new when I say that participatory structures can be very difficult to work with at times, but I do think it is one argument that has to be acknowledged. It is one of the major reasons why women have done so well in the Democrats compared with other parties. I want to finish by mentioning the matter of electoral reform. Now, there's not much point in political parties running around sniping at each other about who does or doesn't care about getting more women into parliament if we don't address the fundamental question of major electoral reform. And I think it's very clear that multi-member electorates are essential to achieving better representation for women. And I don't think we should be afraid to start looking at various ways of improving our electoral system to make it a more representative one. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I guess I'm disappointed that this debate hasn't been possible uh, in terms of cross-party support for the fundamental issues. There's a bit, been a bit of uh, opportunistic sniping about what the Labor Party might do or the Liberal Party might do, and I'm going to avoid indulging in that level of debate because the issue is about women's equity in this country. It's about women taking their, their place in the de democratic processes of, of uh, the national and uh, state parliaments and indeed at local government level as well. And I don't think it really helps for us to say, uh, in, almost like schoolgirls, well, we're better than you. We're all in exactly the same boat. Let me just quote from a, a colleague uh, who was battling to gain recognition in the business sector. And she said to me recently, he's your colleague, your equal, a post-liberation, new sensitive age guy, but compete with him and you'll find this new dog knows some very old tricks. And though that quote re refers to liberals, to Democrats, to, to Labor men. It, it applies to men in business. It applies to men in the public sector. So really, the women who have actually made it into, into uh, Parliament, we're all in, in the situation where we can start to raise these issues, to try to, to get greater public awareness of the issues. And in the case of the Australian Labor Party, I'm, prepared, I'm proud to say, we are prepared to do something about it. Now, sure, I could tell you some horrendous stories about my party's record, 
but, and I see some of you looking very interested, but I'm not going to. I don't think that serves the debate for the future. What I can say, though, is that what I can say, though, is that the Australian Labor Party, next Tuesday, in the, in, as a result of the rules debate that has been flagged, of course, by the decision of the national executive and led very, very ably and very strongly by Prime Minister Paul Keating, we will reject the chauvinism of the past. We will say, sure, we haven't got it right in the past. Far too many men have been promoted and merit has had nothing to do with it. Far too many women have been overlooked. Far too many women have been ignored. We confess that, but that is in the past. We are looking to the future. We are finding a new way, and that is the quota approach or the target approach, depending on your, your preference of, of terminology. And let me just say that there are some people in this parliament and indeed in the community who seem to think that setting a particular target or quota is somehow revolutionary. It's radical. Well, what will, what will the Labor Party's decision, this rule change, mean next Tuesday? It will mean, Senator Knowles, that one in three vacancies, as they occur, will be negotiated through the, the, the uh, factional system so that one in three vacancies are filled by women, and this process will proceed over the next uh, eight years. Now, that isn't particularly revolutionary. I mean, ask many of, uh, many of my women colleagues how they'd do it. We'd have done it very differently, and it might have been much more radical. But it, this is a realistic, logical compromise it is a sensible decision, and it is a decision uh, that I know will be endorsed by National Conference next week, and I am proud to be associated with it. A recent interparliamentary union survey revealed that the proportion of women in the world's houses of parliament has dropped significantly in the last five years. And I'd just like to, to indicate that this concept of setting a target or setting a, a um, quota is, is not something particularly radical. Twenty-three countries with social democratic parties currently operate some form of a quota system to ensure that more women are represented in parliament. Canada and Great Britain have adopted a 50 per cent quota of women by the year 2000. Norway, Sweden, Denmark and Germany have adopted a 40 per cent quota for each gender. Other countries, including Austria, Belgium, France, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Japan, Spain and Turkey, have each introduced quotas which range from 15 to 33 per cent. And quite clearly, this is a way to start to bring about reform, reform that is long overdue. I know when I was minister res uh, responsible for the status of women, I used to wonder when it would be that the private sector directors would attack me for expecting them to comply with affirmative action legislation, while within my own ranks we ignored such principles. The Labor Party has a very proud tradition in terms of our commitment to social justice, to recognition of equal opportunity, to recognition of equity. The only thing is, somebody forgot to tell us about it, when we're working on the inside, when we're working at, at, on our home bases, if you like, within the party. And now is time for, for us to change. That change has been announced through our national executive processes and it will be endorsed next week. And to those who say it can't work, you get to force men out of parliament, you'd have to be joking. Do you really think that the handful of women who actually have uh, any power or authority within this parliament 
Do you really think that they're going to have the power and authority to march men in this place out of the parliament by force? What nonsense! The 35 per cent target is a realistic and logical way. Women in the party will be monitoring it very closely, and I'll tell you what, women in the community will be watching it very closely. And if the 35 per cent target is not being met, if jobs for the boys are continuing to be delivered to the boys, if uh, the mates and the favoured sons are being, being put first, then it will be not only women in the party, it will be women in the community, because women expect more representation of women, not only in parliament, but at upper levels of all decision making around this country. Senator Byrne. Deputy President, uh, I don't think anyone in this parliament uh, denies the fact that there are not enough women in parliament, particularly in the major parties. Uh, that's why Senator Curnow's contribution, uh, I thought in general, was a, a very positive one. She, uh, her party certainly uh, probably needs quotas for men uh, rather than, uh, than women to create uh, some kind of equality. But the, uh, but the key point, I think, is this. It is that the Labor Party's hypocrisy in going down this, the track it's gone down, that is uh, having quotas, is aimed at covering up a deep-seated tradition which has been anti-women. And that's the key and unequivocal issue which cannot be denied. Now look, despite its veneer of reform, deep down inside the Labor Party retains quite a lot of its worst traditions. It was the last major party to give up racism as a formal policy. It retains this old-fashioned, long-held view of women, particularly in the right wing in New South Wales, as the people who are somehow subservient. Its actions confirm that view. That's why its rhetoric has to be so absurd, to make up for the lack of meaningful action. But the rhetoric, the rhetoric gets the media the rhetoric gets the media attention, and that's what this is all about, these latest measures. These are about getting media attention to say what good people we intend to be in the future. We haven't delivered yet, and if you're looking at those two, Senator Ray, as evidence of having delivered, can I reaffirm the point? You haven't delivered yet. Now, this is all about getting phony media headlines. And I agree with Senator Kernow, who made this very strong point that quotas could be a cop-out to avoid real reform. How many women are sitting on that front bench, Senator Ray? How many women are sitting on your front bench? Well, regrettably, Senator, because of illness, one of our most outstanding women had to withdraw from the front bench, so I don't take that very kindly. Now, the, uh, the other point that Senator Curnow made that I think is well worth noting is her concession that overall the Liberal Party has a better record than the Labor Party on this issue. She is absolutely right, and I quote her direct, and it is without quotas in the parliament. Now, let's, uh, I, I, there's no point dealing with what Senator Crowley uh, uh, had to say. It was all so incredibly nonsensical. But what did interest me is that she was praising some members of this side of the House for having crossed the floor. What humbug! If only her party would allow people to cross the floor, then we may be able to see what some of them really think, if they think at all. At, uh, the, question, the question clearly is uh, here that this is a matter largely of humbug. That the, that the quota system, that the quota system, as Senator Kerno says, can and will be used as a cop-out, just as the rhetoric in the past from the Labor Party has not been met by, re by action. The Liberal Party has a well-established and very proud tradition in selecting and promoting women into politics, a fact that is all too often overlooked or deliberately ignored by those who are in the business of rewriting history, like the people opposite. 
Liberals are extremely proud of the way this party has recognised over the last 50 years the enormous contribution that women from all walks of life can and do make to Australian public life and politics in particular. Women have had an important role to play in the Liberal Party since its inception and our record is certainly much more impressive than Labor's. I still a lot to be done, I concede, but I underline Senator Kerno's point. Our record is better than Labor's, or I guess Senator Kerno would probably say less worse. But nonetheless, but nonetheless uh, uh, it is better without quotas. While the Liberal Party has always promoted and encouraged women, Labor has only recently and quite cynically realised that women have a role to play, an important role, in the Australian political system. But let's recognise that the first woman elected to the New South Wales Parliament, and I speak strongly of New South Wales as a representative of that state, was Millicent Preston in 1925. She was a member of the Nationalist Party, which uh, was a precursor of the Liberal Party uh, that opposed, of course, the Labor Party in New South Wales. At the federal level, the Liberal Party was first in appointing a woman to cabinet in 1949, Damien Lyons. The first woman to serve in a cabinet and have, and have responsibility for a government department. The first woman to serve in a cabinet and have responsibility for a government department was Senator Margaret Guilfoyle in 1976, and naturally she was a Liberal. In New South Wales, Rosemary Foote was the first woman to be elected to a senior leadership position. That happened uh, 11 years ago when Mrs Foote was elected deputy leader of the parliamentary party. Importantly, there are four women in the New South Wales State Cabinet. That is the highest proportion of women in any ministry in Australia. And that's a proud record of the New South Wales Liberal and National Parties. The New South Wales Cabinet has twice as many women as the Labor Party's, uh, State Labor Party's shadow ministry, which only has two females. If Bob Carr, the state leader of the opposition in New South Wales and the ALP, is serious about promoting women, then the shadow ministry isn't a bad place to start, unless, of course, Mr Carr thinks there are no women, women of merit on his back bench. The fact is this. If you're a woman in the Labor Party, it appears that the only way to be promoted up the ladder is if you belong to the right faction and are married to one of the self-styled power brokers. As the Australian newspaper said only last week, the New South Wales Labor Party idea of affirmative action is giving your wife a job. Perhaps in view of the Cabramatta pre-selection going on at the moment, we should add, or your fiancé. Now, if the Labor Party is not being hypocritical, then it should replace those male Labor members who are poor performers in this parliament by women. I, for one, I, I for one would rather see an incompetent male replaced by a female, even if she was equally incompetent. In particular, in the MacArthur electorate, Mr Chris Haviland uh, a particularly undistinguished member should be replaced by his challenger, as yet unannounced, I might say, his challenger from his same faction, Miss Meg Oates. Now, I don't know when that is going to take place, but I understand there's a recognition that uh, Meg Oates would make a less worse member than Chris Haviland. It wouldn't take much. In Gilmore, in Gilmore, in Gilmore, it would not take a woman of very high calibre to improve on Mr Peter Knott, whose main contribution as a member of government has been to threaten to shoot local councillors. In Throsby, a mature spinster may be an appropriate replacement for Mr Hollis, whose record in every sense, particularly his record number of overseas trips, is less than satisfactory. Now, while the Liberal Party has plenty to be proud about when it comes to the promotion of women in politics, Certainly, there is a long way to go and there is much improvement to be made. And I have to recognise that and concede it and say I would, hope, I would hope that one of the results of this kind of debate is that more women, more women will be selected in winnable seats by both parties. By both parties. Now, the Liberal Party believes in equal opportunity in our society and the presence of women in all spheres of politics is necessary to legitimise this belief.
and we believe it to be true and something we should support strongly, particularly on merit. And the extent to which women of merit are failing to get into the parliament is a matter of major concern. You do not resolve the problem, however, of merit by having quotas. But we do reject this tokenistic solution being peddled by our opponents, in particular these proposals to introduce a strict quota system for women, because such proposals are not only tokenistic, they are simplistic, counterproductive and demeaning to women. They are saying to women, you are sufficiently politically incompetent that you cannot get into a parliament without some kind of special deal. Now, while our opponents talk about quotas, we're getting on with the job. And I quote one example of what we are doing in New South Wales. An initiative of the Liberal Party's Women Council in New South Wales a few months ago was the publication of, of uh, uh, a document called Take Your Seats, which I must say which is very timely. This practical guide to help women seek pre-selection is yet another very practical and very public indication by the Liberal Party in New South Wales and by the state government, the Fay state government in New South Wales, of its commitment to enhance the status of women in that state. That's why uh, the state government created a separate ministry for the status and advancement of women, the first ministry of its type in Australia. Now, uh, this, uh, organ this body uh, provides, this ministry provides the government with high-level advice on a wide range of issues affecting women right across the state. A slight change of pace from Prime Minister Hawke's Office of Women, which, whose major contribution was to provide $11,000 for the left-handed curious uh, female surfboard uh, uh, inventor who had never learnt how to ride a surfboard. The Liberal Party, as I said, has much to be proud of in relation to women in politics, but there's clear room for improvement. But let's have a look at the state Labor opposition's record in New South Wales. On women, it's a giant embarrassment to him. That's why senior female MPs such as Jeanette McHugh have attacked this proposal as nothing but a joke and a ruse. Even Mr Carr's own shadow minister for women, Pam Allen, has described the proposals being pushed as a move by the right wing of the ALP to promote women who are, in her words, quotes, fairly compliant or cronies of head office. And that's what this is all about, this hypocritical nonsense from the Labor Party. And uh, you, let's remind people about uh, the abandonment of ALP pre-selection in Gosford in 1992, when Carr's male candidate was either strong, under strong threat from local women, a local woman, Anne Rees. Order. The, Order. The Honourable Order Senator's rubbish. time has you expired. Know nothing about the issues you discuss, and your ignorance That's is embarrassing to you. Quite obvious, Senator. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I'm I am saddened by the last contribution that we have just had, because what this You're debate should be about is not whether we're better than you. That is playing the boys' games for my sisters here. That is getting back into the arguments that are colouring and confusing the issue. What we have to say is that no, none of the major parties have a particularly good track record in women actually being in parliament. That is what the issue is. It's not the fact that you've got four on the, in the cabinet in New South Wales and we've only got two in the shadow cabinet. That shouldn't be a debating issue. What should be the issue and must be the issue is the fact that we both both parties need more women in parliament. We need more women in cabinet. It doesn't also apply and rest in parliament. It rests for everywhere else that women are involved. And let's not confuse the issue by playing these little boys' games of minds bigger than yours. That is not the sort of way that we should be looking at this particular debate. If the Liberal Party believe in equal opportunity, and if they don't they care for their women, why was it necessary for them to actually put out a document called Take Your Seats? I have to say that it is a very good document. It has a lot of good information for both male and female candidates. But if the Liberal Party cared so much about getting women into parliament and didn't 
and claim they have equal opportunity and they don't put impediments in the way, why was it necessary for them to put a document out so that they could assist the women to, when they are going to go for peace selection? They cannot answer that question because they recognise or fail to recognise that there is an impediment, that they have any problems. However, the women there obviously have. I would also like to draw members of the opposition back to an article that appeared in The Age on 16 September by Karen Middleton, in which she says, In 1944, Robert Menzies discovered he needed women. In securing support to create the Liberal Party, he struck a deal with the 40,000 members of the Women's National League in Victoria, assuring them that 50 per cent of executive positions at every level in the State Liberal Party would go to women in return for their support and their finances. The 50 per cent rule got there because it made good electoral sense at the time, and despite the party's general aversion to quotas for women, it is still there today. So that if anyone is being hypocritical, it is the Liberal Party, because for 50 years ago, and they're only 50 years old, 50 years ago they put it into their documentation and into their, their, their rules. They kindly forget that today. But just let us not get bogged down in the debate if we've got more in Parliament than you have. I am proud to be one of the two New South Wales right-wing senators out of the four, and I think the order, Liberal Party has to be, do better than that. It being 4.30, we move to the consideration of gen general business. The first uh, item of general business is government documents. I move to government document number one, returns of private interests of ministers and parliamentary secretaries, June 1994, adjourned debate on the motion of Senator Margetts. Move to document number two, Minister for Foreign Affairs, National Action Plan on Human Rights, Australia, report and accompanying paper by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Gareth Evans, adjourned debate on the motion of Senator Tambley. Document number three, Australian Land Transport Development Program, review of operations 1992-93, volume three, adjourned debate on the motion of Senator Panizza. Senator Margetts. Uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? President, could I uh, seek uh, that document number one be deferred? Sorry, belatedly. I seek leave to move that it be adjourned to a later date. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Is leave granted for Senator Margetts? There being no objection, leave is granted. Document number four, treaty number 12, exchange of letters con constituting an agreement with the United Kingdom relating to Nauru, done at Canberra on 24th of March 1994, adjourned debate on the motion of Senator Kemp. Document number five, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, subsistence to supermarket, food and agricultural transformation in Southeast Asia, report by the East Asia Analytical Unit. Senator Margetts. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. No objection, leave is granted. Document number six, National Board of Employment, Education and Training, Employment and Skills Formation Council, the shape of things to come, small business employment and skills. Senator Margetts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This report, The Shape of Things to Come, is welcome recognition of the importance of small business and the need to foster them. As the report shows, the majority of employment in Australia comes from small business. And as big com companies continue job shedding, more and more people will be involved in small business or will be self-employed. Some of the measures suggested here are important and have our support. Certainly programs to make some training available for owners, managers and workers in small business will be of help. The freely available publication of examples of other small businesses that have done well and the database idea is a good one. Recommendation 9, which suggests that the role of intermediaries such as accountants, banks, lawyers and other service providers should be examined and made more supportive of small business, seems a crucial task to, to engage in. On the other hand, there is an extremely heavy weighting on training and the assumption seems to be that, with, as with the unemployed, government training programs are all that is required to make small businesses go. The database idea is good. But it appears that the, record, the report recommends it essentially as a way of accessing or slotting into the right programs. In fact, the training industry appears to be the one heavy, heavily stimulated here, and there's some tie-in with the idea of privatising employment training and services functions carried out by DEET and the CES. There are other worrying recommendations. 
Recommendation 16 suggests that there should be another level of certification imposed upon society. Small businesses would have to qualify for certification as a small business. Recommendation 5 talks about setting benchmarks for best practice, and Recommendation 15 seems to be involved to involve picking winners. Recommendation 13 works on incorporating entrepreneurship into education to create desired small business. If this is the shape of things to come, I am for one of concerned enough to suggest that shape should be radically changed. While there is no requirement yet for small businesses to do various government training to take up any, or to take up any program, to make a requirement to do training sufficient to get a competency certificate in small business management simply puts another barrier or set of barriers between small business and any program meant to help. Another set of hoops to jump through at a time when small business already complains about the level of bureaucracy they must contend with. It seems that government has decided to be heavily paternalistic, not only assist but will also direct small business, one of the few places where diversity and vitality are still allowed. This could be very positive. The database, for example, could be used to assist small business to connect with other small and medium enterprises that are potentially suppliers, customers and for cooperative arrangements. We could have seen some suggestions to, to move towards a less bureaucratic treatment of small business. We could have seen some major suggestions about the improve, improving the economic climate in which small business have to exist. This economic climate is one where it's very difficult for small businesses to access loans. It's expensive to rent properties. Very often they have to pay expensive overheads for things that don't, they don't need or use, for example, split water costs even though there's no tap or toilet on the premises. They also have to compete with large national and transnational corporations that may effectively dominate wholesale markets and are able to manipulate prices to the detriment of small businesses. There are often no means of bringing goods effectively to market at costs that are affordable to small business. There are numerous good ideas around, some of which small businesses are working at implementing themselves, sometimes over government resistance. The LET scheme, for example, and uh, one meaning for this acronym is Local Enterprise uh, Trading Scheme, others is the Local Energy Transfer S System. But uh, no matter what the acronym specifically means in a specific area, this is where small businesses can get resources or services through direct exchanges where cash is short. The government actively resisted this until recently, when the Minister for Social Security began to realise how much genuine good the system did for the battlers. Likewise, there's no reason why we could not implement a Grameen Bank-style scheme to help small businesses to get access to capital. The Grameen style bank is where a number of uh, borrowers, small borrowers, can, can join together and each of them serves to guarantee uh, the repayment of loan from others in the group. This has worked very well in other countries and especially in developing countries. There are a number of ways we could positively act to create viable, diverse and creative local economies with small business as a basis. They would require a certain amount of political will and reversal of government policy. It's a shame such ideas are not found in this report. One of the I, one of the Order. The Honourable Senator's time has expired. Senator Bone. Acting Deputy President, I uh, want to support Senator Margetts and the great bulk of what she had to say, uh, particularly the points she made uh, about uh, the risk of too much bureaucracy uh, intervening in this area of small business in, uh, in governmental uh, support, uh, particularly in terms of basic skills and so on. Uh, and also, uh, I must say, I. Uh, accept her view that uh, access to finance uh, appears to, in many instances, to be uh, uh, discriminatory uh, in, its, uh, in, uh, in relation to small business. The important thing we have to recognise is that small business is not a small part of the Australian economy. There are over 780,000 non-agricultural private sector businesses in Australia. I mention non-agricultural because, of course, uh, uh, all family farms are, uh, are uh, uh, small businesses uh, and th their number would, uh, would enormously boost uh, this, uh, this figure we have here. But 96% or, uh, or 757,000 of these private sector businesses in Australia are small businesses. 
These uh, firms employ 2.57 million people, or about 51 per cent of the non-agricultural private sector workforce, and contribute almost 30 per cent of Australia's gross domestic product. So they are obviously uh, a very, very important uh, part of our economy. A substantial proportion of these businesses, that's about 55 per cent, I think it's 418,000, are self-employed people. Which don't employ anyone. <coughs> Uh, and are, or are working proprietors and partnerships. Together uh, they account uh, for something like 801,000 uh, people. A further 212,000 firms, that's 22 per cent, employ fewer than five people. So they're very, very personal, small businesses. And this is uh, an area where so many Australians feel they and should have the right to have a go to try to be their own person, to make their own contribution. And this is the area where, in fact, there have been in the past the greatest number of failures, the greatest number of problems, and during the recession we had to have uh, an excessive number of families and their livelihoods destroyed. Uh, there's no doubt that improved skill levels are an important element in improving the situation. And the report notes that there are some positive signs that the average level of skills among small business owner managers are on the rise and that small business recognition of the need for continuing skills development is also increasing and that small business owner managers also appear to have a positive attitude to employing people with post-school qualifications. And I say that I'm strongly in support uh, of uh, those moves. Uh, I believe that this report is one that uh, merits serious attention. Uh, and I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Move to paper number seven, Official Establishments Trust, report for 1993-94. Adjourn debate on the motion of Senator Kemp. Senator McGoran? No. <laughs> Senator Bain? I move the debate be adjourned. The question is the debate be adjourned. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. Paper number eight, Commonwealth Grants Commission, report for 1993-94. Paper number nine, advance the Minister for Finance, statement, August 1994. Distracting Senator Bone. Um, I move uh, the Senate take note of this paper. Uh, the, uh, it's interesting to note here, and I just raise this as a problem that has to be resolved, interesting to note that one of the uh, items in the Advanced Minister for Finance totals $167, $167, that's all. Now I don't know what the administrative cost of putting this item up would have been, but I imagine it would run into thousands of dollars. The bureaucratic work involved. Uh, the processing in this place and so on. Now it seems to me that that is a silly system. Uh, a, uh, a, a private sector operation would have a thing called petty cash. And I presume when you're talking about billions of dollars as we are in this place, it seems dopey that we have the same sort of forms to go through for $167 as we would if it was $167 million. Now, surely we can improve the system. Let's see exactly what this was. This payment is required to compensate Mr Jonathan Cole for the amount of $167.33. I'm sorry, I omitted the 33 cents. Mr Cole received incorrect advice from departmental officers regarding his entitlement under Ostudy. He was informed that he was entitled to receive both the Ostudy Independent Living Allowance and the Ostudy Dependent Spouse Allowance. The Act of Grace payment, which this is, was approved by the Secretary for DEET on the 24th of February 1994. I remind you that this has now come up in the August 1994 uh, supplement uh, uh, application for the uh, advances for the Minister for Finance. Um, Mr Cole will be compensated for nine days' payment of the Ostudy Independent Living Allowance. This was on the basis that he had reasonable grounds to believe that he was entitled to it and was financially disadvantaged through not receiving it. 
it was not understood at the time that the secretary approved the payment that it was necessary to it was not understood at the time that the secretary approved the uh, payment that it was necessary to arrange for additional funds to be appropriated consequently the appropriation of funds was not dealt with within the budget context and accordingly the amf is sought on the grounds of erroneously omitted the payment is considered urgent because it is the commonwealth's policy to pay its accounts in the due date the Commonwealth's standard terms of payments are 30 days. As there is no other source of funds to meet this payment, the amount of $167,000 is urgently required from the AMF. Well, I mean, apart from the general question of I wonder why it took uh, from February till August to actually pay uh, this person what he was entitled to, allegedly within 30 days, apart from that, I must say I think we have to call on the Ministry for Finance, the government, the minister to find out ways of improving the procedure, because it is an absolute nonsense, a waste of time and money, and I guess the fact that I've been taking up the time of the Senate pointing it out is even a further waste of time and money. Uh, on that basis, I'll sit down. Paper number 10, advanced to the Minister for Finance, supporting applications of issues, August 1994. Paper number 11, Office of the Official Secretary to the Governor-General, report for 1993-94. Paper number 12, Census of Population and Housing, press release by the Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer, the Honourable Paul Elliott MP. Paper number 13, Trademarks, Regulations, Exposure Draft. Clark. General Business Notice of Motion Number 1068, standing in the name of Senator Spindler in relation to child uh, employment. Senator Spindler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, before I move the motion and speak on it, I seek leave to amend uh, my General Business Notice of Motion Number 1068 in one of its paragraphs. Is leave granted? There being no Objection leave is granted. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move uh, the following amendment. Omit paragraph B, beginning calls on the Australian Government to enact legislation and substitute the following statement uh, as paragraph B. Calls on the Australian Government to examine the feasibility of legislation to prohibit the importation of goods produced by child labour consistent with its commitment under the Convention on the Rights of the Child and to report to the Senate during the sitting week commencing 7th of November 1994. Senator Spindler. Amendment, Mr. President. Should the vote be taken on the amendment now? You've moved that uh, motion as an amended motion by leave, so you can just proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, Second Deputy President, let me begin then by quoting a report from the Chicago Tribune of uh, December 10, 1991, and I quote, Police recently raided a Bangkok sweatshop that produces paper cups and rescued 31 children who had been locked in a small room. Not one of them was older than 13. A shocked police officer said, the weeping children clung to the legs of his officers. They were emaciated and suffering from malnutrition. They had been beaten so badly that most needed to be carried to freedom. Many had skin diseases. They told of being threshed if they failed to make 700 paper cups a day by hand. Police suspect that to keep them awake during sadistically long work days, the owner gave them amphetamine tablets. One 13-year-old told police he had been beaten unconscious twice when he tried to escape. Now, it would be easy to stand here and recite horror stories, one after another, about child labour exploitation in third world countries. Examples such as the one I've just given are not rare, and that example only related to 31 children. But the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions estimates that between 100 and 200 million of the world's children 
between the ages of four and 15 are, and I quote, laboring in mines, making matches, selling gum in the streets, cooking, washing clothes, working as domestic servants, weaving carpets, making clothes, sewing underwear, and working in the fields, at the plantations, and on building sites around the world. 200 million children who are being robbed of their childhood and suffering appalling conditions, much of it, let it be said, in the employ of Western multinationals. It would be easy, Mr. Acting Deputy President, as I said, simply to stand here and recount these horror stories. One might think that doing that would be enough to shame our government into action. However, on Tuesday, when I asked the Minister for Trade about child labour, he acknowledged the problem. He said, and I quote, we recognise that the problem of child labour exists in our region. So to recount horror stories would serve no purpose. The government does acknowledge the problem, but still refuses to take action. And that bears repeating. The government acknowledges the obscene exploitation of children in factories in our region, but it still refuses to take action. It will not restrict imports produced using child labour. It will not legislate to control the behaviour of Australian firms operating offshore in their treatment of labour. And it continues to push its economic rationalist trade deregulation agenda, both at GATT and in APEC, without demanding the inclusion of social clauses to protect workers and the environment. Not only does the government not take action against child labour exploitation in other countries, not only does it refuse to legislate to ensure at least that Australian consumers and firms do not inadvertently support such practices, but it continues to pursue a trade agenda in international forums which blindly ignores that child labour exploitation is an inevitable consequence of so-called free trade. Now that freedom, that unrestrained freedom uh, for, the, uh, for the work that is being carried out extends to freedom to mistreat and to exploit the most vulnerable human beings in our region. What are the reasons given for the government's failure to act? Apart from Senator McMahon's accusations in his response to my question on Tuesday that I was proposing feel-good measures, he advanced a number of rationalizations of his government's appalling failure to act. So rather than recite horror stories, it would be more productive uh, to address those rationalizations. Firstly, let me quote a report from the Sydney Morning Herald of the 18th of August 94, and I quote, the President of the ACTU, Mr. Martin Ferguson, called on the federal government to take a stronger line on Australian companies not observing basic workers' rights and international labour conventions overseas. I think the Commonwealth Government should be more aggressive on these issues, Mr. Ferguson said. I trust Senator McMullen phoned Mr. Ferguson uh, after that question and told him that his suggestions were also, as he said to me, half-cocked and feel good. In his first words to answer my question on Tuesday, Senator McMahon expressed puzzlement that I referred to the passage of legislation against child sex exploitation, saying that he couldn't see how that added to the debate. The point is, the Australian Parliament has now set a precedent. It has taken the view that it has a responsibility to control the behaviour of Australians abroad where that behaviour is exploitative and obscene. Well, it is no less obscene for children to be beaten senseless and fed amphetamines to keep them working 14 hours a day in dangerous and unhealthy conditions for a pittance than for them to be exploited for perverted sexual gratification. Why then can we not legislate to control the behaviour of Australian firms overseas. One of the direct results of the government's trade liberalisation agenda is that Australian firms are increasingly under pressure to relocate production offshore so that they can remain cost competitive. Like it or not, this means that some Australian firms, perhaps inadvertently or unknowingly, 
are supporting or sanctioning child labour exploitation, if not directly, then through subcontractors which they use. The quintupling of the rate of, rate of Australian investments offshore over the last four years, which Senator Cook, in answer to another of my questions in this chamber, cited as a healthy trend, may in fact be contributing to one of the world's greatest human tragedies. As the member for Wills has said in the other place, pimp or factory owner, what's the difference? Until we legislate, the difference is that an Australian who exploits children for sex offshore faces up to 17 years in prison, Acting Deputy President, while an Australian who exploits children as factory fodder offshore gets increased profits. The second argument for obscene inaction advanced by Senator McMullen on Tuesday was that child labour was, and I quote, fundamentally a result of poverty. He argued against trade sanctions, and I quote, which will do nothing to reduce the level of poverty in the country and may make it worse. Senator McMullen would have more credibility taking this line if the government's record on aid matters were not so disgraceful. Our aid budget has fallen from 0.5% of GDP in 1983, when Labour took office, and is now at 0.34% of GDP. The government one, government's one strongly stated commitment to increasing that ratio to the UN target of 0.7% gets expressed more fuzzily and more half-heartedly every time we hear it. Within that aid budget, despite continuing pressure from the non-government organisations community, more and more of it is addressed at programmes focused on generating commercial returns to Australia rather than poverty alleviation in third world countries. The most direct impact we could have on child labour through the aid budget would be to support primary education. Primary education combined with free school food has been shown in many surveys to keep children out of the workforce. Yet instead of the roughly $200 million a year spent on education in the aid budget, over 90% goes on tertiary education and most of it aid aimed at the rich uh, to uh, get them to attend our, and therefore support our own universities. One should ask the question, how many scholarships for poor and disadvantaged school children and students have we funded through our aid programme? It is also fallacious for Senator McMullen to argue that acting against child labour might worsen poverty. As pointed out in the Far Eastern Economic Review, on July 9, 1992, and I quote, the tiny wages actually drawn by the children make little difference to family income. Child workers not only seem to displace the adult workers, but also seem to depress the incomes of adults doing similar work. In other words, failing to take action may worsen the, po the poverty. Senator McMullen's argument is also weak when you consider the extent to which multinational firms are involved in child exploitation. It is not as if these companies cannot afford to hire adult workers or pay decent wages. By letting them continue to exploit child labour, we actually facilitate greater appropriation of labour value added by Western capitalists and consumers we help them to rip off developing countries and keep the third world in poverty. Demanding that these firms pay a fair wage for adult labour is one of the best ways to fight poverty in developing countries. Now that's two of the arguments Senator McMullen used. Let's look at the next one. He argued that we shouldn't take action against some imports which we know use child labour because we can't identify all the offenders. And I quote, so the people who are good at disguising their obnoxious behaviour should continue to trade with us, but not the ones who do it so openly, he exclaimed. All I can say is that I'm glad he's not the Minister for Justice. Since we can't catch all the murderers and rapists, should we let the ones we do know go, go, about, 
go scot-free. Senator McMullen also argues that it would be extremely difficult to identify goods that are produced with child labour. For one thing, he's not right. International networks do exist, and organisations such as the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions undertake inspections and report on instances of child labour exploitation. Even if he were right, does the difficulty of catching a crook justify letting him or her get away with murder? There are many Australians who are sickened by child labour practices. Few, if any, would knowingly support such practices by buying products based on the destruction of a child's life. They don't want to buy such products. How much harder will it be for individual consumers to identify products than for the government? Obviously, very much harder. The government has a responsibility to prevent Australian consumers becoming unwitting accomplices to the crime of child labour exploitation. The difficulties with uh, identifying offences and offenders in the sex tourism uh, area has not prevented us from passing le legislation directed at uh, combating that particular obnoxious practice. And we do have anti-dumping legislation uh, where we need to identify producers, where we need to identify the costs of their production, where we need to identify the products that are being dumped uh, on our uh, markets. Uh, and yet, that information is not only obtainable, it is being obtained on a regular basis. So I don't think the argument that it is difficult to identify the products and to identify the origin cuts much water. The last argument Senator McMullen put to defend the gutless election of his government was an assertion that it will have to be a multilateral solution. It cannot be a bilateral solution. If by multilateral solution he means continual international talk fests where everyone stands up and denounces child labour exploitation but no one actually does anything, then I have my doubts. Senator McMullen said, and I quote, we are trying very hard to work on improving labour standards in our region through our support for the ILO in Asia, through our tripartite government, union and employer delegations. But what, Madam Acting Deputy President, have we actually done except talk about the issue and maybe exhort foreign governments? Do we expect a gale of hot air blowing up through Southeast Asia from down south to be enough to beat down practices which are exploiting millions of children? Sociologist Jewell has made it very clear the main impetus for change comes from implicit threats of import bans by consumer countries. This is even recognised in the countries threatened by such sanctions. In the Indian Express, in an editorial on February 1, 1994, it was stated, and I quote, the only piece of legislation on child labour that seems to have had a wholesome effect in India is ironically the Child Labour Deterrence Act introduced into the United States Senate by Tom Harkin. That bill proposed the establishment of a labelling system where products guaranteed as being made without child labour will be sheltered from restrictions. Even before this bill was debated in the United States Congress, the Bangladesh Textile Exporting Industry Association had put increased pressure on its affiliates to clean up their factories and their practices. The biggest impact of the debate generated by such legislation is the pressure it puts on multinationals. They will take action, they will respond if their markets, if their sales are threatened. Firms like Levy's and IKEA have taken internal action to see that child labour does not occur in their production lines or at the subcontractor level. The potential brand name damage that could be done to such companies by failing to qualify for a guaranteed free from child labour label is a, <coughs> is a tremendous force for change. But it will only follow if uh, legislation exists that is directed towards keeping such products 
out of our markets. Bilateral action is possible and is effective. The Americans insisted upon, and actually got, a side agreement, a so-called side agreement with Mexico on environmental standards as part of the NAFTA negotiations. Why can we not insist upon similar social clauses in any trade liberalization agreements arising out of APEC negotiations? Why can we not push for side agreements on child labor? On the 25th of November 93, I gave notice of a motion calling on the government to establish an APEC International Social and Ecological Development Authority Advisory Committee to look at issues such as this. What has the government done about it? I suspect the answer is nothing. The government's trade deregulation agenda for APEC might lead to gains from trade for all and a general rise in living standards and working conditions. But it may also lead to a race to the bottom as countries compete to become lowest cost producers by slashing labor and environmental standards. In this scenario, investment will be attracted by regimes which offer cheap labor and minimal interference. Such a driving down of standards would hurt even Australia. Indeed, the growth of a sweatshop outworker industry in Melbourne, as detailed by Paul Heinrichs in a series of articles in The Age recently, demonstrates that it is already happening. Now, either of these outcomes is possible. Trade can bring plenty or poverty. We, Madam Acting Deputy President, have to push for trade regimes that raise standards rather than lower them. And that means insisting on social clauses in any trade deregulation agreements. This is not neo-protectionism, as Prime Minister Goh of Singapore claimed recently, but a real concern for workers in developing and developed countries alike and for the children in particular in these countries. There really is no excuse for inaction. Pursuing multilateral solutions is commendable, but it is not enough. We support the call by the ACTU for social clauses to be included in GATT, but to wait for multilateral sanction may be like waiting for Godot. ILO Convention No. 5, from as long ago as 1919, called for a minimum age in industry. Now, where are the enforcement provisions? Someone has to go first. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, we wouldn't be first. Tom Harkin in the United States was first. He showed us the way, so why don't we take similar actions? International restrictions on trade in goods made from child labor must start somewhere. If Australia imposes such restrictions, others are more likely to follow. If every country self-interestedly says it is too hard to take action, as Senator McMullen does, then 200 million children around the world will continue to suffer, including an additional 80,000 who are estimated to start work every day. Without sanctions, child labor will always be attractive to unscrupulous employers. Children are easier to discipline, and children can be forced to accept hazardous working conditions. They're also, of course, cheaper to employ. The uh, International Council of Free Trade Unions reports that in Nepal, children in the carpet industry are often not paid at all. That certainly doesn't do much for poverty. The only cost to the employer is when they buy the children from their parents. Now, this is just obscenely wrong, and right and wrong should not wait on collective decision-making, getting everybody under a head. Australia's, Australia's failure to take action is no less wrong if no other countries are taking action. I think this is an issue, Madam Acting Deputy President, where Australia should lead, where Australia should act unilaterally as, in fact, Australia has acted unilaterally to reduce uh, tariffs. The Australian Democrats do call on the government to act now 
and to take substantive, tangible action rather than limiting themselves to going tut-tut at international meetings of bureaucrats. We demand action to restrict imports made from child labour, introduction of a labelling system to identify imports guaranteed free from child labour, legislation to ensure Australian companies operating offshore meet minimum standards in employee working conditions. Australia to take a lead role in the negotiation of social clauses as part of GATT. Australia to take a lead role in ensuring that any APEC trade liberalisation agreement include social clauses addressing labour rights and the environment. Immediate establishment of an APEC International Social and Ecological Development Authority Advisory Committee to advise the Prime Minister on social and ecological issues which should be addressed in Australia and in the region as a result of initiatives taken by participating countries in the area of trade, finance and industry. And to underpin it all, the Government should, at long last, after being two years late, discharge its obligation to provide a progress report to the United Nations on the degree of implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Australia should not be importing goods that have the blood of children on them. Immediate action is imperative. When I'm making Deputy President, in amending Clause B, I've suggested that the Australian Government uh, investigate the feasibility of some of these measures that I've been suggesting. And I've suggested that uh, uh, the government report to the Senate in the week starting November the 7th. No one is denying that some of the measures I'm suggesting uh, are difficult to implement, that uh, there are uh, challenges that we must investigate, challenges that we must meet. Uh, but what I'm asking the government to do is to start the process, to collect the information, to investigate it, and to do it, to do it in the spirit that what we are witnessing and what we are part of, whether we like it or not, is simply not acceptable for a decent, civilized nation. When making Deputy President, I will be returning with some closing remarks before the vote. Um, before we uh, call the next speaker, you have moved an amendment. Is that correct? Would, could you circulate it, please? I'll arrange for that. Thank you. Senator Lusley. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. I, uh, I rise to move a further amendment to uh, Senator Spindler's proposition, which I understand has been uh, circulated in the, uh, the chamber and is now uh, subject to, uh, to discussion. I don't think uh, anyone disagrees with Senator Spindler, Madam Acting Deputy President, to the extent that there is a major problem. It is a problem of obscene proportions. It is a problem on a scale that uh, requires concerted international action at a number of levels. I think where uh, Senator Spindler and uh, perhaps the government uh, disagrees is on a, the question of uh, the means to effectively address the problem and the best way of ensuring that the problem is not only identified but addressed and solutions can be found. So I don't think we uh, disagree for one moment on the intolerable situation that is apparent in a number of countries, both in the region and more broadly in respect of the exploitation of children. There is a reality and it is a very real concern. I think, therefore, that it's a question simply for debating this afternoon of how definite results might be accomplished. And I say in my view, and I believe in the view of the, the government, it's a question that requires concerted international action. And could I use it as an example, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, one with which you'd be only too familiar, and that is the concerted international campaign to dissolve apartheid in South Africa. That could not be achieved bilaterally it could not be achieved by unilateral action on the part of uh, countries, however well-intentioned, and I refer to Canada, India as, as well as Australia. It required concerted international action. You take a circumstance such as the continuing human rights abuses in Burma, 
where Australia has continually urged multilateral action. It's only been a very recent time that the uh, ASEAN post-ministerial consultations that Australia could achieve broad agreement on a uh, range of policy propositions that could actually be directed to ensuring that uh, change could be effected in that, uh, in that country. So I think the experience is there. And I take issue with Senator Spindler to the extent that uh, he tended to brush aside the issue of concealment. That's very real, because no one should be under any doubt that concealment of this obscene trade is intrinsic to its continuation. It's intrinsic to it flourishing. Where it's identified, where it's exposed, then measures can be taken. International pressure can be applied. It can be brought to an end. Concealment is absolutely central to the continuation of the abuse of youngsters. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, bearing those remarks in mind, I wish to move the uh, further amendment that's been distributed in the chamber, uh, and I hope uh, Senator Spindler has now seen a copy, to replace item two in his amended proposition with the words, calls on the Australian government to continue to play an active role in developing within the international community effective measures to eliminate such exploitation of children and ask the government to report to the Senate during the sitting week starting November 7 on effective action the Australian government can take to give effect to the concerns of the Australian people on this matter. So I think there's a fairly narrow area of disagreement between the propositions amended by Senator Spindler and the amendment which I'm moving on behalf of the government. And I underline the use of the word effective because it may in fact be, Madam Acting Deputy President, that a simple legislative approach turns out to be too narrow. There may well be other means that may be adopted in concert with the trade union movement, in concert with the business community, in concert with the media, through multilateral agencies and the like, international pressure, whereby more can be achieved than simply carrying a law in Australia. I should uh, stress, Madam Acting Deputy President, Australia is a strong supporter of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We were, in fact, closely involved in the development of the convention itself. It was adopted, of course, in 1989, and we ratified the convention a little over a year later in September of 1990. The task that's before us now, of course, is to translate that into concrete action. The convention imposes an obligation on the parties to it to take such legislative and other action with respect to children within their own jurisdiction as is appropriate to bring an end to the kinds of abuses which we are debating this afternoon. And obviously, the government is totally committed to that. We're also concerned, though, more broadly, with abuses of children wherever such abuses occur internationally. But I reinforce Senator McMullen's observation at question time yesterday. The key to a responsible approach on this matter is not a matter of feeling good about what we say about our rhetoric. It's a matter of actually achieving good, of actually seeing concrete accomplishment. Now, the government is taking particular steps to support the improvement of labour conditions in our region. Obviously, that has to be a priority, and it is, including those circumstances which pertain to child labour through a number of programs, but in particular the Australian support for ILO objectives in Asia, the ASILO program. In Vietnam, for example, the program is directed to strengthening the relationship between labour laws and practices with an aim to ratifying international labour conventions on workplace safety, developing industrial hygiene practices, introducing industrial relations practices more generally and strengthening worker bodies, legitimate worker bodies. In Indonesia, for example, there's a Memorandum of Understanding on Cooperation on Industrial Relations issues signed in 1993 to provide a framework for cooperation on issues affecting child labour. And that's a matter where there's been a positive response. Now, from my own perspective, I have much sympathy with the concept of introducing the social clause into the new world trading arrangements, particularly clauses related to labour standards and to environmental measures. I say that uh, quite openly. But I don't simply dismiss Prime Minister Goh's remarks the other night that that clause 
potentially may well be exploited by neo-protectionists, that it may well prove to be a weapon by protectionists operating under a new guise. I support the clause, but I think we need to be careful about the manner in which people may seek to use it for ends not consistent with the spirit with which it's being argued currently. Senator Spindler also tended to brush aside the absolutely key concept of poverty. And there is no doubt in my mind that there was more than a grain of truth in Senator McMullen's observation about poverty alleviation being an absolutely crucial response to reducing the problems of child labour abuses, of appalling conditions for children working in plants currently, particularly in our region. Now, poverty alleviation is a key objective of the Australian aid program in promoting sustainable economic and social advancement of people in developing countries, particularly those vulnerable groups, including women and children. The Australian government's program includes support for activities which expand the range of employment income earning opportunities, as well as measures which build human resource and institutional capacities across all sec sectors of society, particularly in respect of health and education. I'll just give a couple of, uh, of, of examples to advance the argument in the chamber this afternoon. In partner countries, for example, basic education for children and adults is a priority area as identified by UNICEF. Total expenditure on primary and secondary education activities through the aid program in 1992-93 was the order of $15.5 million. Another program involves support for an income generating project in Thailand implemented by ECPAT, End Child Prostitution and Asian Tourism, through the small assistance scheme administered by our embassy in Bangkok. Further program involves a current assessment of a lar larger, longer term ECPAT project through its Southeast Asia regional program aimed at ending, at eliminating child prostitution in Asia. I can think of a few more worthwhile examples, Madam Acting Deputy President. I don't think it's in question that Australia is a strong supporter of key ILO conventions pertaining to child labour, freedom from forced or compulsory labour, freedom of association, freedom from discrimination, the right to organise and to bargain collectively, and to certain absolute minimum working conditions. Currently, the government is consulting with the states and territories as a matter of priority so that we can proceed to ratification of the ILO's minimum age convention, number 138, which deals with the issue of child labour comprehensively. Now, that's a concrete example of the kind of action that we have taken and are taking. Australia looks, Madam Acting Deputy President, with good reason to the international labour organisations having the central role in strengthening adherence to internationally recognised labour standards and supports, continually supports proposals to make the ILO more effective, not only in our region but globally. With regard to child labour, Australia is monitoring the ILO International Program on the Elimination of Child Labour, IPEC, which was launched in 1992. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, IPEC mobilises at grassroots the forces best placed to translate ILO principles into practice. Governments, employers, worker and non-government organisations working in the field. The government is currently considering means by which it can contribute to the program. The measures include support for efforts to put an end to intolerable situations such as the employment of children who are very young or in hazardous occupations or working under slavery conditions. And Senator Spindler, could I add a personal note by saying I was very moved by the report that you read from the Chicago Tribune? I doubt any senator in this place could not have failed to have been moved. That is an absolute disgrace that in 1994 on this planet such things occur, regardless of where they occur. But again, it comes back, in my view, to the best means of addressing the problem. But in terms of IPEC, the Australian government currently is also looking at information and awareness measures to try and change attitudes and behavioural patterns and the effective ways that that might be accomplished. The further measures which, without explicitly targeting child labour, nonetheless act very directly on the underlying causes 
unemployment, poverty, inadequate social protection and educational systems, and passive acceptance in the host countries of this appalling problem. I think it's fair to say that programs already in place, and to which reference was made a little earlier, have already served to contribute to the aims of IPEC and the government intends to contribute further. The Australian government, Madam Acting Deputy President, supports the improvement of labour standards in our region, including those pertaining to child labour through a number of other programs, and in particular one to which I referred very early in my remarks, the Australian support for ILO objectives in Asia, the ASILO program. This program began in 1993 with over a million dollars committed to activities in China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam. It's a project with a tripartite basis with resources drawn from the ACTU and the Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce. In Vietnam, as I've said, there are endeavours already underway. In Indonesia as well. But taking a broader perspective in China, the program is directed at strengthening China's ability to implement the provisions of conventions relating to construction safety, developing industrial hygiene practices and normalising industrial relations practices in a general sense. In Malaysia, on the other hand, the program is directed at strengthening Malaysia's capacity to address issues of chemical safety and occupational health and safety, as well as structures for remuneration and productivity-based wages. In Thailand, similarly, the program addresses issues of industrial hygiene and occupational health and safety. These are concrete steps in place. The important point in such cooperative programs is that they greatly enhance the access and influence of Australian labour practitioners and from that greater acceptance of a range of labour-related issues, including moves to abolish unacceptable child labour practices. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll conclude my remarks on this note, the note with which I began. I doubt anyone in the chamber would argue that Senator Spindler is wrong to raise the issue and to canvass it comprehensively in the chamber this afternoon. There is no doubt that the debate is necessary and focuses on a very real concern. But in terms of a response, a comprehensive response is what we require. That's why I believe the amendment which I've moved on behalf of the government is a better way of the Senate seeking to address the problem of having the government, as Senator Spindler asked, come back by November the 7th with propositions on how effectively we in Australia might respond, not simply focusing on the aspect of legislation, but within the context of a range of measures, including legislation, come back and say in the chamber, the nature of the problem is such, the scale of the problem is such, it requires a comprehensive answer and thereby make specific recommendations to the Senate. For that reason, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I commend the proposition which I've moved by way of amendment this afternoon to the Chamber. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> Senator Spindler has raised a topic of importance today and uh, Clay asking that the Senate reaffirm Australia's position to the economic export opposition sorry, to the economic exploitation of children and recognises the right of the child to be protected from economic exploitation and for performing work which is hazardous or interferes with the child's education or harmful to the child's health or physical, mental, spiritual, moral or social development. Now, as Senator Loosley has said, I don't think anybody in this chamber would disagree with the uh, sentiments in Senator Spindler's motion. Nobody, irrespective, nobody in Australia, irrespective of whether we've signed an inter international convention or not, would, I believe, and I believe um, there'd be few Australians who would not support the sentiment of this motion that we abhor um, ex exploitation of children in any form, whether it be sexual exploitation or whether it be economic exploitation. And I'm sure that uh, we would go a long way to find somebody in Australia who may disagree with that statement. It's most probably the most pernicious form of child ab abuse, uh, child labour. It is to be condemned 
because it robs children of the building block of healthy and positive the building blocks of a healthy and positive adulthood when a child is forced into labor it means that that child is unable usually to experience the activities that we see young children here in Australia having opportunity to enjoy of playing of growing and of learning through play and all that is taken away when a child is forced into labour. And uh, I'm sure that uh, those of us in this chamber who are child psychologists, and there seem to be an ever increasing number of people who've had some experience in psychology, and especially in developmental psychology, coming into parliament, um, that each one of us, from our professional point of view, and I'm sure I don't want to speak for, for the um, acting deputy president, but I'm sure she would agree that that early part of childhood where a child plays and experiences freedom and the opportunity to enjoy life without having to work for, for no pay or for pay is a time when their adulthood and, and the building blocks of their adult life are being um, constructed. And I'm sure the parents would agree, but I'm sure Senator Zakharov would agree with me. I don't know, she hasn't nodded her head and she's not in a position to, but I'm sure if she was speaking on this she would agree with me that that period of, of life is a very important period for later development. Now, we may think that's a foregone conclusion, but when you read the literature, and you've only got to read uh, our own, our own uh, heritage, our own literature, to see that people didn't always believe that, that they thought that children were little adults and that they could work and it didn't have any effect on their later development. And it really was with hindsight and understanding about child development that we knew that it, wasn't, uh, it was important that children have love and uh, that they have also have the opportunity to do things like play because we learnt about what children learn through those activities. So it isn't something that we've always known and uh, it's always very easy to be critical of others when in fact in our own history and we only have to look at Dickens and we only have to look at some of the, uh, the uh, child labour that went on in Britain to know that even within our own culture that has happened. The Director General of the ILO, Michael Hansen, Hansen, has stated that childhood is a period of life which should be devoted not to work but to education and training. I'd add in there and to play. I would add to that that it should be a period when there is time and opportunity to grow physically, socially and emotionally and to play and enjoy a real childhood. I agree with the rest of his statement that, and I quote, child labour by its very nature and the working conditions in which it's carried out often compromises children's potential to become productive and useful adults in society. And finally, the use of child labour is not inevitable and progress towards its elimination is possible whenever there is political will to oppose it with determination. Millions of children are involved in child labour around the world and it would appear that the numbers are growing. There are millions of child lab bonded labourers, children who are kidnapped, to be imprisoned in sweatshops or brothels, millions who work unseen in domestic service, who are given or sold at a very early age to another family and often receive little or no pay and have no control over their lives. And in fact, in many cases, neither do their parents. Some of my colleagues, Senator Spindler and Senator Loosley, have outlined some cases of exploitation of child labour. but. Uh, in my uh, looking at this issue, I've located and read about children in poor rural families in, in some countries who, as young as six, are sold or given to better off families to work in involuntary servitude. I've read about, issue, about uh, cases in Thailand where there have been numerous allegations of wide, widespread use of forced child labour for labour intensive workshops and the child sex industry. And let me say to you that I was recently talking to somebody from, from, uh, from one of the Asian countries who said to me that as Thailand tightens up that we see um, some of the, the uh, sex tourism shifting to some other Asian countries where, where the rules are less tight. And so we see that uh, we have to be very vigilant that where one country tightens its rules we don't see the shift because um, of uh, the opportunity to exploit children uh, being available in other countries because their rules are less tight. In fact, one only has to read, and I can't remember the name of the book that I only read a couple of weeks ago, 
by an Irish woman who was a street child mm -hmm. in Dublin. I don't think there's anybody in the chamber who'll be able to maybe help me with the name of the book. But uh, she recently visited Australia, this woman, and she's been working in Vietnam. And you only have to read that story to hear some of the tragic cases of child exploita exploitation. She actually lives with homeless, lives and works amongst homeless children. She had a dream as a, as a young woman, um, and it's a very sad, very sad story. She was an abused, she was abused wife. She was a homeless child. She was an abused wife. She had a dream that she wanted to help children in Vietnam, and she believed that she could make that dream come true. She went to Vietnam with almost no money, and she finally convinced various authorities that she would set up um, facilities for homeless young, young children, in particular children of very young age. She's talking about four, five and six. And when you hear her talking about going and extracting children from hotels, at the age of four and five years when they've been in, enticed into that hotel room by people wanting to exploit those children, then you realise that it happens and it often is perpetrated by people not from the developing countries. So it happens and it shifts from one country to the other. If I could remember the name to recommend it to honourable senators, I'd love to because it was a, a very uh, salutary book. But we've seen, as I said, in, in Thailand, in rural areas, Thailand, in Thailand, child catchers and recruiters travel around taking children from poor families and at the same time certain shops in cities specialise in selling children and, and teenagers. Now in January 1992, the Thai government reported to the ILO that it had filed charges against the owner of a sweatshop in Bangkok where 31 workers between 9 and 20 were employed making paper cups and I think Senator Spindler referred to that, that example. And um, it was reported that some of the children were had been rescued and they'd been so badly beaten they could hardly walk. They'd all been forced to work 18 days sitting on a cement floor to fulfil their daily quota and that they were never allowed to leave the sweatshop. Now as Thailand, as I said, tightens up its uh, conditions of employment and especially those applying to children, then we may see, especially if they're uh, multinational corporations employing children, those multinational corporations exploiting children, possibly, or those people with uh, wealth who are, who are setting up companies, even people from those countries, moving to other countries where the rules are less tight. So, I, so what I'm saying is that we need to be uh, vigilant. Other stories that uh, one reads about are in Colombia of children as young as six working in coal mines. And Senator Spindler has uh, outlined examples of children working in carpet factories in Nepal and, uh, and, and in India. And one story, such story I was reading about a young, young boy of, um, when it would have been in 1991, of eight years of, old, uh, eight years of age in, in, in India, in the Bihar, in Bihar state, I was working as a cow herd for about 20 uh, rupees, about 78 US cents at that stage. And, uh, this uh, carpet manufacturer came along and, and, and there's a quote from the young boy, they told my father that uh, your son will get good clothing, good food, plus uh, 350 rupees a month. So his father said okay and uh, three of the children from that family went off to work. They spent the first two months without pay and if they were slow they were beaten uh, on the, uh, with sticks on the back and very hard and, and the young boy said they used to lock us up at night. After six months, the young boys got a letter out, got somebody who was literate they were working with to get a letter out to their father to tell them what was happening, to tell him that they weren't being paid. And the father came down and the carpet manufacturer said, look, we'll pay them in the long run. We'll pay, we'll pay them in two months and we'll send them back with their, with their pay. Well, that didn't ever happen and the boys escaped and they were picked up by a um, welfare organisation and actually under the... Um, legislation that now exists in India, uh, they were actually released. And the young boy, when he was uh, interviewed, said, asked what he wanted to do now after he'd been released, he said, I want to go to school. And so, I mean, that's just one example of where the parents were tricked into believing that they were going to, um, the children, the, these young people were going to be paid, whether or not they were paid or not, is another thing, but not only were they um, 
cajoled or the parents were cajoled into leaving and going into, into labour, into the workforce, they were not paid for that. So it's exploitation at its very worst form in that situation. In a study reported in the Far Eastern Economic Review uh, in July 1992, it reported, this study reported that children as young as six were working in appalling conditions in carpet factories and tea plantations in India, and that child weavers in India typically worked from 5am to 7pm with half an hour for lunch and would sometimes work till midnight. Payment was on a peace rate, food was normally watery, there was also a high incidence of TB, worm infestation, skin ulcers and enlarged lymph glands, and, and uh, physical and verbal abuse was routine. Now, I think we have to be very careful that we don't miss the moat in our own eye when we're looking at the splinter in our neighbour's eye. And I don't think that uh, child labour only occurs in developing countries. I believe if we were to uh, search, we would find examples in the developing companies as, countries as well, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and even, dare I say, Australia. We also need to be aware that some of this child labour can be uh, through, directly or indirectly, multinationals controlled by, uh, by Western countries who either wittingly or unwittingly could be involved in child labour. And that's where it places me in so with some problem with the Senator Spindler's uh, first motion was that it may, be not po it may not be possible because there may be hidden exploitation which we can't identify, and I think Senator Lucy referred to that. And uh, we can't always be sure that through legislation that we not import products that are made using child labour, that we may, in fact, through that process, uh, not purchase or not import some products, but other products would go unscathed, where in fact they are in a position to hide uh, child or exploitation of children in the processing of their product. What we have to try and do is to find other methods as well of indicating to the international community our view that the use of child labour and exploitation of children is totally unacceptable. Now, while I support the sentiment behind a move to prohibit importation of goods produced, produced by child labour, as I've indicated, it's not quite as easy to implement. And there are, it's difficult to police and uh, to police restrictions on importing goods produced by child labour, both in Australia and in the um, originating country. And in fact, one document I just read while I was preparing for this, and I claim not to be an expert on child, child labour and exploitation of children, and I, I'm glad that Senator Spindler has raised this because it, it draws my attention and makes me and my colleagues more aware of it. That, uh, in one country, uh, and I can't remember where I was reading it this afternoon, but so one of them said, well, look, let them bring in legislation, let them do this. We can tell them that we're not employing children and we can get away with it. And so what we, I guess we have to do is change the culture as well, that it is unacceptable worldwide to exploit children. I um, wish to say just um, uh, here that, as I said before, we can look at the, motor, the, the splinter in our neighbour's eye and not look at the motor in our, our own. And currently in Australia we have 70,000 young people homeless. We have acts of violence against young people in our country that I think would have been totally unknown in uh, our, the time in which we were growing up. And we have a youth unemployment rate which is totally unacceptable. So while we look at some of our neighbours and ask them to address some of the issues that they need to look at, we also need to call on our own government to look at some of the issues which are affecting young people in this country as well, because we, can, we, we stand condemned and this government stands condemned in the way it's dealt with our own youth, in the rates of homelessness, in the rate of violence against our, our children and, and in the rate of youth unemployment. Senator Spindler in reply. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank uh, both uh, Senator Loosley 
uh, and uh, Senator Kay Patterson for their contributions. Um, I'm particularly pleased that uh, uh, both speakers representing the government and the coalition parties uh, expressed uh, such strong support uh, to, for the basic issue that I've raised and for the need uh, to continue action to the extent that we have taken action, and it hasn't been much in the past, uh, but to determinedly now take urgent action to put an end to child exploitation. Now, uh, Senator Loosley, when he spoke, suggested that uh, the government would prefer uh, a different version of paragraph B of my motion. However, during the closing stages of uh, his speech, uh, the representatives of the government and the coalition parties and myself um, had a look at the wording uh, in an attempt uh, to get uh, a unanimous resolution from the Senate on this extremely important issue. Uh, we thought we shouldn't be, uh, be thwarted uh, in achieving that, uh, what I would say, a historic uh, agreement on the urgency of action to be taken by quibbling over a few words. And I'm happy to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, that we have arrived uh, at a version uh, that is acceptable to all parties, and uh, I seek leave now uh, to withdraw my earlier amendment that I have moved and to move uh, uh, this uh, amendment that has been agreed upon. I am advised the procedure is for Senator Loosley's amendment to be removed and then you move your amended motion. Uh, yes. So is, is that agreeable to Government? Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, um, seek the Senate to uh, to withdraw yeah, to with oh, sorry, I was just looking for it, to withdraw uh, the amendment uh, moved by Senator Loosley. Leave granted. No objection, leave is granted. Uh, and, and to indicate that we will be supporting the amended amendment of right. Senator Spindler. Uh, Senator Spindler, would now, you will now move your amend, amendment to the motion. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Having withdrawn my earlier motion, I now move uh, that paragraph B of my motion reads as follows, calls on the Australian government to play an active role in developing um, Effective, measure, effective, sorry, effective measures within the international community uh, to eliminate uh, exploitation of children and to examine the feasibility of legislation to prohibit the importation of goods produced by child labour and to report to the Senate during the sitting week commencing 7th November 1994. Okay. And I put Senator Spindler's motion, all those that, sir? And the, all right. I first put Senator Spindler's amendment. All those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. And I put the amended motion. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. General Business Notice of Motion Number 1077, standing in the name of Senator Woodley and way, re relating to World Heritage Wilderness of Hinchinbrook Island. Senator Woodley. Thank you, uh, Madam. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I wish to support very strongly the notice of motion which I moved some days ago relating to the development of Port Hinchinbrook. In my motion I mentioned two reports which I believe should be in the public domain. These two reports were the deed of agreement which would reveal that the Queensland Government is hell-bent on getting the Port Hinchinbrook development up and running. I suspect, in fact, that it is quite prepared to pursue a high-risk strategy, gambling with the conservation of world heritage values in order to get this development off the ground. I believe the role of the Queensland Government in this development needs to be fully exposed. The environmental assessment process has been a complete sham. It was taken out of the hands of the Department of Environment and Heritage 
and put into the hands of the Office of Coordinator General. The Office of Coordinator General is a fast-tracking unit. Its role, its proper role in some circumstances, is to promote development in Queensland. However, it perceives environmental laws as an obstacle to development. It is totally inappropriate for the Queensland Government to give responsibility for the environmental assessment of this project to a development agency rather than an environmental agency. Not only that, but the Office of Coordinator General is arrogant and even antagonistic towards conservation agencies. Let me give the Senate an example of this, and I quote from a document produced by the Office of Coordinator General in which they give reasons for the conflict between developers and the Wet Tropics Administration, and they make clear that their sympathies and support lie with development as defined by them. These are some of the criticisms which they level. The principal reason for the conflict outlined above is the fact that the authority, that, the, that is the Wet Tropics Administration, is a single purpose organisation. It focuses on its charter of rainforest preservation and feels no responsibility for economic development in the area. One aspect of its charter, the, presenta the, the presentation of the Wet Tropics Authority, could be viewed as compatible with promotion of the tourism industry in the Cairns reason, region. However, this task is pursued less energetically than are those of protection and conservation. While some authority members are far from extreme in their views on reasonable development projects, they are somewhat constrained in the action they can take since the authorities' charter says nothing about the economic development of the area. There are strong personalities on the authority with deeply committed anti-development beliefs who often manage to persuade other members to adopt their views on issues. The recruitment of staff for the agency has ensured that most are also prejudiced against development seeing themselves as having little or no responsibility for the strengthening of the economic base of the area. Well, if the, if the uh, Office of the Coordinator General has that attitude towards the environment and environmental agencies of the Queensland Government, it's little wonder that one would question their environmental credentials uh, in preparing the environmental report on the uh, Hinchinbrook area. The Office of Coordinator General took control of the Port Hinchinbrook assessment. It took staff and resources out of Molly Robson's office and put them into the Office of Coordinator General. The Queensland Environment Minister has been left out in the cold on this development, and I believe for deliberate reasons. The Office of Coordinator General, with input from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, has produced what has been called an environmental review report. This report is supposed to be an environmental impact assessment. I fear that it's a very poor imitation of such an assessment. Let me quote from the Federal Department of Environment, Sport and Territory's response to the Queensland Government's environmental, impact, uh, environmental report. The Commonwealth Environment Portfolio remains concerned about the project proceeding at this time as there is insufficient information to justify the need for the development and to properly assess its environmental impacts. The Federal Department was critical of the poor attempt at environmental assessment carried out by the Office of Coordinator General. It is indicative of the superficial regard they give to environmental concerns. The Federal Department re recommended that a statement of the natural and cultural values of the area should be prepared. It should include values <coughs> relating to world heritage and national estate significance, the importance of the area as habitat for endangered and migratory species, 
and the cultural relevance of the area to the local Aboriginal community. The Federal Department recommended that the statement should assist the Queensland authorities to prepare a more comprehensive impact assessment of the proposal. It would also fulfil more effectively the first undertaking of the letter of agreement between the Office of Coordinator General and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And let me quote part of that undertaking. The environmental impact assessment for the project will adequately take into account the possible impacts of the, that the project may have on the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Yet the Office of Coordinator General has done neither of these two things. Indeed, it has refused to develop a more comprehensive environmental assessment. It has refused to develop a statement of natural and cultural values. It has indeed, and instead, thumbed its nose at the federal government and proceeded with the finalisation of a deed of agreement between the Office of Coordinator General, the Cardwell Shire and the developer. The deed of agreement is a legal document which should have been prepared after the proposal was agreed to and after the publication of a full environmental impact assessment. I believe it is outrageous that the Queensland government has so flouted due process. Yesterday, Senator Macdonald questioned the integrity of Peter Valentine and the report he has produced for Sec Senator Faulkner. I must say that I fully support the comments made by Senator Reynolds concerning the qualifications and in international experience of Mr Valentine. I would like to question the assumptions made in the Loder and Bailey report. Page four of the report lists a set of assumptions made in that report. Let me quote again from their assumptions. For the purposes of this assessment, it was assumed that a high standard of environmental control and monitoring will be affected and that appropriate financial and human resources will be allocated with sufficient legal support to ensure that impacts, impacts are kept within the limits of acceptable change. And then again, Effective independent environmental auditing with real incentives stroke disincentives to ensure that it is not expedient or cheaper to accept impacts and pay a small fine. How can we assume that independent monitoring and auditing to a very high degree will be carried out when the assessment process is so flawed? Unfortunately, the Queensland Government has a history of choosing consultants who will tell it what it wants to hear. Given that, it is revealing that the Loder and Bailey report does, not, does state that a number of impacts will occur in the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. It's interesting that they are prepared to admit as much. They do uh, admit that, that there will be minimal direct impact on the values associated with the Great uh, Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, direct impact on national estate values, minimal direct impact on endangered and migratory species. There is a moderate risk of direct impact from the initial canal dredging operation and subsequent maintenance dredging operations. So given even their very narrow uh, framework in terms of reference, even the Queensland Government's report admits that there will be impacts, although it qualifies these only as minimal. The Goss government, I believe, has been deliberately irresponsible in managing this pro project. The environmental assessment should have been managed by the Department of Environment and Heritage, which was instead, I believe, frozen out of the process. The release of the Peter Valentine final report would reveal that there are serious concerns over world heritage values on account of this development. I call on the minister to release the report, along with the deed of agreement. The minister should approach the Premier of Queensland, who is responsible for the Office of Coordinator General, as it is the Office of Coordinator General which is making decisions on this matter, and not the Queensland Minister for the Environment 
Molly Robson. I commend the resolution to the Senate. Senator Reynolds. Madam uh, Deputy President, I think this evening we are debating an issue that is very, very important, not just for the environment in North Queensland at Cardwong, that is the Hinchinbrook area that we are debating, but there are principles at stake that seriously in this country we have to address in terms of environmental issues being decided on, on the best possible uh, basis of information so that we get solutions that combine federal, state and local government working together, rather than federal government deciding one way, state government deciding another, and poor old local government, as usual, uh, being left to effectively pick up the pieces. We are talking, remember, about world heritage. We are talking about an area that has very special values, not just at local, state or national level, but internationally. And the Australian government has ultimate responsibility for making the best possible decision to protect world heritage values. I'd like to quote uh, from uh, a book that was prepared by, um, uh, that was written and prepared by Arthur and Margaret Thorsburn. Now, the Thorsburns uh, are well known in North Queensland, well known in the Cardwell community, because they actually were responsible for, for opening up and gaining the understanding of many bushwalkers and many environment, environmentalists to the values of this very unique region. And I might just read some words of uh, Margaret uh, Thorsburn in opening up this, uh, my contribution to this debate. When we first vis visited Hinchinbrook in 1964, seeing another boat was a rare occurrence, and it was only on a few occasions that anyone else camped at the same time as we did. At that time, as the island first touched our lives, we felt secure in the discovery of a wild and beautiful world and gloried in the knowledge that as a national park, it would always be so. And I suppose what concerns many of us is how can we ensure that the values of, of Hinchinbrook, the, these very special now recognised world heritage values can be protected in the way that uh, our, um, Arthur and Margaret uh, Thorsburn first saw as so necessary as long ago as 1964. It is appropriate, I think, to raise at this time a book that was published uh, and launched this week. It's been quite a, a week for book launches. Uh, the Reluctant Na uh, Nation, Environment, Law and Politics in Australia by Philip Toyne. And I believe that Philip Toyne's uh, book is going to dramatically change and certainly influence the debate about the environment and environmental law practice uh, and the behaviour of local, state and federal government in this country uh, for many years to come. And it's going to be a very significant debate in uh, the coming uh, years. And I'd like to, to quote uh, from chapter one, and you'll wonder why this has anything to do with Hinchinbrook, but I hope you'll see that it does. Imagine for a moment that you are a green turtle trying to come to grips with Australia's constitutional arrangements. You are a female swimming in international waters, but heading for an island on the Great Barrier Reef to lay your eggs. You enter Australia's exclusive economic zone, 200 miles off the coast. You enter Australia's national waters, 12 miles off the coast. As you approach the reef, you enter the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, which is the joint responsibility of the Commonwealth and Queensland governments. While in the sea of the marine park approaching the island, the waters are Commonwealth, unless of course you are within three miles of the coastline, but outside the park, in which case you are in state waters. But once you climb slowly onto the sand and above the low water mark, you come under the jurisdiction of Queensland. You would need to be a very astute turtle to work out which law is responsible for your protection. 
because the Commonwealth and Queensland have different opinions regarding the definition of low water in relation to an island on a coral reef. This complexity is not unique to the Australian Sea, to Queensland or indeed to turtles, but it is a reflection of the extraordinary system of federalism that we have in Australia where powers are reluctantly surrendered by the states and assumed by the Commonwealth. And obviously, that, that introduction uh, to Philip Toyne's book, I think, highlights the complexity of the debate that we are having in relation to, the, uh, to whether or not, or indeed in what form, uh, Keith Williams' proposal at Easter Point, at Oyster Point uh, should proceed. Because it isn't just the developer's decision. It isn't just the local council's decision or the state government's decision or the federal government's decision. We have to work those, those four interests, if you like, including uh, Keith Williams, uh, into a decision that is appropriate to protect the unique world heritage values uh, of Hinchinbrook. We could, of course, uh, give other examples. and. Uh, Philip Toyne does this in his book when he says, and I quote, perhaps the most significant development in this respect is the increasing number of international measures being initiated by nations aware that many environmental problems now require multinational responses. And Australia is a party to many of them, such as the World Heritage Convention, the Biodiversity Convention, trade in protected species, the controlling of whaling, and those protecting migratory birds. There, there are many others uh, with more in preparation, such as the Convention to Combat uh, Desertification around the globe. These will add an incre increasing range of issues within Australia in relation to which the Commonwealth will have international obligations, even if they would normally fall exclusively within the responsibility of the state. Now, a good example that uh, Philip Toyne mentions would be the approval of a tourist resort on the coast. This would usually be a state matter, but if the site chosen was the habitat of migratory birds, which each year fly the length of the Pacific, it may involve our treaty obligations with Japan to protect both the birds and their habitat. And of course, in relation to Hinchinbrook, I come back to the fact that this is world heritage. We have to ensure that we protect this, this unique region. Well, now, there's been a lot of debate about how much support there is, how much work the state government has done, how much work the, the federal government has done, whether or not we should be listening to the Queensland government's consultants or whether we should be listening to Peter Valentine. And I have already placed on the public record the international reputation of the, Queensland, of the federal government's um, consultant, whose field of expertise, ecotourism and protection of world heritage values um, is. I'd like now to just remind the Senate of the concerns that were originally raised with the Queensland Government. And I'd stress that this is, you know, this comes back to the Office of Coordinator General, where I believe there was a misunderstanding about the extent of their authority in the area. And uh, this letter uh, was sent to the Office of Coordinator General on the 3rd of June 1994. And in the letter, um, the conclusion that the Assistant Secretary of the World Heritage Unit came to was, and I quote, the Commonwealth Environment Portfolio remains concerned about the project proceeding at this time as there is insufficient information to justify the need for the development and to properly assess its environmental impacts. The portfolio believes that the documentation inadequately considers the potential impacts of the Oyster Point proposal on the world heritage values of the, re of the area. We recommend that a much more comprehensive assessment of the proposal be undertaken before any approvals are granted for the continuation of the work on the project. Well, of course, what happened then was that the Queensland Government, to its credit, did 
seek out a consultant. But I haven't seen any more than a couple of pages of that consultant's um, work and their final conclusions. And Senator Macdonald, of course, have, has quoted in this place that uh, Loder and Bailey uh, were effectively unimpressed with the argument that's been put up by the Commonwealth and indeed by Peter Valentine. But I think what we have to ask ourselves is where is that report? Has it been open to public scrutiny? No, we haven't seen. I mean, I've seen a couple of pages. But where is the detail so that we can analyse and make judgments for ourselves as to the degree of expertise that the Queensland Government consultants have? Uh, secondly, I understand that uh, a very comprehensive uh, response to the Valentine report is, in fact, with the minister, the federal minister at this moment, together with a draft agreement. You know, the Queensland government has already put together a draft agreement before the federal minister has had a chance to assess these reports and to sit down and work this issue out around the table with Mr Williams, with state government, with local government. And it's this preempting, uh, this preempting that sometimes occurs in state government, sometimes occurs at local government level, that I think we really have to address in the way that Philip Toyne has challenged us to uh, in his book. Because you know, the environment just doesn't stop and the impacts don't just stop because uh, when we created states and indeed when we created local government boundaries, uh, that's, that uh, criteria should be uh, assessed. We, we need to get an approach that involves the three levels of government. We need to be open in our debate. We need to ensure that we recognise not just the short-term needs of the community, you know, a tourist resort you know, next year, but what is needed to protect this unique area for the next 20, 50, 100 years and more. We have to start taking the long-term view. It's a matter of ensuring uh, that those unique values are protected. So, um, Mr Deputy President, I hope that uh, all the material relating to Hinchinbrook will very soon be open to public scrutiny. I hope that the draft agreement that, uh, that Queensland has put forward will also be open to public scrutiny, because we cannot have issues of such significance decided uh, behind closed doors by bureaucrats and others. Uh, we have to ensure that the public has the opportunity to assess just how um, effectively these decisions uh, have been taken. The Australian electorate expects this high level of scrutiny to take place. And uh, could I just conclude by saying that the uh, Australian Nature Conservation Agency is very concerned as a result of the confusion between state and territory laws and how they conflict with uh, federal responsibilities. And uh, this, uh, this has prompted some market research which shows, and I quote, that a clear majority of Australians believe that the Commonwealth should have the power to fix national problems in the environment. 73 per cent believe that the Commonwealth should set uniform standards for air and water pollution. 68 per cent believe it should protect plants and animal species and 62 per cent believe it should set uniform standards for soil and land degradation. A minority between 25 and 35 per cent believe that these matters should be left to the states. So therefore, in assessing what is, what is needed in terms of decision-making at uh, Hinchinbrook, Australians seem to believe that the Commonwealth actually has more power over the environment than, the, than um, is sometimes assumed, indeed, by state and local government authorities. Finally, uh, before concluding, could I say that one of the issues, one of the major issues that has to be addressed about this uh, proposed development, 
uh, aside from the World Heritage values, is where is the local water supply coming from? I don't believe that the Cardwell uh, Shire Council uh, has, has been able to convince many people that there will be an adequate water supply uh, to service such a, a resort as proposed, unless, of course, a dam is ultimately proposed for World Heritage listed area in the hills behind Cardwell, and we will have to, we would, in that instance, have to go through exactly the same debate that we're going through at the moment. So uh, I would urge uh, caution on all sides. I would urge open debate to ensure that all parties are involved, but we look to the future, not to short-term interest. Senator McDonnell. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, we are debating Senator Woodley's motion number 1077, which uh, uh, the previous speakers haven't uh, specifically addressed as uh, far as the motion uh, goes, and they've used it uh, perhaps appropriately to have a, uh, a general discussion about the Oyster Point uh, development. But I want to return to the motion uh, actually before the chamber. And, uh, Senator Woodley's uh, motion is in uh, three parts. It uh, first of all asks the Senate to support some comments made by the former Prime Minister, Mr Whitlam, uh, about uh, the World Heritage Wilderness of uh, Hinchinbrook Island being protected. And it uh, also says that the government should think very carefully before reaching any decision on the area. Then goes on to for this asking the Senate to note some uh, various reports uh, in relation to the matter. And then thirdly, it calls upon the Environment Minister, uh, Senator Faulkner, to release the Peter Valentine report. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, generally speaking, the uh, Coalition supports uh, the motion, although we uh, have some difficulty with the wording of uh, paragraph A, because uh, first of all it asks us to support some comments by the uh, former Prime Minister, Mr Gough Whitlam. Now, I, of course, would be very reluctant to uh, agree with anything that Gough Whitlam said, uh, but particularly when I haven't seen uh, exactly what he has said and uh, Senator Woodley hasn't informed the Senate of what uh, Mr Whitlam has said. I have, I must say, got a uh, report uh, in the Townsville Bulletin by a very respected and uh, accurate journalist, Michael Madigan, uh, reporting on that uh, incident, but it, it is, of course, only reporting on extracts not exactly uh, giving a transcript of what Mr Whitlam uh, said. Mr Whitlam actually says, interestingly, in, uh, in the newspaper report, uh, and I quote, uh, Mr Whitlam said that while he did not have all the information surrounding the area in the Oyster Point tourist development proposed, he had no doubt the World Heritage Wilderness of Hinchinbrook Island should be protected. So Mr Whitlam's uh, admitting himself that he really doesn't know much about it. And so asking the Senate to agree with uh, Mr Whitlam on anything, as I say, would be a danger, uh, but particularly uh, when he comments on something which he admits he knows little about. So I would have uh, thought, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, that the better uh, route to follow might be to delete uh, paragraph A of Senator Woodley's motion and uh, replace it uh, simply with the words uh, uh, supports the protection of Hinchinbrook Island. Uh, Senator Woodley's motion uh, also went on to say that, uh, uh, or to ask that the government should think very carefully before reaching any decision on the area. Well, I would have hoped that the government would think very, clear, very carefully before reaching any decision on any matter. But uh, asking this government to think carefully on any matter again is uh, a bit like asking us to uh, support anything that Mr. Whitlam said. It's just something you wouldn't. Uh, uh, imagine that they would do. And uh, so, uh, again, I don't think that's going to uh, mean much in the motion. So, Mr um, um, uh, Acting Deputy President, I will move uh, an amendment, uh, which, is, uh, which I have given to uh, the other parties uh, in the chamber, uh, which is that uh, we delete uh, paragraph I of Senator Woodley's motion and uh, substitute it with the word simply uh, supports the protection of Hinchinbrook Island. Senator Woodley has indicated to me privately that he's uh, happy enough with that, and uh, if that's the case, then um, we uh, uh, all would seem to agree uh, with that. Uh, Mr Acting um, Deputy President, I wonder why the Democrats chose this uh, particular motion to be debated uh, uh, today. Uh, it uh, was, uh, as you might recall, yesterday that uh, Senator Curnow and Senator Woodley both quoted at some length 
from this Peter Valentine report. Now, the Peter Valentine report uh, uh, is, in fact, uh, as far as I know, a confidential report. It hasn't been released, and in fact, this motion is calling for it to be released. Uh, I wonder then how the uh, Democrats came by a copy of the Peter Valentine report. And uh, I uh, unfortunately was too slow to move at the end of Senator Curnow's speech yesterday that she table the document she was quoting from, but I was able to do it in relation to Senator Woodley. But I understand, and as I recall, when Senator, Wo uh, Senator Curnow quoted from the document, she had quite a thick document in her hand, not just the three pages that Senator Woodley was quoting from and which he did in fact table uh, as a result of my uh, motion in the Senate yesterday. So uh, uh, you, the Senate may be aware that I have given notice of motion this morning that at the next day of sitting I am going to require or going to move a motion requiring Senator Curnow to table the Peter Valentine report, which she seemed to have in her hands yesterday. And in doing so, I really uh, want to ask Senator uh, Coulter how come a confidential report that has not been publicly released has ended up in the hands of the Australian Democrats? And one could be excused for agreeing with me that this uh, simply shows that the Democrats are simply part of the mates, part of the uh, Labor Party, uh, part of the, uh, the, the left-wing group that uh, currently runs Australia. And it would seem, uh, perhaps, uh, that uh, Senator Faulkner or someone in his, his department has made a copy of the Peter Valentine report available to the Australian Democrats. Maybe that's not true. Maybe uh, Senator Woodley. Uh, uh, will indicate to me where he got it from. But it would seem that if it's a confidential report and one that hasn't been released, then certainly someone has some explaining to do to uh, show where that came from. As far as I'm aware, uh, the only people that would have a copy of that report are Mr Peter Valentine and Senator Faulkner and his department. And if the Democrats have got a copy of the report, then it can only come from one of three uh, places either from Mr Peter Valentine, from Senator Faulkner or from his department. And in, any, in any event, uh, it would be quite outrageous if either of those three leaked a copy of a confidential report to the government to one particular political party while ignoring the other political parties. And so my notice of motion, which hopefully will be debated uh, on the next day of sitting, uh, does require Senator Faulkner to explain why he, gave, why he or his department or Mr Valentine uh, gave a copy of that uh, report uh, to the Australian Democrats and not to us, and it also calls upon, him, uh, upon uh, uh, the minister to uh, share his largesse equally by making a copy of that uh, report uh, available to us. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, with the amendment I uh, propose uh, moving, uh, the coalition is happy enough to, uh, for the Senate to agree that Hinchinbrook Island should be protected, and I mean there's never been any doubt about that. I must say that uh, uh, perhaps of all in the chamber, I know Hinchinbrook Island the best. I was uh, very fortunate uh, a year or so ago to actually take a houseboat uh, through the Hinchinbrook Channel, and uh, it is a quite magnificent uh, area, and certainly uh, an area that must be uh, protected. I don't think anyone. Uh, would hesitate uh, with that proposition at all. I do insist, however, Mr Acting Deputy President, that all Australians be given the opportunity of experiencing that beauty and, uh, and feeling, getting the emotion of uh, that uh, magnificent area, the same as I was able to do. And you will never do that if you lock away those very, uh, those very uh, uh, beautiful areas of Australia. And so uh, it certainly is a beautiful area. It requires and needs uh, protection, and uh, we agree with that. Uh, we are, uh, and always have been, a political party uh, that uh, uh, does uh, believe in protection of natural environment. And of course, our record on, uh, in the environment is second to none. And uh, you've only got to mention things like Fraser Island, which Liberal governments were instrumental in protecting uh, to, re to, to, uh, to agree with what I say. Uh, so certainly the first part of the motion uh, we agree with. And the second part of the motion calling upon Senator Faulkner to release the uh,
copy of the document and some other documents we also agree with, and as I say, I've given notice of motion myself to require it. I don't know why the Democrats are bringing this motion on, because we're from Monday when they first uh, gave notice of motion to today when it's being debated, they seem somehow to have got a copy of the uh, motion. And, uh, I'd be very interested to hear Senator Faulkner explain why he or his department or Mr Valentine have given a copy of the report to the Democrats and not to anyone else. Mr Acting Deputy President, from the uh, documents that were tabled by Senator uh, Woodley as a result of uh, my motion yesterday, um, uh, it's, uh, I just want to make a couple of uh, comments on that. It would appear that Mr Valentine is suggesting that the whole boundaries of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park or the uh, wet tropics uh, area uh, should be amended. And that's an interesting uh, uh, development. I, I wonder whether uh, the uh, minister is intending to do that and whether, if he does do it, he will get the consent of the Queensland Labor government. Now, you might recall that when the boundaries of uh, the world, wet tropics uh, World Heritage Area were uh, set uh, some years ago, the Commonwealth government completely ignored the uh, Queensland government and uh, insisted on those boundaries uh, in direct uh, opposition to the Queensland government. Now, as I've always said, uh, I don't think anyone objected to World Heritage listing of the uh, wet tropics rainforest, but it should have been done uh, cooperatively and in consultation. It wasn't before, and I wonder if they're going to change the boundaries now, whether the uh, uh, minister is going to uh, get the agreement of the Goss Labor government or whether he's going to ram it through. Now, I understand the minister from the left of the Labor Party and the Goss right-wing uh, Labor government don't get on too very well, and um, so it might be uh, interesting to see whether uh, uh, the current Labor government treats the current Queensland Labor government uh, with the same disdain as the previous Labor federal government treated the previous uh, non-Labor state government. So that, that's interesting. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the uh, summary of the report from uh, Professor Valentine uh, says about the world heritage values of the Hinchinbrook area, and as I say, I, I know them only too well, and uh, anyone who's been there would uh, understand the absolute uh, beauty and value of uh, that particular area. Mr Valentine then in, uh, uh, indicates the impacts uh, of the Oyster Point development on the world heritage uh, values. He lists 15 impacts. As I said in the Senate yesterday, it's uh, quite interesting that his report seems to say there are 15 very direct impacts, whereas the Labor and Bailey report that uh, the Queensland Government uh, Commission uh, seems to say that there are nine, perhaps, only very possible impacts, and uh, none of them are particularly significant impacts, according to Labor and Bailey. Now, Senator Reynolds has uh, uh, said to me, and in the Senate yesterday, she uh, went at some length to, uh, to uh, give a background to Professor Valentine's uh, uh, qualifications and uh, uh, the fact that uh, Senator Rendell's husband work uh, works with Professor Valentine I'm sure has nothing to do with it. I know Professor Valentine as well. I meet him uh, on occasions that I'm at James Cook University and no one would uh, complain about that. But I uh, understand from uh, Senator Reynolds that she is uh, uh, suggesting that the Leder and Bailey people are not qualified. And, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, sing the praises of any particular group, but uh, I have taken the trouble to get some details of the Labor and Bailey Consulting Group, and they are a very professional and well-recognised uh, uh, consulting group in this area. Some of their clients, uh, I might say, include the Australian National Parks and Wildlife Service, the Federal Department of Health, Housing and Community Services, the Gold Coast City Council, the Melbourne Zoo, the New South Shire Council. Uh, and, uh, the Wet Tropics Management Authority, the Urban Land Authority of Victoria. Uh, there's a list uh, a page long of uh, their clients. So obviously there are a lot of people around who think they're very, very good. And they have uh, done some major indicative projects uh, in the past. Uh, and I mentioned just a couple. The Wet Tropics Recreation Strategy is one that uh, Loder and Bailey did. The Mary River Wetlands Visitors Action Plan, which is part of the Kakadu National Park, which I think uh, has uh, had wide acceptance, uh, is also uh, one of the uh, uh, projects that Loder and Bailey uh, were involved in. So I don't want to delay the Senate by uh, going through at length uh, with a long background of what uh, Loder and Bailey are, but they're obviously very professional and well-respected uh, uh, people in this uh, particular field. 
Now, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, in the course of yesterday's debate as well, uh, Senator Woodley uh, claimed that he had been threatened by Mr Williams, and uh, he was lucky enough to get one of the people up in the press gallery to uh, run his story. I think it appeared in the Financial Review, and uh, it is uh, there in black and white, uh, according to Senator uh, Woodley, uh, that Mr Williams has threatened him. Now, yesterday in the Senate, uh, Senator Parra and others on this side challenged Senator Woodley to give us the details of the threat that had been made. And we pointed out to Mr. Wood, Senator Woodley that if he had been threatened, then there are certain protections of this parliament uh, for parliamentarians who have been threatened. Now, I haven't uh, heard from Senator Woodley since, uh, and uh, I again say to him, you should either, Senator Woodley, tell us where Mr. Williams threatened you and give us the evidence. Other, Mr Williams, I'm sorry. Uh, otherwise, you should publicly apologise to him. Now, I'm aware that you've had uh, quite a bit of correspondence and contact with uh, Mr Williams. Uh, Mr Williams has exposed you in the past for the inaccuracies that you've been mouthing to the press, and he's criticised you quite severely for coming in here into the coward's castle under parliamentary protection and, uh, and telling untruths about him. And he's invited you to do it outside the parliament. I don't think you've done that yet, although I understand that one of your colleagues did that, and she has, I understand, been sued and will have the opportunity of showing whether she's right and you're right or Mr Williams is right. And so I again invite you to let us have details of the threats that have been made against you. I understand uh, that. Uh, uh, you've written to Mr Williams a number of times. I, I wonder if any of your in any of your correspondence to Mr Williams you have at any stage put on record and in writing the details of the threat he made against you or any complaints about the threat that Mr Williams may have made against you or whether you've mentioned it in any, any of your correspondence to uh, Mr Williams, whether you've referred to the uh, threats that he's made. I wonder also if you have uh, perhaps invited Mr Williams to meet with you, and if that is the case, I wonder uh, uh, if that is the action of a parliamentarian who has been threatened by the man that he then seeks to have uh, meetings with. So it would seem, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that uh, Senator Woodley, if he is to retain any credibility at all in relation to this matter, must put up with his evidence on uh, just uh, what the threat was from uh, 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 or by Mr Williams. I mean, Mr Williams has pointed out publicly that Senator Woodley went round saying the Mission Beach Tourist Authority, Tourism Authority was unanimously opposed to the Oyster Point development. Uh, Mr Williams quite rightly points out that um, following Senator Woodley's claims, the Mission Beach Tourist uh, Authority actually paid for advertisements to be put in a paper denying their opposition to the Port Hinchinbrook uh, development, and simply again uh, indicating that uh, Senator Woodley uh, gets in here and says anything he likes and, uh, and, uh, uh, without uh, any regard uh, for the truth, and has the parties that Senator Woodley, Woodley quotes having to actually put in paid advertisements to refute uh, uh, some of the uh, rubbish that Senator Woodley has uh, said about this uh, particular uh, matter. Uh, Senator Woodley has also uh, roundly cr criticised uh, Mr Williams about uh, Hamilton Island. And look, I've never met uh, uh, Mr Williams. I don't uh, want to be. Uh, I'm not here to defend him. But again, I understand Mr Woodley. Uh, Mr Williams has, uh, in correspondence to Senator Woodley, quite accurately pointed out. Uh, the efforts that uh, Mr Williams made to ensure that all creditors of uh, the Hamilton Islands project uh, were uh, looked after. And, uh, I, though, have not heard Senator Woodley uh, correct his statement and apologise to Mr Williams in relation to uh, uh, those particular uh, uh, matters. Uh, Mr. Senator Woodley says that Mr Williams had uh, threatened a Mr Arthur Bull of Cardwell. Well, I think he's uh, said that in the paper or he's mentioned it in this parliament somewhere before. Um, but uh, I'm informed that uh, uh, Mr Bull and, uh, and Mr Williams have had conversations and uh, that Mr uh, Bull has said to Mr Williams that uh, he uh, has admitted that he shouldn't have 
uh, made the statements that he had and has actually apologised to uh, Mr Williams in connection uh, with that matter. Uh, Senator Woodley has also made some wild ac accusations about the permits uh, uh, Mr Williams has sought, uh, accusations that simply just don't bear any, uh, any uh, 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 reference at all to the uh, facts of the uh, matter. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, Senator Woodley will have some time, uh, hopefully at the end of this debate, uh, to, uh, uh, to respond, and I await eagerly uh, his uh, answers to those particular uh, matters. Now, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, just uh, in concluding, uh, can I just briefly refer to a couple of the matters that Senator Reynolds uh, made? Uh, she says that she hasn't read the Lader and Bailey report uh, yet. Well, neither have I uh, in any detail. I haven't uh, had a copy of it. Um, but uh, it is a report commissioned by the Queensland Government, and the Queensland Government was obviously quite happy with uh, the report from uh, Lader and Bailey, and they approved this development subject to environmental conditions. Now, again, I'm not familiar with those uh, environmental conditions, but I would assume that the Queensland government is a responsible government and one which can weigh up the uh, tourist values, the jobs that will be created in this project, and at the same time have, have uh, an understanding and an appreciation of the sensitive environmental area that is the uh, Hinchinbrook Island and the Hinchinbrook Channel. And, uh, it is, uh, one can only assume uh, that the Queensland uh, Labor government, Mr Goss's government, was responsible in its attitude to this, and I'm prepared to accept that they were. And I'm prepared to accept that the uh, Lader and Bailey report uh, uh, were uh, relevant. I don't quite know what uh, place the Commonwealth has in this, and I have a copy of a, uh, an advice from the Attorney General uh, to the federal government uh, back in 1991 indicating that the Hinchinbrook Channel is really outside the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth Government and is in fact within the sole jurisdiction of the Queensland Government. And that's, as I say, an opinion from the Commonwealth Attorney General to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. And uh, so I, I again wonder what uh, Senator Faulkner is even uh, uh, doing in this, unless, unless uh, as I've suggested before, it is simply part of the Labor Party indulging in their factional brawls and uh, that the left wing trying to pay back the Goss government for getting rid of the left wing president of the Labor Party in Queensland and the left wing of the party and their mates in the Australian Democrats uh, calling them uh, to account. But Mr Acting Deputy President, the uh, local shire council, the Cardwell Shire Council, uh, is in fact uh, uh, run, or the, the mayor there, Mr Tip Byrne, uh, Lovely fellow, good, good uh, North Queensland, a member of the Labor Party, but still a good, good man and uh, does a good job in the uh, Cardwell Shire. I understand that with some uh, qualifications and uh, conditions that they've imposed that they're pretty happy with the project. Uh, the meeting that Senator uh, Parra referred to uh, in the Senate yesterday, where over a thousand people in that small seaside town of Cardwell came out, something pretty unusual these days, and met in a meeting hall to demonstrate their, their uh, support for this uh, particular proposal. And, uh, and uh, certainly the uh, Cardwell J Chamber of Commerce have, I think, written to all Queensland senators, uh, correcting the mistakes that Senator Woodley and Senator Curnow have been guilty of, and urging support uh, from the uh, Cardwell people of this particular project. And I conclude, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, and in doing so I might just uh, say to the Chamber that uh, in arranging some informal times, we were allowing for Senator McGibbon to speak. He has had to return to Brisbane and would not be able to, so I've actually taken a bit of his time, um, uh, and he won't be speaking. Uh, but, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, in concluding, uh, can I say that uh, the local authority seems to be uh, in favour of it, the Queensland government seems to be in favour of it, certainly the people of the area are in, in favour of it. We s this is an area of very high unemployment. And certainly, uh, as uh, a North Queenslander, I can say we need the jobs, not only the jobs of construction, but the jobs that the development itself uh, uh, will create in time to come. And uh, so I think everybody, except, except, if I might say, the loony left down here in Canberra, uh, are in favour of it. Now, I'm not saying, and I never have said, that that development should go ahead willy-nilly. 
Mr Williams has approvals already, and uh, if he wanted to, he could start building tomorrow and ignore the rest of you. But he doesn't want to. He's asked for a new approval on a more sensitive development. And uh, I've always said, and uh, certainly the coalition says, that there must be the most stringent environmental conditions imposed upon that development. But subject to those stringent environmental conditions, the development should go ahead for the jobs, for the export dollars, uh, for the ac business activity and tourist uh, dollars it will create. Uh, the Queensland government, uh, I understand, have looked at it fully, have imposed the uh, sensible uh, environmental conditions, and on that basis uh, one would think that the uh, proposal uh, should proceed. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, as far as the motion that we are debating uh, uh, before us today is concerned, as I indicated before, uh, I have moved my amend amendment and uh, uh, subject to that amendment, uh, the coalition will be supporting Senator Woodley's motion. The question is, the amendment be agreed to, Minister? The amendment. Uh, uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I understand the uh, amendment that's been moved by Senator Macdonald is to substantially change uh, paragraph A of the, the proposed uh, motion is moved uh, by Senator Woodley uh, to uh, remove any reference to Mr Gough Whitlam. Uh, that's not an amendment that I would be minded to uh, support. I'd uh, say to the Senate that, uh, that Gough Whitlam was in uh, Townsville on Friday the 16th of uh, September to open the new offices of the uh, North Queensland Conservation Council, and I am aware of the comments that he made uh, in relation to world heritage in a general sense, and also, of course, the Oyster Point development in particular. I think uh, if ever there was a person who was well qualified to speak about uh, world heritage matters, it's certainly Gough Whitlam. I mean, he is a former uh, ambassador to UNESCO. He led uh, many uh, Australian delegations at meetings of the World Heritage uh, Bureau and uh, also the World Heritage Committee. Uh, during his time at UNESCO, the nominations of the, the wet tropics in Queensland, Kakadu Stage 2 and the New South Wales rainforests were inscribed on the World Heritage List. Now, turning uh, to what Mr Whitlam is uh, reported to have uh, said, I am uh, indebted to reading in the Townsville Bulletin that uh, it reported uh, Mr Whitlam as saying this, and uh, I, uh, I quote him directly, Mr Acting Deputy President, said that while he did not have all the information surrounding the area and the Oyster Point tourist development proposed, he had no doubt the World Heritage Wilderness of Hinchinbrook Island should be protected and maintained as a World Heritage Area. He's um, also reported as saying that the government uh, had to act uh, very carefully uh, in reaching any decision uh, uh, affecting this area. Uh, as I have said uh, time and time again uh, when asked uh, either in this uh, chamber uh, or in public about uh, my role as the Federal Environment Minister, I do take uh, very seriously my responsibilities in relation to ensuring the protection of world heritage values. Now, I think it might be useful uh, in this debate to briefly outline the process that's been undertaken to date to ensure that proper consideration is given uh, to uh, ensuring the protection of the world heritage values of the Hinchinbrook area and the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage listing. My department provided to uh, the Queensland uh, uh, Department of the Coordinator General in, in June a submission uh, in relation uh, to uh, the uh, proposal. Uh, my department uh, engaged Mr Peter Valentine of the uh, James Cook University of North Queensland 
to undertake uh, an investigation of uh, the world heritage values of the Hinchinbrook Channel and uh, its environs and uh, the possible uh, effect and impact uh, on those values of the proposed development at Oyster Point. Uh, this report was sent to uh, uh, the Honourable Molly Robson, uh, the uh, Queensland Minister for Environment and Heritage, for her comment. And uh, considerable discussions uh, have also been held uh, between my portfolio uh, and the relevant Queensland departments uh, about the conclusions of the Valentine report. Now, I'm now in receipt uh, of uh, Mrs. Robson's, Ms. Robson's uh, letter, which is a long and uh, detailed uh, uh, letter to which uh, is attached uh, a draft of the deed of agreement between the State of Queensland, Cardwell Properties Proprietary Limited and the Shire of Cardwell. I have asked uh, my department for detailed uh, advice on those documents and uh, I expect to receive that advice shortly and provide a response uh, uh, back to the uh, Queensland Government. Uh, it seems to me that the process that's been undertaken has meant that there is maximum opportunity for both the state uh, and the federal governments to look at the uh, complexities uh, uh, of these issues. And, and I would stress uh, with the Senate that the issues involved, in fact, uh, uh, are complex ones. If I could uh, turn to uh, the issue uh, in, the, uh, in uh, Part C of uh, Senator Woodley's uh, notice of motion, which goes to the issue of the public release uh, uh, of um, the, uh, the Valentine report. Uh, turning to this issue in, in a general sense, uh, I, um, uh, I have uh, indicated that um, the Queensland Government's draft deed of agreement uh, and uh, the Valentine uh, report uh, and their release uh, are issues which were subject uh, uh, of a question to me, uh, I think yesterday, in question time uh, from Senator Kernow. And uh, I really can't add uh, very much, Mr Acting Deputy President, to what I said to Senator Kernow during question time yesterday. In regard to the draft deed of agreement, that is a Queensland government uh, document and therefore uh, its release I think is properly a matter for the Queensland government. I did indicate that this was a matter that I was willing to take up with Ms Robson and I'll do that. In relation to release of the Valentine report itself, uh, I, uh, I believe in the, the interests of uh, full public disclosure that uh, it is uh, appropriate in these circumstances to release the Valentine report. Uh, given the nature of the uh, consultations uh, that the government has had with Queensland uh, on this matter, I think it uh, appropriate that I consult with Ms Robson uh, uh, before that occurs. And, uh, and therefore, I certainly can't uh, agree uh, to release the, the document now uh, before, and I use the words uh, of Senator Woodley's uh, motion, uh, prior to making a decision uh, on the development. Now, let's, let's be clear about this. Let's be clear about this. It is not up to me to make a decision on the development. Uh, and I think this is an important uh, point for, for Senator Woodley to understand. The, the involvement uh, uh, in relation to my responsibilities and powers as the Federal Minister for the Environment is to ensure that there is not an impact on the uh, world heritage values of the, this area and in fact that those world heritage values are protected. So I can't accept uh, that aspect of the final part of your uh, uh, motion, uh, Senator Woodley, and I would be foreshadowing that the motion uh, be amended 
by deleting uh, the words there in uh, paragraph C prior to the minister making a decision on the development uh, and substitute the following uh, words uh, after consultation with the uh, Queensland Government. And I think I've provided copies uh, to the, uh, the Deputy Clerk of, uh, of that particular amendment uh, for circulation. I think that is uh, a more uh, appropriate and, uh, and uh, accurate uh, uh, reflection of, uh, of uh, uh, my uh, responsibilities in relation to uh, this particular uh, development. And, uh, and I stress uh, it's not a matter for decision uh, in that sense, uh, or approval uh, of the development by for uh, uh, Commonwealth uh, uh, authorities. I do make uh, the point in res response to uh, um, uh, Senator Macdonald's uh, claim that I had released uh, the Valentine report uh, to Senator Kerno that that isn't the case. I released the. I, well, that's that's a good question, Senator, and one that I can't answer. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, I would have thought that might well be the case, but you've got to understand, Senator, as I've indicated, I know you haven't been following this very closely, the debate in this chamber. I did indicate, I did indicate a long time ago that I would pass to Queensland authorities not only a copy of the final report of Mr Valentine, but also a copy of a draft, uh, the draft report of Mr Valentine, so there would be full transparency between both federal, between both federal and, uh, and uh, state governments in relation to this matter. And I understand that uh, that, uh, that uh, section uh, of uh, the uh, report that uh, Senator Kerno quoted from related to the executive summary of uh, Mr Valentine's draft report. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can clearly say, of course, that uh, the, the, uh, the report certainly uh, has not been released uh, by me, and I am very confident that it has not been released by anyone in my department or in any agency uh, of uh, my department. And if uh, that is the insinuation contained within that uh, string of um, absurd interjections from you, Senator Macdonald, that it is an insinuation that is absolutely it is a decision, it is an insinuation that is absolutely without uh, justification. So within the so Madam uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, within uh, the uh, parameters that I've uh, outlined uh, uh, to the Senate in uh, in this uh, contribution uh, uh, and uh, uh, with, uh, if this uh, amendment is uh, acceptable to uh, the chamber, then uh, the government uh, is uh, comfortable in supporting uh, the notice of motion uh, in the uh, amended form, as I've indicated. Senator Coulter. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I understand this debate has to finish at seven. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. I'd just like to leave a few minutes before seven for uh, Senator Woodley to sum up. Um, I'd just like to uh, pick up on the point that the Minister has just briefly made and a point that um, Senator Macdonald was also dealing with, and that is that um, I only have in my possession the three pages which I uh, tabled yesterday, and uh, I don't know how they came into my possession. They, they're off the back of a truck, as they, as they say, and uh, as, as far as I'm aware, um, that is all that Senator Kerner has in her possession. So um, his uh, motion earlier. Uh, Senator Macdonald's motion earlier today to call for uh, us to table that report is, is asking for an impossibility. We don't have it. And uh, as I say, we, we only have those three pages. He now has those three pages, and I'm not too sure how they came into, uh, into my possession. Um, I just want to pick up on uh, a very general but very important point, and that is that I think the, uh, what we're dealing with, not only in this debate but in so many debates in relation to environmental protection, is a difference in, um, in world view, a difference in paradigm between uh, uh, Senator Macdonald and uh, people uh, of his uh, view on the one hand and uh, people like myself on the other. Uh, on the one hand, those who see the environment as, uh, as something 
out there other than self, something to be exploited uh, for profit, and uh, on the other hand, the more um, um, a view similar, I suppose, to many Indigenous people, including our uh, our own Aboriginal people, uh, people who see the environment as as part of self, part of something that uh, uh, to which we belong, and therefore has a right to exist in its own <coughs> uh, for for its own sake, uh, a, a need for protection, and a um, uh, something uh, of which we are a part, a a part of it rather than a part from it and therefore able to exploit it. And I think there is that fundamental difference and it's very difficult to, uh, to argue with people like Senator MacDonald um, when one is coming from a different point of view. And I think Senator MacDonald would be the first to admit that I come from a very different point of view from him. Let me explain, explain just briefly on this point of view. Several years ago, uh, Dr Stephen Boyden at the Australian National University, who's worked at Crest for a number of years, published a book which he called The Biological uh, History of Western Civilization, in which he developed the theme that um, for most of human history, for some 400,000 generations of human history, we lived in small groups as gatherers and hunters, and we lived in a natural environment. And it's only very, very recently that a small proportion of us have lived in a, an industrial and urbanised society. And he draws from this the conclusion that most of us are basically and fundamentally genetically adapted to live in a natural environment. And one finds examples of, uh, of this type of thinking in, in, uh, in uh, ordinary everyday expressions. I mean, how often does one hear when one goes away on a holiday, we're getting away from it all? We're getting away from it all. We need to get away from something. We need to go back to our, uh, our more human roots, our human roots which, were, uh, which are quite literally rooted in a natural environment. And uh, what, in fact, we have in the case of those who would exploit that, that natural environment and build these, these mega-tourist resorts is that it would not be possible to get away from it all because the all would be everywhere. One could never escape from it. And uh, one would therefore be diminished as a human being. One would be less than human. And I think that is the, that is the fundamental difference that lies between the view that is being put by Senator Macdonald and those on that side and, and the view that's being put by, um, by the Democrats and by those who would protect these areas, because it is important for these areas to remain uh, as areas to which humans can go and experience nature on nature's terms, not to, to be surrounded by thousands of people, which makes that experience quite impossible. And not only that, but if one picks up the theme of intergenerational equity, the idea of equity between generations, in addition to equity within generations, then it is very important for this generation to ensure that future generations can also experience uh, that, uh, that, uh, that nature on its own terms. That there are wild places to which our children can go, our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren can go, because if we, if we take those, uh, those opportunities away, they will be less than human. And uh, yesterday, if I um, understood uh, Senator Macdonald correctly, he was saying, "No, this is an area that has not been developed, like many of the other areas in the stretch of the Queensland coast." Which I interpreted uh, him to say, "Well, why shouldn't this also be developed in this way?" Well, the very reason it shouldn't be developed in this way is that those other areas have their have their mega hotels, their casinos, and that type of of, uh, of experience. Let us keep wilderness areas where people can experience a wilderness. And that is very important and it's also very important for later generations. Hinchinbrook is such an area. It has been protected as uh, the Hinchinbrook Island and the Channel as a uh, World Heritage Area. It is one which has been clearly recognised as a uh, place where one can have a wilderness experience. Populations have been limited there. Uh, it has not been well policed, but it is simply impossible to continue to protect that sort of experience with these uh, very large hotels. And I just make that plea that it is at that level that we're going to continue to have these sorts of debates. It is for that sort of reason that uh, Hinchinbrook uh, needs to be protected. It is for that reason that the Democrats have gone in so hard on, on this issue. And it is for that reason that we put up this motion and we support it most strongly. Senator Woodley. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting 
uh, Deputy President. Um, I won't have time to answer all of the questions asked me by Senator Macdonald, but uh, let me just indicate that we will be supporting, however, his amendment as well as the amendment by the government. Uh, that should not be uh, interpreted in any way as meaning that I do not agree with uh, the former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. I admire, both admire him and certainly agree fully with the statement that he made, but for the sake of getting agreement on the resolution, we are prepared to accept the amendment by, uh, by Senator Macdonald. Um, Look, there are so many things Senator Macdonald said, I, I wish I had more time, but let me just very quickly make a couple of comments. I have, in fact, invited uh, Mr Williams to a meeting. Uh, that doesn't mean, uh, as you inferred, that uh, surely I wouldn't meet a person who perhaps might make threats to me. I've spent most of my life, Senator Macdonald, meeting with people who disagree with me. It's the nature of the task that I've been involved in for so long. I have no problem with people who even violently disagree with me, if in fact there is some way of bridging the gap between us. Um, in terms of, the, uh, of, of presenting documents, etc., to back up my assertions yesterday, uh, I am considering preparing a statement for the Privileges Committee. So you will have to be patient, Senator Macdonald, and uh, when that is prepared, if I uh, am able to get to do that in a, in a short period of time, then certainly you'll be able to have a copy of it. Um, you did make a few wrong assertions in your own speech, and perhaps I should correct those. Right. Uh, well, perhaps I'll, I'll leave it at that, and uh, we can vote on the issue. <laughs> the question is that uh, Senator Ian Macdonald's amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against, no. No. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the, the, move the amendment. I move the amendment uh, proposed government amendment, amendment circulated in this chamber. The question is that uh, the amendment moved by Senator Crowley be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The time allotted for the consideration of general business having expired, the Senate will proceed to the consideration of committee reports and government responses. Oh, sorry, we have a, an alternative program. First item is tabling of documents. The, I have the Department of the Senate annual report and the broadcast. Oh, sorry. Right. In accordance with the provisions of the Public Service Act 1922 and the Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commonwealth Authorities Act, I present the annual report of the Department of the Senate for 1993-94, together with the annual implementation report of the Equal Op Employment Opportunity Program for 1993-95. Acting Deputy President, Minister. I move that the report be printed. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I present a document describing changes to the general principles and standing determinations for the radio broadcasting of parliamentary proceedings that are to take effect from 10th of October 1994. Clark? A document is tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable senators. Senator Burns. Uh, Mr Acting President, uh, I present the, on behalf of Senator McKean, I present the 13th report of the Standing Committee on Publications and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. It's leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Burns. Uh, Madam Acting President, I move that the report be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. To contrary, no. The ayes have it. Um, um, acting, Mad Madam Acting President, on behalf of Senator Cooney, I present the report of the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs on the Complaints, Australian Federal Police, Amendment Bill 1994, together with the transcript of evidence and submissions received by the committee, and move that the report be printed. 
Questions? That motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Burns. The President, on behalf of Senator Coulson, I table additional information received by Estimates Committee F. Uh, the President has received letters from the Leader of the Government and the Senate, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, the Leader of the Australian Democrats and independent senators nominating senators to be members of standing committees. Minister. Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the membership of committees. It's leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. I move that all senators appointed to standing committees under Standing Order 25 be discharged from those committees with effect from 10 October 94, and senators be appointed to the new standing committees with effect from 10 October 94, as listed in the document I now hand to the clerk and have circulated in the chamber. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The President has received letters from the Leader of the Government in the Senate, the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, the Leader of the Australian Democrats and a Greens West Australia Senator nominating senators to be members of the Select Committee on ABC Management and Operations. Minister. Madam Acting President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the membership of the Select Committee on ABC Management and Operations. Leave is granted. No objection. Leave is granted. I move that Senators Alston, Bourne, Carr, Chamaret, Chapman, Forshaw and Tierney have been duly nominated in accordance with the resolution agreed to on 21 September 93, be appointed to the Select Committee on ABC Management and Operations. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, messages have been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Departure Tax Amendment Bill 1994. Departure Tax Collection Amendment Bill 1994. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Departure Tax Collection Amendment Bill 1994 and Departure Tax Amendment Bill 1994. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Ms. Leave granted. Senator Reid. I move that further consideration of the bill be adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, in reference to Senator Gibson's notice of motion of 20 September, the Minister for Transport has provided the following documents to be tabled as requested. All documents asked for have been provided. Although some of these documents contain commercially sensitive information, no deletions have been made. However, I would ask the Senate to respect these commercial sensitivities. In respect of the, the request for the Remuneration Tribunal determination of 24 August 94, this was tabled in the Parliament on the 19th of September 94. In respect of the request under B1 of the Notice of Motion for two letters on the 5th of April, one letter was addressed to the Minister for Finance and is not in the Minister for Transport's possession. However, it appears it is identical to that sent to the Minister for Transport. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I present the Government's response to the report of the Select Committee on Community Standards relevant to the supply of services utilising electronic technologies on video and computer games and classification issues, and I seek leave to incorporate the document in Hansard and to move a motion in relation to the document. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave granted. Minister? Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the document and move that, um, uh, seek, that, uh, seek leave to, to continue my remarks. <laughs> to leave granted? No objection. Leave granted. <coughs> Minister? I present the government's response to the report of the Joint Committee on the National Capital and External Territories on the proposal for pay parking in the parliamentary zone, and I seek leave to incorporate the document in Hansard and to move a motion in relation to the document. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. That I move that the Senate take note of the document and uh, seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. What's this? Minister. Ah. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I present the Government's response to the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration 
on asylum, border control and detention, and I seek leave to incorporate the document in Hansard and move a motion in relation to the document. Is leave granted? No objection, leave granted. I move that the Senate take note of the document. Senator McKinnon. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I only want to address a few brief remarks to the government response to what uh, is a very important report. It's a very pleasing uh, response from the government to the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Migration. The, the report contains 19 recommendations. 13, the minister has accepted 13 of those recommendations on qualified acceptance. He's accepted two more, which have been agreed with in part, and one other that's been agreed in principle. So out of the 16 out of 19 recommendations have been agreed to, three with qualifications, as I said. Three important recommendations have been uh, the responses that those recommendations are under consideration. Those recommendations are uh, the ones dealing with the legal uh, recommendation number four, the committee recommending that the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977 and the Judiciary Act 1903 be amended to specify that the Migration Reform Act 19 1992 and its predecessors are enactments to which the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1997 and the Judiciary Act of 1903 do not apply. Recommendation five is a uh, was recommending that persons seeking to take uh, actions in the federal court ought to, there ought to be a leave, a, a leave to apply provision inserted in that before the court could deal with them. And uh, recommendation six is that uh, deals with amendments to the Migration Reform Act. The, uh, I hope that when the Joint Departmental Com Interdepartmental Committee does give consideration to those three recommendations. They will take into account the experiences that uh, the Federal Court has been going through since this report was brought down in March of this year. The Joint Standing Committee on Migration have, in this report, expressed concerns about the usage, the high usage that people are making of the federal court after they have been through what has been proved to be very fair processes through the administrative decisions on, uh, for asylum seekers in this country. So that we have people, uh, we have people who enter this country illegally who are given the opportunity of uh, applying for uh, refugee status through the administrative process. They have also got, if they're rejected at that process, that initial stage, they have got the opportunity then of applying for a review of that decision through the Refugee Review Tribunal. And if they fail on that, two, uh, two areas which uh, they have got access to, they then take their case into the judiciary. There is no other country in the world which allows both an administrative processing system and a judicial processing system to take place. And there were one of, that was one of the reasons why the committee made the recommendations along the lines that they have made them. I hope that the, inter the interdepartmental committee of the Department of Immigration, Prime Minister and Cabinet and Attorney Generals do look very seriously at, uh, at this. Otherwise, if, as the committee said in its report, if we are going to end up with two very, very expensive systems of processing of asylum seekers in this country, they, it is the people of Australia who will ultimately suffer. And of course, there are people suffering because of what I t have publicly termed to be an abuse of the system. Whilst those people who have had their applications and their appeals for refugee status in this country refused, they then take the case to the uh, through to the federal court, generally speaking, but some people have been through to the state supreme courts, and there are a couple of cases in the uh, federal court, in the high court as well. Those people, while those cases are going on, remain in detention. They remain in detention. In some cases, they have got children who also remain in detention. On the matter of children, I certainly hope 
that the IDC do take into account when they're considering the committee's recommendations on 4, 5 and 6, the experiences of two very young Chinese girls who are asylum seekers, who have received a deal of publicity in recent months. Lin Yan is aged 13 and Lin Jing is aged 9. They um, had made application for refugee status in this country. That application was rejected. They didn't qualify under the criteria of assessment that we used. They made application to apply for a review of that, uh, th that refusal, uh, but before the Refugee Review Tribunal concluded its deliberations on their repeal, their application was withdrawn. It left the two children without any status whatsoever in Australia and liable for immediate deportation. The minister did not act to deport them immediately. He waited until their uncle's application for, to the uh, Refugee Review Tribunal had been assessed. It was rejected and then the whole family became liable for deportation. Deportation orders were issued to the whole of the family. I think it was nine members in total with the, the uncle and his wife, a brother of the wife, a brother of the, uh, the husband, and of course the two nieces and ne the two little girls' nieces and nephews, and there were some other children as well. Lawyers acting on behalf of the two girls and the uncles made application to the federal court in Canberra, in Canberra, not in Port Hedland or Perth, which is. Uh, which Port Hedland is, uh, is part of that state. They made application here in Canberra for a stay of those, uh, those uh, deportation orders. That order was refused. The application was refused and the children were still liable for deportation. The very next day, lawyers again made application to the federal court, however in a different city, this time in Sydney, for a stay of the deportation orders. And the judge in Sydney referred it back to Canberra, where again, Two days later, the deportation orders were upheld. Lawyers then immediately went off to the federal court again in Sydney, to the full court of the federal court, three judges sitting, and made further application. That full court upheld the decision. So the family had been through, in some cases, four separate applications uh, for, for asylum and review in this country. Weren't satisfied and been rejected on all occasions, weren't satisfied on that, then took the case to the five separate five judges of the federal court on three separate occasions. The girls were in the news again, I think, this morning, where the court sitting in Sydney has suggested that the children should be brought to Sydney because their lawyer was based in Sydney and it's a better place for them. I have publicly called these, the way that these children have been treated as child abuse. It's not only child abuse of the children, but it's an abuse of their parents who were located back in China through enormous efforts by the department to meet the children when they returned to their homeland. But of course the courts in Australia were used to intervene and the children never actually returned to meet with their parents. It now looks like that they are going to be here for some considerable period of time. There are, is another direction to hearing, and I don't want to comment on the, the actual court case itself. Rather, the, the usage of the court cases and how the Australian system can be abused and is being abused, in my opinion, in this, in this, uh, this particular case. That's not the only case that is ongoing in the, uh, in, uh, through the courts dealing with both people in Australia. At the moment, I'm informed that there are some 151 immigration cases before the federal court, and almost 100 of them are applications from both people. And I would suggest most of those applications are from people who have already been through the, uh, the administrative system, which uh, the minister refers to in, his, uh, in the response to the committee report, has been dramatically improved from some of the earlier uh, errors or mistakes that were made in the processing of both people in this country. But that system is not suitable, it's not accepted by some, and indeed 
even if people I would, would think if they'd suggested my tongue-in-cheek uh, suggestion made it publicly earlier in the year about sending boats up to China to bring the people in ourselves, they probably wouldn't be satisfied with that. It is costly, a very, very costly exercise, which of course is paid for, not by the government, but by the Australian taxpayers. I am continually and ever increasingly getting more responses from constituents for us to bring an end to this abuse of the system. In saying that it's an abuse, I do, however, recognise that there are some lawyers and some refugee support groups who truly believe in what they're doing and believe they are doing it for the best purposes. There are some individuals involved and organisations who have involved themselves in the boat people debate who I question the ethics on. And three weeks ago, Mr President, I revealed that there was, uh, without naming them, one refugee organisation in our home state who uh, was being used as a front for the National Civic Council. I think that the, the usage of refugee type organisations in the way that it has been used in the past has brought, unfortunately, many dedicated people who are involved in the uh, situation into question, if not into disrepute. This whole costly exercise has gone on too long. It is about time, and I hope this interdepartmental committee that has been mentioned in the government's response does come up with some ways of amending the ADGR Act and the Judiciary Act to ensure that these abuses are not allowed to continue and that the suffering of the people, both in detention and of the Australian taxpayers, is put an end to once and for all, whilst we retain a very fair and just asylum seeker processing system. The question is, the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye, those against no. I think the ayes have it. It being near enough to 7.20 p.m. under sessional order, I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Before we leave for the week, there is a matter that I would like to bring back to the Senate, as I raised it in the previous time, uh, previous time we were here, and yesterday by way of question, which was answered by Senator Schott. And I want to take issue with some of the things that were presented to the Senate by him in his answer. Before doing so, I want to make it quite plain to you, Mr President, and of course to Senator Schott, that I am in no way suggesting that he misled the Senate or gave an answer in any way um, not in accordance with all of the facts. He received the information from another source and presented it, I believe, totally in good faith. But it, in a sense, doesn't deal with the issue that I raised, and there is uh, there is more information which needs to be placed before the Senate for the situation to be understood fully. And I'm talking about the uh, sci science Olympiads, physics, chemistry, biology and Australian students' opportunity to participate in them. And my question yesterday and the issue that I raised pre previously relates to the government's failure to continue to support the Olympiads and my concern that it is not in Australia's best interests to be neglecting to encourage students to participate in science and engineering. It is crucial to the future of this country that this should be the case. Now, the history of the Olympiads, as far as Australia is concerned, is simply, as I will put it, it was founded in Australia, the ASO was founded in 1988, and for the first three years, those who were encouraging students to participate managed to raise the funds locally, goodwill through the universities, students raising funds, and enabled Australia to take part. That was fairly unsatisfactory in that the students spent much of their time raising money rather than preparing themselves for the Olympiad activities. And in 1990, Mr Dawkins, as a result of representations made to him, obviously recognised that this was an important part of the opportunity for students with aptitude in the areas of physics, chemistry, etc. 
said that $100,000 per annum would be made available for five years for each of physics and chemistry, and responsibility for the money was passed to the management committee. And so from then on, the participation in the Olympiads, International Olympiads, took place with the assistance of this government money, which Mr Dawkins made available. And as I said in my question yesterday, the Australian Science Olympiads organisers, directors, have been advised that this money will not be renewed, and that was the point that I was making. When I refer to the Australian Science Olympiads, there are three directors, one in each area of physics, chemistry and biology, who run the teams for Australia. Then they're doing it in their own time. They have neither the time nor the expertise to go fundraising to do this. Apparently it's been suggested by the government that they should raise money to support this. Well, that would be fine if they had any form of secretariat that had the expertise to do it. But I remind you that it started from people who were putting in this effort on a totally voluntary basis to try and give the opportunity for Australian students to participate. It just isn't one of the sort of organisations uh, with the structure and the mechanisms and the bureaucracy that give them this, the expertise and time to go out raising money for these activities. And I suggest that it is in the interest of Australia that this young pe people should take place. Australia, though, secured the 1995 International Physics Olympiad to take place in Australia and the federal government promised $300,000 to assisting in the funding. And Senator Schott yesterday, when he came back to the Senate in answer to my question, referred to this money and said that the government was surprised that I had suggested that funds were being withdrawn when, in fact, this money was being given uh, for the purpose of the Physics Olympiad in 1995. True indeed, the money has been given to stage the Physics Olympiad, International Physics Olympiad in 1995, but no funding towards Australia's participation in it. And that is the point that I am attempting to get across. And in fact, the 300,000 is presenting the organisers with somewhat of a problem in that the budget, and a fairly tight budget, was drawn up to an amount of $480,000. Intensive fundraising efforts have got another $10,000. But it has been decided, thanks to the assistance of the University of Canberra in the way they are assisting with it being uh, staged, that the $310,000 will be made due to enable us to stage the International Physics Olympiad of 1995 it will be a pretty bare bones activity. It will mean that the participants coming here will see nothing of Australia, only the inside of the university. And I think it's a bit of a shame with students coming here, bright students coming here from all around the world, that they really won't have much of an opportunity to see anything of Australia uh, other than to participate in the event at the University of Canberra. But thankfully, that university is enabling it to go ahead with the small budget that is available for the purpose. So when I asked Senator Schott if it was true that they were no longer providing money for the Australian Physics Olympiad, the answer in fact is that the government is not providing money for that purpose. But we do acknowledge that they are providing funds to enable the event to be staged. And it really is it's quite different. As one of the people involved in it said to me, what it really is doing is like saying in the year 2000, no funds this year for the AIS. All the money available will go to the city of Sydney towards staging the Olympic Games, but no money for the AIS in the year 2000. That effectively is what is being said. Money to assist you to stage event, no money to assist the Australian students who ought to be participating in it. And so I think for that reason it is very disappointing indeed. And of course if that is the end of the matter there will be no Australian participation thereafter in physics, chemistry or the areas that the students ought to be encouraged to participate in it. 
There are other events in the future that it looks as though Australia will not be able to, to uh, take part in. Um, chemistry in, in China, how will we get our students there if there is no support for this event? And there are other, others into the future. I think there's another event proposed to be staged in Australia um, later in this decade. Yeah, I th um, can't quite pick up the date of that, but I think there is a chemistry Olympiad proposed to be held in this country but, as I said, no commitment towards assisting Australian students prepare for events uh, uh, in the future. No Australian physics team to Norway, shall we say, in 1996, if this persists. We give money for sporting events, we give money for the development of sportsmen, and I totally support that. I think there's very good reason for us doing that. But I think it's a matter of great regret that we appear to be being very penny-pinching when it comes to supporting students with the sort of intellectual capacity in the areas that Australia needs so much if we're going to be competitive with the world and be able to develop exports and develop markets in areas that take uh, some activity. There is no doubt that science and engineering are the key to success and growth. If you look at the numbers of people employed in these disciplines in the countries around us, the countries we're trying to compete with, it absolutely stands out that the number of people who have graduated with science or engineering are, uh, is closely linked to the success of the country. And I urge the government to have another look at this, to go back to looking at what was being done in providing assistance for Australian students to participate. Do not confuse the money that's been given next year to hold the physics event in this country with the ongoing opportunity for young people to take part in it. Senator Schott's answer is not adequate to the question that I, wrote, uh, I, I raised yesterday, and I ask him to go back to the minister he represents with a view to looking at it in the way that I've now spelled out. Senator, <coughs> Senator Bourne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the proposed float of the NRMA has the potential to create the largest number of shareholders of any Australian company, some 1.8 million people. Many, probably most of these people, have never held shares before. The NRMA has budgeted to spend more than $30 million promoting the case for the conversion of the association from a mutual society into a company. But in the process, the NRMA has failed to fully appraise its members of the reasons not to convert from a mutual society to a company. These may include pressure on the NRMA to dispose of loss-making services such as its, as its road service, its legal services, its free maps, its consumer advocacy. The shareholders will demand bigger and better returns and services that don't make money would then be threatened. But more worrying for the NRMA members, including myself, is that the biggest winner from the NRMA float is not the members but the Federal Treasury. Those directors of the NRMA who promote the float claim that the float is the best way to distribute the $2.2 billion worth of reserves that the NRMA has built up over two generations of service. While the NRMA prospectus makes a few mentions about tax treatment, it fails to mention that the likely total tax bill, when all the dust settles, will be about $600 to $700 million, with the vast bulk of that being paid by the new shareholders. The NRMA hasn't given its members the overall picture of what happens to the NRMA pre and post a float from a taxation point of view. I would like later to table advice I received from David Parker, a chartered accountant of many years standing and also a former director of the NRMA. His advice is compelling reading and highlights the massive tax disadvantage that the NRMA will face if it moves from a mutual society structure into a company. In the process, the NRMA loses $375 million worth of tax credits from its franking account. It loses $375 million off the tax assessable assets base for capital gains purposes. It has to bring $480 million of pre-1985 assets into the capital gains tax net. And in losing its mutual society status, its income becomes tax accessible. 
Little wonder that all of the NRMA competitors in the insurance industry have warmly welcomed the NRMA float. They know it will make the NRMA less competitive in insurance and less able to use its reserves to provide rebates on insurance premiums. Mr Parker concludes that the NRMA board has not sufficiently explored more tax-neutral alternatives to floating the society, and we do have to ask ourselves why is that? Some of the answers that may be, may be possible—I'm not necessarily saying they're true, but they're certainly possible—was it because the current ruling faction of the NRMA saw moving to a company structure as the only means of maintaining control of the association and delaying board elections, which would probably have delivered a board majority to the motorist action group? As a floated company, the majority of the board could move to remove minority directors even if they were democratically elected. Why didn't the board agree to a no case being put to members? I think this is a very important one. Surely, with $30 million being spent on the yes case, the cost of putting a no case would pale into insignificance. Was it because the board thought or knew that the no case was compelling and the advantages of maintaining a tax-exempt mutual society structure more than outweighed the marginal advantages of moving to a company structure? And what about the federal government in this? The silence of the ASC is deafening. Is it because the deputy chair of the ASC also happens to be vice president of the NRMA? Hundreds of thousands of Australians could be about to become shareholders without little, with little or no concept of what that means in terms of responsibilities, the change responsibilities of directors to maximise returns rather than maximise services, their own personal tax and even the impact on their social security benefits because of treatment of investment, which comes under the DSS income tests. I seek leave to table the document I spoke of, and let me say before I do that uh, that I did deliver a copy of this to the minister and to the shadow minister an hour and a half ago. <laughs> Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senate, Senator Ian Macdonald. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, tonight uh, I want to uh, Mr. raise. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. President. I beg your pardon, Mr. President. Uh, I want to uh, raise uh, an issue that is of uh, uh, very great concern to the uh, part of Queensland that, uh, in, in which I live, uh, and I might say fish, um, and that is the uh, move by the Queensland Government to ban all angling in national parks. Now, that in itself, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, doesn't seem to be such a, a, a major uh, uh, move. But it has, does have the effect, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, of really closing off all the saltwater uh, mangrove creeks from uh, Cape Upstart, uh, just south of uh, Air and Home Hill, right up to the uh, Hinchinbrook Island from uh, amateur angling. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, that uh, move by the Queensland Government uh, has uh, brought a pall of doom uh, across the uh, those people uh, in North Queensland who are interested in recreational fishing. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, last Saturday morning in my own uh, town of Ayr, there were uh, some, a demonstration of about 300 uh, boats and trailers driving through the uh, main street of Ayr. In Townsville, uh, during the week, a, uh, a, a meeting uh, attracted over 2,000 fishermen, a, an extremely large uh, meeting in this day and age when people are all uh, too reluctant to uh, get out of their armchairs and uh, from in front of their television sets to uh, make some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, mark on government uh, policies. And uh, that meeting of over 2,000 fishermen uh, was unanimous in opposing the proposal by the Queensland uh, government to shut these uh, creeks and this area off to amateur angling. I might uh, indicate that the uh, Labor member for Tharangau, Mr Ken McGilligat, uh, showed a lot of courage in attending the meeting and, uh, as I understand media reports, uh, agreeing with uh, the anglers that uh, these closures of creeks should not uh, take place. Mr Acting Deputy President, most uh, anglers are responsible people. They don't take more fish than they need. In fact, if they're anything like me, they very seldom have the opportunity of uh, taking fish. We just like going out into the creeks and fishing and uh, it's only ever a bonus if you catch a fish or two. But having uh, that right taken away from us is really a major assault on the way of life of um, many North, North Queenslanders. Not to mention, I, I might add, the uh, impact it would have on tourism, because many people come from all over Australia 
uh, to uh, partake in amateur angling and recreational fishing in the creeks of uh, Upstart Bay, um, Cleveland Bay uh, and uh, uh, Bowling, uh, Bowling Green Bay, Cleveland Bay and uh, up to the uh, Hinchinbrook Island. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, all, ang no, all anglers uh, would agree that uh, if fish stocks are being uh, attacked uh, and are being depleted, then uh, all fishermen would agree to some reasonable management, closing off a couple of creeks for uh, longer periods of time or closing off all creeks for shorter periods of time. I don't think anyone uh, objects to proper management of the fish stock for in, in these uh, creeks, but to absolutely ban fishing in all of them is just an outrageous uh, action, as well as uh, affecting the tourist industry and the families who like uh, recreational fishing. Uh, the proposal would as well uh, put uh, many uh, angling shops, uh, fishing shops, tackle shops in uh, the towns of Home Hill, Ayr, uh, Townsville, uh, Thurangau uh, and Ingham out of business. And people's livelihoods who are, uh, uh, are invested in those businesses would just disappear overnight. And of course there would be uh, many employees of those shops, because they are in many instances quite uh, big establishments, uh, would simply find themselves without a job and so the unemployment queue would again be added to in the towns of region. It's already uh, quite large, um, and uh, these sorts of actions by the Queensland government uh, uh, would uh, add to the unemployment problem uh, in the uh, Townsville region. I've been disappointed that, uh, apart from Mr McGilligan, um, the Labor member for Thurangau, the uh, other elected representatives in the Townsville region have not raised their voices, uh, Mr Jeff Smith. Um, member for uh, Townsville, um, Mr uh, Ken uh, Davies, the uh, member for uh, Mundingborough, and uh, of course Senator Reynolds and uh, Mr Lindsay uh, in the federal parliament uh, all represent people in that area, and I've been disappointed that they haven't joined in uh, opposing uh, this uh, move by the Queensland government. I'm speaking tonight, uh, Mr uh, President, uh, because I can't attend a protest meeting being held in the Burdekin Theatre in my own hometown, uh, which is uh, itself uh, protesting against uh, this move. I would very much have liked to have been at that uh, protest meeting, but unfortunately uh, I'm required to be in Parliament, and of course I'm paid to do that, so it's uh, appropriate that I should be here. Um, but uh, not being able to be part of the uh, protest meeting in my own hometown, I do want to uh, make my protest uh, in this uh, chamber. I would ask the Queensland Government to seriously consider the implications of their move. No one objects to sensible management of the environment or of the fish shock, stock, but uh, simply uh, closing off these creeks in a blanket way uh, absolutely is not the way to do it. And I would hope that uh, the enormous protests that have, been, that have uh, developed uh, in the region uh, will uh, make the Queensland Government realise they've made the wrong decision and uh, I, it is my hope that they will see the sense of uh, uh, the arguments by the, uh, those opposing it and uh, amend the uh, proposals uh, that they currently have. Senator Woodley. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I wish to place on the record tonight a follow-up to uh, something that I placed on the record a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that is a letter by uh, Pamela Bornhorst, uh, formerly of the uh, ABC 7.30 report. Uh, it's it's a, a letter in protest to an article written within, in the Courier Mail by Mr Peter Charlton, and it, is, it gives her an opportunity to, uh, to record uh, her side of an argument. Uh, so let me read the letter, which is only brief, uh, and that will enable other senators to speak in this debate. On the 2nd of June 1994, Senator Christabel Chamaret tabled a document in the Australian Senate relating to my axing as presenter of the Queensland edition of the ABC 7.30 report. It has been assumed and reported that I was either the author of this document or in some way collaborated in its preparation. For the record, I wish to state that I was not the author, nor was I involved with it in any way. I had never cited it. Furthermore, at no stage prior to the tabling of this document in the Federal Parliament was I con contacted to determine whether I supported its contents or the tabling of it in the Senate. As you would be aware, 
there was considerable public disquiet over my removal from the 7.30 report. In the weeks following, a group of supporters, including some members of the Friends of the ABC, gathered some 7,000 signatures calling for my reinstatement. For my part, in January this year, I told a meeting of my supporters that I was personally devastated by the episode, given, given my 16 years association with the ABC, but I wanted to put it behind me and get on with my life and my new job in Talkback Radio. However, I believed then, as I do now, that there was political interference and I remain deeply concerned about the treatment handed out to those within the ABC who supported me, particularly the five journalists from the Queensland edition of the 7.30 report who supported me in writing. Thank you. Senator Brownhill. I rise tonight to speak uh, about WorkSkills Australia New England competition, and you might wonder why I want to speak about that in this chamber tonight. Well, I happen to be the, the patron of the WorkSkills New England Northwest competition, and uh, WorkSkills, I believe, has done a great deal of good to help the apprentices in that area achieve uh, uh, better skills and achieve higher standards. The uh, 180 competitors who came from all over the New England, Northwest, Moree, Glen Innes, Armidale, Coonabarabra and Inverell last weekend really strived to win, but they were all winners who attended the, uh, the competition because those people who enter work skills are all winners because they all improve their skills and they all actually achieve a lot more. There were people there in brick laying, cabinet making, cookery, auto body repairs, auto mechanic, carpentry, electrical, hairdressing, metal fabrication, office secretarial support, plant and transport mechanics, plumbing, turning, vehicle painting and welding. And there are also two demonstration, demonstration categories, art design and auto electrical. And all of them, as I say, were winners because they all competed and they all did a, a great job. I congratulate the winners, but I also congratulate all those that actually put themselves on the line to strive to improve their skills. Bob Turnbull, who is really our ambassador at large for, for uh, Work Skills Foundation, uh, spoke at the, uh, at the presentation dinner and gave a very good re uh, recitation of what it is all about. And uh, the fact that there is something like a volunteer network of something like 1,500 people who, to promote the highest standards of performance in vocational training and uh, to give recognition to young workers, their teachers and trainers. And that's all happened over the last 12 years. This has been achieved with the support of governments, industry, trade unions and the TAFE system. And there's been over 25,000 young people around Australia who have taken up the challenge to test their skills against the highest standards. Uh, that are set uh, uh, in the uh, work skill competitions, very high skills. And when you think that they start off, some of the people in the turning uh, competition, with one just a piece of steel and a blueprint, and within eight hours they have just about gone through every discipline that is needed in the, uh, in the turning uh, field. But uh, whilst uh, everyone aims for high performance in vocational training, the end result, which I believe we all want is to achieve is world standard performance in our workforce, and that's what this is about. And it's great to see the Minister for Trade at the table here tonight because he knows the worth of competing. And the foundation has been working to match industry developments in taking up modern technology categories into the competition. But the, uh, if we look at our international performance, Australia sent a team of 35 young people to the 1993 Skill Olympics in Taipei, and uh, it was one of the most competent teams to represent Australia. And they finished in 10th place out of 24 countries, winning four bronze medals and 13 diplomas, which were awarded for high standard performance. It a great performance from Australia. And it's interesting to note that 167 Australians have competed and have won 37 medals in international competitions since 1985. And whilst Australia's results over five skills Olympic competitions show it is the best performing English speaking nation, both in terms of medals won and the percentage of diplomas awarded, we see a need, 
and I'm sure the minister would agree with this, to improve this performance at the national level. Where, because if you, if you just listen to the ones who have actually been the top of the uh, competition in the last uh, years, Japan, Korea and Taiwan, they're the ones that have led the way. And if we're going to compete in Asia, we have to have a workforce in Australia that is competent, competitive and is really always striving for excellence and striving for that uh, little bit extra. There's a new pilot program started off by the Foundation this year, and the program is known as CLIP, which is Continuous Learning and Improvement Program, which hope, hopes to help and will help, I'm quite sure, those regional winners to prepare for the national finals and to develop skills to assist them to succeed, to succeed in their careers. All the young people that I met who competed last weekend were all absolutely ecstatic with the fact that they competed. Of course, the winners are a little bit more ecstatic, I suppose, than the, the ones that didn't win, but they all felt very excited the fact that they competed and tested their own, own skill standards against uh, uh, everyone else. The wealth of this nation, uh, Mr President, is going to be in our ability to compete on the world stage, and I'm quite sure work skills will be uh, right at the forefront of that to make sure we have, have young apprentices going on through the field and being our leaders uh, for tomorrow. As I said, striving for excellence, recognition of excellence and the future leaders of industry. You know, we send that and we all stand up in this place and lord our, our Commonwealth Games gold medalists which I do, as which everyone in this place does, and we give them due recognition. But I think it's time that we started to give due recognition to young people who strive for excellence in whatever field. And that's why I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of those people who competed and the others. Because quality of labour must be internationally competitive, and the only way we can do that is to make sure that we uh, have people uh, competing at the highest level. The, uh, in October 1995, which is next year, not that long away, only just about a year away, the winners of the Australian uh, competition will be going away in the uh, Australian team with the Australian colours to compete in Lyon in France, where hopefully we will come back with some gold medal winners. And when we do come back with some gold medal winners, or even bronze medal winners, or silver medal winners, silver or bron bronze medal winners, I think that they should be acclaimed in this place just like we acclaim any of our sports people who do so well when they go away to compete. I think maybe we should be thinking of giving the Order of Australia, which we do quite often to our sporting stars. We should be thinking of giving that to some of these people who attain the highest standard on the world level at the International Olympics, because it's the same competition and it's just as intense. It's a great spectator sport, actually, if anyone hasn't been to see a work skills uh, final uh, or to see uh, this work skills Olympics which were on in Australia a few years ago, uh, they would know how, how interesting it is. And that's how I became so interested and became the patron of it up in the north of New South Wales. I went uh, after having become the patron to the work skill Olympics in Sydney, as I said, and to see the people at that stand, to see the amount of help and support the people get from the other countries in the world I think we have to start doing the same thing here ourselves. I would like to congratulate all those that competed. I'd like to congratulate the employers who gave their, their apprentices and other young people time off to uh, train and practice for the competition. I wish the winners well when they go to the national uh, finals. I congratulate the uh, people who were sponsors, who uh, put so much time and effort into uh, and, uh, and money into helping the competition. I particularly uh, single out Helen Tickle from the Tamworth TAFE, Rosalind Dewick, who was the coordinator of, uh, of, Tamworth, uh, uh, of the, Tamworth Works, or the New England Work Skills, John Morris, who was the chairman, Joanne Thomas, who was the secretary, because they all played a very big part. And I think that if we can all just have a little bit of a think in the next little while of really recognising our young people, whether they be sports people, or whether they be people who strive for excellence in, uh, in their profession, I think Australia will be a better place. There being no further speakers, the Senate stands adjourned until Monday, the 10th of October, 1994, at 2 p.m. <laughs>